So good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Pickering. I am a senior director here at the National Quality Forum, also working on the PAC LTC work group. I want to welcome everyone. Uh, it is 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, and so this is the start of the MAP uh, PAC LTC work group meeting. So um, thank you all very much for joining. Um, I also just want to draw your attention to the slide if you're on the web platform. Uh, there's just some housekeeping items we wanted to kick off with before we go into today's proceedings. Um, we are using WebEx. There is a, a platform you can use and open up and on that platform, uh, there's several features uh, that we'll be going through here briefly. Um, one is as all virtual types of meetings um, in any, any phone calls, we just ask that you keep yourself on mute if you're not speaking. Uh, just to prevent any background noise um, so that we can go through um, the proceedings uh, pretty pretty well and everyone can hear one another. Um, second is on the web platform with WebEx, and if you've used other web platforms um, uh, before, there are certain features such as a chat feature and raise hands for being, being called upon for discussion. Those are also within this WebEx platform, so you have that opened up. The chat box is this little icon towards the bottom right of that platform. Um, so you can open that up and you can monitor the chat as well, uh, message everyone or people individually, including myself and the NQF staff members. There's also the participant list uh, to raise your hand. So next to that little chat icon, that little call out bubble, there is a uh, sort of a, a figure of a, of a person and that's the participant list. Your name should be the first name on that participant list as you pull it up to raise your hand. If you hover over your name with the mouse, there's a little hand icon that pops up and you click that, that, that will allow you to raise your hand. And so we will encourage you to use both of those during the discussions today, especially when it's open for work group discussion. Uh, if you raise your hand, we will call on you uh, and go down the list accordingly as you, as you do raise your hands. Um, we will, uh, uh, if you do have any technical difficulties with the platform uh, or anything uh, with today's proceedings, please don't hesitate to email the project box, which is MAP, M-A-P, and that's PAC, L-T-C, P-A-C, dash, L-T-C, at qualityforum.org. And so we will definitely monitor our, our inbox and see if there's any te technical difficulties. I'll mention just now, and we'll, we'll mention it again when we get to that portion of the slides. Um, Earlier this morning, you were also sent a survey, excuse me, a poll everywhere link, the voting link uh, to today's proceedings. Please go ahead and, and identify, find that in your emails. Um, we'll be uh, touching base with the work group again later today uh, to do a voting test, but this is the platform we'll be using to vote on the measures for consideration. Uh, so please go ahead and locate that email. Um, we'll definitely follow up later on during uh, when we do the voting test, if there's any technical difficulties there, and we'll sort of work through those. But that email was sent out early this morning, so please check your inbox for that voting link. It's a Poll Everywhere link. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, December 16th, uh, this is our, our third MAP meeting this week. We've had clinician and hospital. And today we're concluding with the best of the best, which is PAC LTC, right? Um, Jerry, Jerry, our co-chair, thumbs up there. Thank you, Jerry. Um, but thank you very much uh, to the work group members for your time and participation in this important work in informing uh, pre-rulemaking and the measures to be included in federal programs. Also want to thank our CMS colleagues who support this work. Um, we have several of them on the call today, some of which you'll hear from today in presentations. Um, uh, they work closely with, with NQF on getting all the materials ready for us today. Uh, thank you to the developers um, as well for all of their work in contributing to the measures uh, under consideration, as well as to members of the public um, who are participating. And, and we have opportunities for the public to also weigh in um, on the measures under consideration. And lastly, I do want to give a big thanks to the NQF team in preparing all of the materials and getting us ready for the proceedings today. If we go to the next slide, I'll just touch on our agenda. So we'll start with welcome and introductions um, and as well as disclosures of interest. Uh, so with the disclosures of interest, you've received emails from us asking you to please complete this form, which is just to disclose any potential conflicts you have in the meeting or with the measures today. 
I will go through those disclosures of interest, and then we'll review the meeting objectives. Um, Dr. Michelle Schreiber is on the call today. She will also be providing some opening remarks, as well as uh, Alan Levitt. Dr. Alan Levitt will also be providing some welcoming remarks as well. Um, and then we have an update to the hospice, hospice outcomes and patient evaluation assessment tool or the HOPE tool. So we have some presenters to provide an update on that tool uh, that is of interest to this work group. Uh, we will then follow with an overview of the pre rulemaking approach. So this is just um, going through our preliminary al al analysis algorithm as well as our decision categories. So those four decision categories that you will also be assessing the measures against. Um, we will be going through those and then touching on uh, two advisory groups that uh, we've convened prior to these meetings. The rural health advisory group, which has convened previously in years past, which are inputs that will be added to the preliminary analysis or have been added uh, and uh, for your consideration. But the second advisory group, which is new this year, is a health equity advisory group. And they are really looking at um, the measures from the sense of health equity. Can these measures actually decrease healthcare disparities and promote health equity? Uh, that those inputs in a very similar fashion have been added to the preliminary analyses for the MAPS consideration, and we will be touching on those today uh, as well. We do have time for lunch, about 30 minutes, so we'll break for lunch before we actually go through the measures under consideration. So we'll reconvene and start out with those measures un under consideration. And we have a few breaks built in. And as we evaluate those measures, uh, for those members of the public who have seen the agenda, there is, a, there is an opportunity uh, before the MAP actually votes on measures uh, for the public to actually weigh in and provide input for the, for the MAP's consideration before voting on the measures. Uh, that is different than the, the last um, opportunity for public comment that you see listed there. Um, we do have that space built in at the end of the meeting uh, for the public to also provide comments. Um, if we do have time prior to the opportunity for public comment at the end, we will have a GAPS discussion for uh, programs that did not have measures submitted to them for PAC LTC. So we do have some slides at the end of our slide deck, if time permitting, uh, we will do a GAPS discussion of the programs that measures uh, that did not have measures submitted to them. And then after public comment, uh, we will then do a summary of the day and next steps before we adjourn and wish everyone happy holidays. Uh, before I proceed, um, just wanting to make sure any questions thus far from the work group. Okay. So I will go to the next slide um, and I will uh, turn it over to our CEO, uh, Dana Safran, who will provide some welcoming remarks uh, to everyone. So Dana, I'll turn the floor to you. If we go back one slide, there we go. Go ahead, Dana. Thank you very much, Matt. And good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to welcome all of you today uh, to our MAP Post-Acute Care Long-Term Care uh, Work Group Review Meeting in the 2021-2022 uh, MAP cycle. NQF is absolutely honored to continue our partnership with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the MAP PAC LTC work group in this very important work. Uh, this is, is really uh, where the rubber meets the road, uh, looking at the ways that uh, measures will be used um, and providing advice and uh, input to CMS uh, as they consider measures for use in public reporting and performance-based payment programs. As all of you know very well, MAP brings together <clears throat> a unique multi-stakeholder group that represents quality measurement, research and improvement, purchasers, providers, public and community health agencies, health professionals, health plans, consumers, suppliers, and subject matter experts. And through gathering this diverse set of stakeholder voices really enables NQF to support the federal government in uh, receiving varied and thoughtful input uh, as it considers measures for final rulemaking. Uh, I really want to um, highlight the work of the rural health and health equity advisory groups that that met, mentioned. Uh, as, as Matt said, they completed their uh, review last week of all measures uh, for um, clinician, hospital, and PAC-LTC um, uh, consideration. 
Uh, the rural health advisory group has been providing input for a number of years. Uh, and the health equity advisory group is new this year and has shared insights on each measure's ability to identify disparities and to further promote health equity. Um, the meetings last week were very full and robust and the input that they've provided, I think will enhance today's discussions uh, significantly. Um, finally, I'll just add my thanks uh, to the thanks that Matt shared. Uh, thank you to our work group members and federal liaisons for the time and uh, effort that they put in to this work. We know it is a significant demand on your time and attention and, and we are so appreciative. Also, particular thanks to the work group chairs, Jerry Lamb and Kurt Merkeltz. Uh, for their leadership of this work and for all that they need to do uh, to prioritize this in their own uh, schedules and, and to do lists. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank the members of the public who are taking time to participate and offer their comments uh, here in the meeting uh, or online during our public comment period. Your feedback is really important to this process and we really thank you for your time and attention as well. So, uh, looking forward to today's discussion on six measures under consideration for PAC long term care uh, and your feedback on uh, the federal programs under consideration. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Matt. Thank you so much, <laughs> Dana. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to our co chairs, uh, Jerry and Kurt, to provide some welcoming remarks as well. So, I'll start with Jerry and then we'll go to Kurt. Uh, Jerry? Thanks, Matt, and thanks so much, Dana, for your welcomes. Um, I am absolutely delighted to be with all of you today. Good morning to everyone. And to add to Matt and Dana's welcome to everybody who is on the, this call with us, um, the work group members, the measure developers who are joining us, um, our NQF team, who is absolutely wonderful. CMS Partners, who has been a pleasure to work with over the years, and certainly our public members who have joined today to um, be an important part of this discussion. All of you have really important voices, so Kurt and I are looking forward to facilitating that with you today. Um, I'm especially pleased to be back as your co-chair and to work with Kurt. Um, Kurt, it's just a pleasure working with you. And I'm looking forward to the whole discussion today. Um, wish we could be there in person. It would be great to see all of you again in person. And I'm really excited about making recommendations and the discussion ahead. So, Kurt. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Uh, very happy to be back with everyone. Happy to see everybody. Welcome uh, again also to uh, CMS, uh, measure developers, and certainly all the members of the work group uh, and anybody from the public who's attending. Um, also wanting to wish everyone a, you know, safe holiday season uh, on the days ahead of us. It's been a truly uh, challenging year, not the least of which has been COVID. You know, uh, I just want to do a, just a quick uh, call out to, to all of us to make sure we keep a lookout for what I think should be our North Star as we look at measures, uh, patient reported outcomes. Um, we need to encourage, support, and really drive, I think, uh, measures of care that are really focused on what Patients receive uh, and maybe not take as hard a look, of, you know, as we have been doing about what the healthcare system is delivering. We're, we're really making a very healthy uh, provider, but the patients are still very much needing the services we provide. So, just uh, again, a call out to keep our North Star to patient reported outcomes. Uh, again, welcome to everyone. Look forward to the day, and I'll turn it back over to you, Matt. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Kurt and Jerry, for those welcoming remarks. Um, We'll now go to the next slide and we'll go through introductions and disclosures of interest uh, for our work group participants, as well as our subject matter experts and, um, and federal liaisons. Um, so, as a reminder, NQF is a nonpartisan organization out of mutual respect for each other. We kindly encourage that we make an effort to refrain from making comments, innuendos or humor relating to, for example, race gender, politics, or topics that otherwise may be considered inappropriate during the meeting. While we encourage discussions that are open, constructive, and collaborative, let's all be mindful of how our language and opinions may be perceived by others. We'll combine disclosures of interest with introductions 
we'll divide the disclosures of interest into two parts because we have two types of members. We have organizational members, which you can see listed here, and subject matter experts. So right now we'll start with the organizational members. And as a reminder, organizational members represent the interests of, our, of a particular organization. We expect you to come to the table representing those interests. Because of your status as an organizational representative, you are, you, um, we ask you only one question specific to you as an individual. We ask you to disclose if you have any interest of $10,000 or more in an entity that is related to the work of this committee. So we'll go around this virtual table, beginning with the organizational mem members only. Uh, first, I'll call, on, um, I'll call on anyone on the meeting who is an organizational member. When I call your organization's name, please unmute your line, state your name, your role at your organization, and anything you wish to disclose. If you do not identify any conflicts of interest, after stating your name and title, you may add, I have nothing to disclose. So we'll, we'll re reserve our co-chairs for when we get into our subject matter experts. So I'll just go down the list in alphabetical order here. I'll start with AMDA, the Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine. Hi, it's Raj Mahajan. Um, I'm an internist geriatrician um, uh, representing the Society for Post-Acute Long-Term Care. Um, and I have no um, conflicts. Thank you very much. Uh, the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Anyone from the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation? Okay, we'll circle back. Um, the American Geriatric Society. American Geriatric Society. Okay. The American Occupational Therapy Association. Kim Roberts, I'm the uh, on the Quality Committee um, for AOGA, and I have nothing. I'm sorry. What, can you mention that one more time? Kim. I'm on the uh, Quality Advisory Committee for American Occupational Therapy Association, and I have nothing to disclose. Great, thank you. You were just coming a little, little uh, faint there, oh, but thank you very much. Um, the American Physical Therapy Association. Good morning. This is Alice Bell representing the APTA. I am a physical therapist and on staff as a senior payment specialist at the APTA, and happy to join the meeting. And I'm sorry, no disclosures. Thank you. Okay, ATW Health Solutions. So, um, Desiree Collins Bradley, I see your ATW Health Solutions is here. Um, can you introduce yourself and disclose any potential conflicts? I think Desiree was having some technical issues. So Desiree, we'll try to circle back with you about uh, some technical difficulties there and see if we can at least get some of your disclosures read off. So thank you. Um, uh, okay, Encompass Health Corpor uh, Corporation. Hi, good morning. This is Mary Ellen DeBartolaven. I'm the National Director of Quality for Encompass Health. Other than my employment with Encompass Health, I have um, nothing to disclose. Thank you. Kindred Healthcare. Kindred Healthcare. Okay. Leading Age. Hi, this is Nicole Fallon with Leading Age. I'm the Vice President of Health Policy and Integrated Services. I lead our quality and risk management advisory group and monitor all the quality initiatives for our provider members. And I have no disclosures. Great, thank you. The National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. Uh, good morning, I'm Ben Marcantonio. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, and I have no disclosures. Thank you. 
the National Partnership for Healthcare and Hospice Innovation. Uh, hi, this is Larry Atkins from NPHI. I'm the Chief Policy Officer, and I have no disclosure. Great, thank you. The National Pressure Injury Advisory Panel. Yes, hi, my name is Jill Cox. I am on the Board of Directors of the National Pressure Injury Advisory Panel, and I have nothing to disclose. Thank you. The National Transitions of Care Coalition. National Transitions of Care Coalition. Okay. And the SNP Alliance. Hi, this is Cheryl Phillips. I am a geriatric physician. My um, clinical career for 20 years at least was in post acute and long term care. And I am now the president and CEO of the Special Needs Plan Alliance. And I have nothing to disclose. Great. Thank you. I'm just going to circle back um, once more. So the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Is anybody on the line? Is that James Lett? Um, are, are you able to hear me, Matt? Is that James? Yes. Are you able to hear me, Matt? Uh, I am. Yes. That sounds like there's a little bit of an echo but I am able to hear you. Okay, good. I've been having some technical problems. Are you still able to hear me now? I, I shut yeah. off my phone. Okay, uh, apologies for all the technical issues. That is not my strong suit. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, this is Jim Ladd. I'm the president of the board of directors for the National Transitions of Care Coalition and have nothing to disclose. Thank you. Thank you. So. Thank you very much, Jim, for working through the technical issues. Um, is there anyone from the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation on the line? How about the American Geriatric Society? Hi, yes, this is Anna Kim. I'm the manager of public affairs and advocacy. I support the quality performance and measurement committee. I have nothing to disclose. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, ATW Health Solutions. I think that was Desiree. So Desiree, if you could, um, in the chat box, it looks like we can see your chat. If you could just put your name, uh, your uh, role in your organization, and if you have anything to disclose, I'll, I can read that off. And I'll go to uh, Kindred, Kindred Healthcare. Anyone on the line? I'm here. This is Desiree, and I mean to jump in. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Yes, Desiree. Yeah. Okay. I'm having so many technical difficulties. My apologies. Desiree Collins Bradley, ATW Health Solutions, our patient engagement network lead, and I have nothing to disclose. Thank you so much. And I'll go back to Kindred Healthcare. Anyone from Kindred Healthcare? Okay. Well, thank you for those disclosures. Um, now we'll move to the disclosures of our subject matter experts um, because subject matter experts sit as individuals. Uh, we ask you to complete a much more detailed form regarding your professional activities. When you disclose, please do not review your resume. Instead, we are interested in your disclosure of activities that are related to the subject matter of the work group's work. We are especially interested in your disclosures of grants, consulting, or speaking arrangements. Uh, but only if it's relevant to the work group's work. So just a few reminders, uh, you sit on this group as an individual. You do not represent the interests of your employer or anyone uh, who, have, who has nominated you to this committee. I also want to mention that we are not uh, only interested in your disclosures of activities where you were paid. Uh, you may have participated as a volunteer on a committee where, where the work is relevant to the measures reviewed by MAP. We're looking for you to disclose those types of activities as well. Finally, just because you disclose does not mean that you have a conflict of interest. We do oral disclosures in the spirit of openness and transparency. So please tell us your name, what organization you're with, and if you have anything to disclose. And I'll call um, your name uh, so that you can disclose. So I'll begin with our co-chairs, uh, Jerry Lamb. 
I'm Jerry Lamb. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm a professor at Arizona State University, and I have no disclosures. Thank you, Jerry. And Kurt Merkels? Yes, I do sit on the quality committee for the American Medical Directors Association and for the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Um, so now we'll move to uh, our other subject matter experts, Dan Anderson. Yep. Hi, hi everybody. Um, during a day, I work at Rely Group. Um, the only thing, as I mentioned last time we met, I wanted to disclose is that um, I, I manage a, one of Rely's subcontracts where we do UAT, like validation of the information that goes up on CMS websites, and you know, including the Care Compare for. Earth, LTAC, and SNF. So we're a subcontractor at Acumen, who's also a measure developer. So we just wanted to disclose that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And uh, David Andrews. Hi, David Andrews. I'm a I'm a retired college professor, independent patient advisor with no connect formal connection to any organization. I've been involved in a number of NQF activities. The uh, perhaps most pertinent is the one that's developing a roadmap for converting uh, PROMs to uh, pro PM measures um, as well. So, uh, and I have nothing to disclose. Thank you very much. And Paul Mulhausen. Hi, thank you. I'm Paul Mulhausen. I'm a physician geriatrician. I uh, am employed by Iowa Total Care, a health plan subsidiary of Centene Corporation. I have nothing to disclose. Thank you very much. Um, and Sarah, apologize. Is it Sarah Livesay or is it Livesay? That's that's pretty perfect, actually. <laughs> Livesay works. So Sarah Livesay here. I'm um, a nurse practitioner by training. I'm the assistant dean at Rush University's College of uh, Nursing. Um, in terms of my my job, I uh, in terms of disclosures, I do consulting work with uh, largely hospital organizations seeking stroke certifications through a company called Lombardi Hill. And um, I am on the quality committee for the Neurocritical Care Society and help to develop their performance measure set, mostly inpatient, although I mention it just in case there was any kind of overlap that could be perceived as a conflict. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And Terry Black. Good morning. I'm Terry Black. I'm clinical associate professor at University of Massachusetts, and I have nothing. Great. Um, and that was nothing to disclose. Is that right, Terry? Correct. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to just um, recognize our federal government liaisons um, to see if anyone's on the line. Um, from, the, from the CDC side at Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, do we have our CDC representative on the line? Hi, this is Andy oh, this Geller. Is great oh, go ahead, Andy. Oh, uh, Andy Geller, CDC. Also, Ray Dantes, uh, medical advisor for uh, CDC um, and associate professor of medicine um, at Emory University. Uh, no um, disclosures. Great. Thank you. Um, I know we have a few colleagues from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, we had mentioned uh, Dr. Michelle Schreiber is on the line, as well as Dr. Alan Levitt. Um, there, there are most likely others, so we won't go through all of the, uh, the names of folks on the call, but thank you very much from our C CMS colleagues on the line. And I'll just check in as well if we have anyone from the Office of the National Coordinator of, uh, for Health Information Technology, or ONC. Anyone from ONC on the line? Hi, yeah, this is Brenda Akinabe from ONC um, with the Office of Policy. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you, uh, and I'd like to remind you that if you believe that you might have a conflict of interest at any time during the meeting, please speak up. You may do so in real time at the meeting. You can message uh, the, one of the co-chairs who will go to NQF staff, or you can directly message the NQF staff. Uh, if you believe that a fellow committee member may have a conflict of interest or is behaving in a biased manner, you may point, point that out during the meeting, uh, approach one of the co-chairs, or go directly to NQF staff. Uh, do you have any questions or anything you'd like to discuss based on the disclosures of interest made today?
Again, you can use the chat box or you can raise your hand or just take yourself off mute. Okay, hearing none, we'll keep going. Thank you all. So go to the next slide. And again, just wanting to thank um, our NQF staff um, that are listed here. We have Suzanne Young, who's our manager, Ashlyn Ruth, who's our project manager, Becky Payne, our senior analyst, and Gus Zimmerman, our coordinator, as well as Tarun Amin, our consultant, who has been who have all been very instrumental for this work. So thank you to this staff. Um, and we'll go to the next slide and also just thank our CMS partners uh, as well. Uh, Kimberly Rawlings, our task co uh, uh, order co uh, co contacting officer, excuse me, as well as Jaquincia uh, Polk as well, who's uh, also involved with this as partners for this work. So thank, thank you to both of them. And then going to the next slide, just to touch on the objectives for today, uh, we will review and provide input on the MUC measures, the measures under consideration for the uh, respective MAP PAC LTC programs. And as mentioned, we will also do a gaps discussion as well as including gaps if we have time uh, of, of program in the programs where measures were not submitted uh, to those uh, this cycle. So we'll be doing that towards the end. Um, so thank you. Um, and then we'll go to the next slide. And now I'd like to um, turn it over to Dr. Michelle Schreiber. She's the deputy director for quality and value uh, to provide some welcoming remarks. So Dr. Schreiber. Thank you. First, let me always start with sound check. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. All right. Well, good morning to everybody. It is a pleasure to um, be here. For, for those of you at NQF, you will understand this is the fifth meeting in approximately one week for uh, the various MAP committees. And so my first congratulations to the NQF staff, actually, for really working very hard. There's a tremendous amount of uh, work behind the scenes here um, and for uh, really a, a very successful past week. We are delighted to be here at the uh, post acute care map meeting and it is a pleasure. We look forward to all of your comments today. I know many of you have worked with you for the past several years, but for those of you who don't know me, I am a um, I am, as Matt pointed out, the deputy director of the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality at CMS and also the director of the Quality Measurement and Value-Based Incentives Group. I'm a practicing general internal medicine physician actually in the city of Detroit for many years and a long history of uh, quality uh, background. I've been at CMS for the last three years. In terms of the thank yous, um, really to the committee members, the work that you put into these committees, which is voluntary, and the insights that you have is extremely helpful to CMS, and we really appreciate all of your time and efforts. In particular, to Jerry and Kurt, who are the uh, co-chairs, thank you very much. I'm just going to issue the same challenge I issued yesterday to the hospital committee. You know, the clinician committee ended 11 minutes early, so just so you know, it's, it's out there as, uh, you know, the challenge. I already thank the NQF staff, but I'd like to take a special moment actually to uh, say thank you and welcome to Dana in her new role as CEO. So Dana, the staff has completed really the, the whole cycle almost of uh, the MAP meetings and congratulations for that success. I know you've only been at NQF for several months. I know it probably in one on one hand feels much longer and on one hand feels much shorter, but we think that you've certainly already set a wonderful direction for NQF and and on behalf of CMS really welcome you in your new role. Speaking of CMS, I'd like to also acknowledge there are a number of CMS staff on the phone today. They're here to answer any questions that you may have. And again, there's a lot of behind the work scenes as well as the measure developers who uh, join us to answer your questions. To our patient advocates in particular and then to the public, your input is really very important, and so it's very heartening to see patient advocates and to hear the public comments as well. At the end, I have another special introduction to make, but we'll we'll wait until we get through a couple of slides. So, Matt, if we could advance forward, please. Next one. Thanks. So, I think we all know that the Measure Application Partnership is really a group of convened experts. You are the experts who provide recommendations to us at CMS about whether or not these measures that we've brought 
that are under consideration should indeed be included in the various CMS value based programs. This is obviously a multi stakeholder group with extensive experience and that's why we are particularly heartened to hear from all of you. MAP, as you know, though, does make recommendations to CMS, but does not have the final authority for the decisions that do go into rule, write, rule writing and are available to the public. But I want to assure you that the MAP recommendations are always strongly considered and do assist and change the course often of CMS's decisions about measures that go in the program. This year, we actually uh, had, as you heard, several new uh, committees with the MAP uh, process. One is the equity uh, subcommittee that we heard from last week, which looked at all of the measures and made their recommendations about whether or not there's an equity impact to those measures. It was a great conversation. And also new this year was the measure set review that the MAP coordinating committee did on measure removal. So you make recommendations for measures to be included. We now have a process of uh, hearing about measures to be removed. So this back and forth process, I think, will really help to continue to shape the CMS uh, quality programs. Next slide. For the post acute care map in particular, um, obviously you are uh, making recommendations for those specific value based programs and they include several. There's the skilled nursing facility quality reporting program, the skilled nursing facility value based purchasing program, which will get a lot of attention today. The hospice quality reporting program, home health quality reporting program, long term care and of course inpatient rehab. These are a mix of pay for performance as well as pay for uh, just for reporting. And some of these are also used in the calculation of nursing home stars and almost all of these are publicly reported. Next. This year under the new administration, um, the CMS strategic priorities have been released to the public. HHS and CMS are all developing their strategic priorities. And I wanted to make sure to share these with you so that you can understand the directions that are important for CMS. That uh, CMS first serves the public as a trusted power, um, partner and steward, um, really dedicated to advancing healthcare equity, expanding coverage, and improving health outcomes. Pillar number one, as you can see, then is advancing health equity. And you'll be hearing that in uh, the various conversations. It was part of the reason for an equity committee, which we were thrilled about. And I think in coming years, you will be seeing more and more about how is it that we close the disparity gaps and really promote equity in health across the country. Second is expanding access to quality, affordable health care, engaging our partners and communities in policymaking, driving innovation, protecting uh, the sustainability of the Medicare Trust, and then within CMS fostering an um, inclusive workforce. Next slide. There are, though, very specific key focus areas for quality. The first, of course, the COVID pandemic, which um, we have all been dealing with for the last two years. A few more comments on that, but that, of course, is at the top of the priority list for uh, CMS. But after that, as I already mentioned, equity, and it's not just equity in, in, a, in a given area, but for access and outcomes and referrals and experience and really closing those gaps that we uh, have seen highlighted so much in the COVID pandemic. We knew that they were there, but they really have come into you know, stark realization. There's a lot of focus on maternal health and safety, probably not that much in the post-acute care setting, I wouldn't think, um, but it is a high priority uh, issue for CMS and for HHS, mental health as well. And there's a cross uh, health and human services uh, work group looking at how we can improve mental health. Other issues that are particularly important include the resiliency and emergency preparedness, many lessons learned from the past several years about how we can strengthen the country's uh, ability in emergency preparedness and in, in our resiliency. Safety also has risen again to the top. It has always been there in quality uh, considerations. It's not just patient safety, though, but it's also workforce safety and the safety of the facilities that we're in. Sadly, over the past uh, two years, we've seen degradations in some of the safety metrics, including around healthcare acquired infections and falls and pressure ulcers. 
and realize that we all need to be recommitting to our fundamental principles around safety. Several years ago, CMS made the um, commitment to move towards um, digital quality measures. And so the digital transformation is also important as we look at measures and choose which ones to put in the programs, because this is really a use case of digital data, which we have learned is very important to be able to have digital data that is interoperable that we can not all be able to access. Rising to uh, the top of the agenda in this administration is also climate change. So I think you'll start seeing more and more around uh, how in these programs um, we can use them to influence improvements around climate change. And finally, of course, always driving the value proposition. Next slide, please. Now, probably more than any other group, the post-acute care group really felt the COVID pandemic. And I want to take an opportunity to thank all of you for your heroic efforts on the parts of your staff, taking care of patients, keeping our communities safe. We know that we've seen that the vast majority of COVID deaths have been in the elderly population greater than 65. I know that that's affected probably all of you. And again, our really deep and sincere thanks to the heroic efforts that all of you and your organizations have made. I did speak of the worsening quality and safety performance that we've seen and that we really re need to recommit and focus on the future resiliency, emergency preparedness, and really our workforce. This year, we uh, finalized several uh, proposals in the value-based uh, programs, which we'll talk about in a moment, including measure suppression so that we weren't penalizing facilities um, for circumstances really beyond their control, such as the COVID pandemic. And we also, of course, introduced the COVID uh, healthcare personnel vaccination measures. And you uh, know of the history of the COVID uh, vaccination mandate that was finalized, but is currently being reevaluated. Next slide. You know, as we look at what made organizations successful in COVID, there are some key enablers that I think we all have to keep in mind. And first and foremost, their leadership, culture, and governance. And we know that those are always foundational as to how organizations, individuals respond. A dedication to infection prevention and control. I think a lot of facilities had to um, really re-up, renew, and focus on infection uh, prevention and control. And I know that uh, we're starting to see more and more, not only regulation around that, but measures around it as well. Local planning and coordination, not just internally, but really regionally and statewide, were also a key enablers for success. And there were obviously some challenges and lessons learned that we all have, including really focusing on the underserved and vulnerable population that uh, the disparities have become strikingly clear. There are also challenges in data reporting and technical assistance and in managing the various ways of approaching the COVID pandemic and opportunities to, to improve on all of these. Next slide. So what was new in the post-acute care long-term care rules? I think one of the biggest uh, things that we will be considering measures today for is the expansion of the SNP value-based uh, purchasing program. So as you know, the SNP BBP program has had but one measure in it, and that's readmissions. Congress recently authorized us to expand this to 10, up to 10, that's the maximum number of measures for the SNP value-based purchasing program. We're really very excited about this, and we will bring measures today um, for your consideration and use in this expanded program. We're doing this in a stepwise fashion. So you'll see over the next several years that we bring measures forward and really look forward to your recommendations today. The other thing that's very exciting that was introduced in rule writing is that the home health model, which has been a model in nine states uh, designed by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation is now expanding to a new national program and we're very excited by that expansion because its initial success can now be translated to the country. I'm sure all of you are aware of measure suppression in particular for the SNF value-based purchasing program. We did uh, suppress the readmission measure and all skilled nursing facilities 
were held neutral. And finally, um, the finalization of the COVID-19 vaccination measures. Um, I know that nursing home facilities have been reporting on a weekly basis, and that data has really been extremely helpful. So thank you for uh, everyone for doing that. Next slide. Some potential future directions I think I've alluded to already. Safety, including patient and workforce safety, including staffing and staffing levels. Mental health, reducing disparities, a continued uh, focus on infection control. And today we'll be talking also about the HOPE tool for hospice uh, performance. Next. So, again, thank you. Thank you to the committee and all of your deliberations that you're going to have today and really for your important voice. And this slide didn't get changed, but it was for post acute care um, and your really heroic. Um, efforts for the COVID pandemic. Again, we look forward to a successful day and on behalf of CMS, I'd like to really wish each and every one of you a very happy holiday. Before we close though from CMS, there is one other person that I have a special thanks um, for and I think you will too. Um, and he will be uh, taking over in part for my role today in this uh, committee and that's Dr. Alan Levitt. Many of you know Dr. Levitt, he's been at CMS for uh, nine years. He's been part of uh, the CMS team on this committee for a very long time. Ellen is a geriatrician who had deep experience actually in running geriatric facilities. He came to CMS, as I mentioned, about nine years ago and has really been instrumental in not only enacting the Impact Act, but in shaping the programs for post-acute care. Alan uh, announced to us recently his retirement in July. We are um, very sad to see him leave, but we are delighted for his uh, future rest and relaxation and retirement. And if you get him talking about horse racing, I think you'll find uh, some of his passions. But with that, a very special thanks from CMS to Alan and uh, introducing Alan. And, and I know he has a few comments as well. Alan, I turn it over to you. No, oh, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, and, and thank you for the recognition you just gave the PAC community um, during the challenges they've had during the pandemic and public health emergency. Um, as Michelle just said, this is my ninth year as the federal uh, liaison representative on the work group, and it will be my last. Um, I am retiring in July. Um, while, I'm, while I'm proud of the work the uh, team has accomplished uh, here at CMS, I'm particularly proud of the work we've done here. As I believe our work group represents the definition of the public-private partnership. Um, quality measurement work in healthcare is hard work, uh, caring for and advocating for our patients and our residents in post-acute care is particularly hard work. Uh, put those two together. Uh, well, for for all of us uh, sitting around this virtual table, we've done this for our professional lives. Uh, to quote Hyman Roth, uh, this is the business we've chosen. Uh, it's, it's particularly challenging work. Uh, but despite that, we've accomplished a lot together. Um, just um, one example is the feedback loop that we present every year. And actually this morning, I have more feedback <laughs> to give to you. Just yesterday, the White House announced findings from uh, vaccination and COVID data submitted by long-term care facilities to the NHSN that uh, demonstrate the importance of booster vaccinations in long-term care residents. In this example, uh, it demonstrated that boosters, um, those residents that got boosters were more than 10 times less likely to get COVID than unvaccinated residents. Out. Our data, our measures, our our work here matters. Um, so I want to thank Michelle, who leads all the quality work uh, on our end, uh, CMS team, contractors, MQF staff, co-chairs, Jerry and Kurt, all of you on the work group for, for all the work we've done over these nine years. Uh, this may be my last dance with all of you, but let's make it a good dance. Uh, so let's get going and back to you, Matt.
Thank you uh, so much, Alan and and Michelle, for those welcoming remarks. Um, uh, Alan, uh, you definitely will be missed. Um, and I, I only speak for the, the limited capacity I've worked with you, but it's been such a pleasure. Um, and I can, I'm sure it's the same for other, these other work group participants, including including our co-chairs, Jerry and Kurt. Um, but thank you both so much. I, we have a few minutes uh, to see if there's any questions uh, that the work group have uh, for what's been presented. Um, see if there's any questions you have before we go to our next presentation. So I'll, I'll pause now to see if there's any questions from the work group. You can use the chat feature, obviously, and we'll, we'll keep an eye on that and monitor that. Or you can use the raise hand feature or just take yourself off mute if you'd like to. But if you have any questions, we have a, some space to, to do that now. I would like to say something. Paul Mulhausen here. Sure, Paul. I, um, I'm, I, this is not a question, it's a comment. Um, I, I've had the privilege of being part of this group for years, and, and I am honestly heartbroken to see Dr. Levitt retiring and departing. He, he has uh, simply been a pillar of quality improvement in the post-acute long-term care space that um, is, I, I, I don't have words to articulate um, the impact he's made. So Alan, I'm sorry to see you go, but glad, actually honored to have the opportunity to participate in your last dance with this work group. So when we're all done, good luck with everything you end up doing in retirement. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, and um, this is Raj, and I, I want to jump right in after Paul. I, you, you beat me to it. Um, yeah, Alan, thank you so much. I, it's not just what we have done here, but I just want to tell everybody that um, when, when, when COVID hit um, and we were all in post acute long term care, and I get, get, get very, very emotional talking about it, um, you know, we, we would, we would talk and, and text and just, just, you know, the support overall um, you gave um, uh, was just, just, there's no words for it. And of course, everything you've done here uh, to make the difference, uh, it, it, you know, for physicians, especially myself, who, who's in a private practice setting, coming to these meetings, sometimes it's a, it's a little disconnect, but you have really um, shown how it truly is that private public you know partnership that that can that can really be something that the guys like us who are still out there um, doing the field work uh, find useful. Thank you so much, Alan. And Jerry, you have your hand raised. I do. I do. Um, so, like Paul and Raj, um, Alan. I am so excited for you to be able to retire, but I have to say to start the meeting with hearing about your retirement is very sad. It's been one of the highlights of working on this committee with you for so many years. And um, Kurt and I certainly have our work cut out for us today that we are going to capitalize on having you with us for the last meeting. And we're gonna do our damnedest to make this a good dance. Um, so thank you for so many years of just wonderful, wonderful dialogue. I do have a question for Michelle and Michelle, thank you for the overview. And it's, it's been fantastic working with you as well. I wondered as we get started today, as you talked about the key focus areas, if you could just say a few more words about kind of the mindset CMS related to equity, such a huge and important area and certainly huge implications for measurement and risk adjustment and so on and so forth. So any thoughts that you have as we launch into probably what will be years of looking at this, any words of wisdom from CMS in terms of how we think about the muck measures with related to equity? And then another question is, 
you had encouraged us to look at safety and the recommitment to that. As we talk about gaps, you know, there are so many other areas, you know, that we also need to be looking at down the road. So perspectives on equity from CMS and then how we look at safety and the, the real call for the recommitment as well as moving the needle forward. Well, those are big questions, Jerry. Thank you for asking. Let me start with equity. Equity is clearly going to be a multi-year process and frankly, to some degree, an entire, I don't want to say change of mind, but um, a, a shift because we really haven't made the same kind of improvements in equity as we have made in other aspects of quality. So if we all think back, 20 years to those domains and, you know, to air as humans. So to improve timeliness, to improve safety and yeah, equity was clearly there, but equity hasn't made the same gains. Um, and some of you may have seen National Academy of Medicine actually convened a group of uh, people who put out a white paper about the call towards committing to equity. I think it's going to have multiple strategies. The first one really has to be around data collection. The reality is that we don't have good patient reported data around the aspects that we need to be stratifying our data at and looking at our program performance and outcomes by. So even CMS does not have good patient reported data on race and ethnicity, let alone sexual orientation and gender identity, um, other things that we would wanna stratify for. So I think number one, is you'll start seeing a coalescence of how do we actually collect the data? What is the right data that we need to collect? How do we collect it in a way that we can make it standardized and interoperable? And so I think that's one focus. I don't know that that's for this committee, but just to say we have to start there because we have to make the we have to define what it is we want to look at and then make sure that we are all collecting the data um, in a way that we can all use it. The second, I think, is going to be stratification, and this might be actually a very interesting uh, question for this committee in particular. What are those measures that rise to the top of your list that you would want to see stratified? First, back in confidential feedback reports to facilities, for example, and then really that might be publicly reported or even tied to payment. And the payment eventually uh, may be something like closing the gaps in equity. And I'll just give you a, for instance, for example, um, SNF VPP is a readmission measure. If we were to stratify that by dual eligibles or by other ways of stratification, there are many ways of stratifying, as I just uh, pointed out. And if there are gaps, rewarding for closing those gaps, for example. So I think for measures, one good question for the committee is what might be your priority measures for stratification? I think other things that are obviously going to have to come up is payment policy. You know, the quality measures aren't really payment policy, but clearly that's going to have to rise to the top as well. Measures including access. How do we ensure that people are getting the right access to care, the right referrals to care, the right coverage for care? And so this is so multidimensional and multi-pronged, but I think that the quality measurement programs can actually be important in number one, making some of these issues transparent in how it is we're performing, and number two, eventually tying it to payment. But I think uh, a lot of what we will be looking at in the coming years is stratification of data. The second around safety is, you know, we've had a lot of focus on safety over the past decade or so. Um, certainly, you know, the CDC has brought a lot of focus around healthcare acquired infections, um, and these really degraded in the past two years, many of you may have seen CDC's reports that um, the gains of the last 10 years were almost wiped out in the past couple of years. And that that is really a sad, sad commentary. Now, I know that there's many reasons for that, obviously, you know, just the challenge of taking care of COVID patients itself. But it also, I think, speaks to a deeper fundamental issue of were our safety processes and our reliability processes deeply enough embedded to kind of withstand a change and, and really a catastrophic change, but still to withstand a change. And how do we rebuild with resiliency 
so that we ensure that we don't take a take we don't back step um, and our processes, I think, around resiliency, reliability, um, the commitment to that, the processes for that, I think need to, to have continued focus. But Jerry, you're absolutely right. There are a lot of other areas to focus on as well, many of which you'll be hearing today. I'm actually really excited because I think the post-acute care community has led the way actually in some of its tools, its functional assessment tools, its OASIS tools for actually asking the questions around social determinants of health and race and ethnicity. And so I think to some degree, the post-acute community can actually lead the way in using those tools, showing others how to use them. How do we translate them across the continuum of care um, and make sure that we're providing the best care for all of our beneficiaries? So I know I was a little long-winded, sorry, but thank you for the question. Thank you. This excellent stage setting, Michelle. So it's um, just about 11 o'clock Eastern. Um, I'm going to keep us moving. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Schreiber and Dr. Levitt. Uh, I will just say, you know, Dr. Schreiber, you start out with this challenge of us trying to finish early, and then and then you let us know, and or Alan then lets lets us know that he's retiring. So it's quite it's quite uh, <laughs> quite a bomb to drop. Um, but uh, thank you both very much for the welcoming remarks. Um, Dr. Levitt will be around throughout the day to. Uh, answer any questions as they come up. So thank you, Dr. Levitt. Um, and again, once again, thank you, Dr. Schreiber. Um, so I'm going to keep us moving forward. Um, on our agenda next, we have the updates to the HOPE tool. So we do have some uh, uh, presenters here uh, that will walk us through these, this, this discussion uh, and presentation today. So we have Cindy Masuda, who's the program lead for Hospice Quality Reporting Program at CMS. We also have uh, from APT Associates, we have Jennifer Riggs and TJ Christensen, uh, who will also be um, presenting with Cindy. So I'll turn it over to Cindy, maybe you uh, to kick us off, or maybe it's TJ. Um, not really 100% sure on who's going to kick us off, but uh, the slides are ready to go. So just hit say next slide and um, we'll, we'll proceed uh, through that accordingly. Sure. Good, good morning, Matt. It's Cindy Masood. I'll kick it off. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'm Cindy Masuda, and I'm the Hospice Quality Reporting Program Coordinator for CMS. And I'm joined today by the two task leads for our contractor supporting the quality uh, reporting program, uh, Jen Riggs and TJ Christian of APT Associates. Next slide, please. So Jen Riggs will be discussing the development of the new hospice um, outcomes and patient evaluation, also known as HOPE, which is a um, hospice patient assessment, and TJ Christian will discuss measure concepts that could be developed with the new information that will be collected using HOPE. We greatly appreciate this opportunity to present the draft HOPE and discuss this new patient assessment plan for use in Medicare certified hospices. To provide a robust discussion, the three of us are presenting the HOPE um, update and leaving time for your questions. Next slide, please. So the HOPE development process to get to where we are today, which is national beta testing, is the result of successive um, phases of testing. Um, sorry. It's the, there are the phases that we're in. We've done cognitive, we've done pilot testing, and we've done alpha testing. Each phase has informed revisions to the HOPE assessment and the national beta test. The draft HOPE is designed to assess patient needs throughout the hospice day. It captures care at key time points that follow the hospice model. Draft HOPE comprises nursing, psychosocial, and spiritual, um, and spiritual disciplinary assessments. HOPE-based quality measure concepts were discussed with the technical expert panel. And lastly, HOPE must go through rulemaking prior to implementation. Next slide, please. So the current um, approach for collecting data um, uses a data collection tool called the hospice item set. So as you can see, we have our program currently, which is the hospice quality reporting program using the hospice item set, caps, and claims. 
And the hospice item set is the current way that we collect our uh, data for patient assessment. And the HIS provides um, basic information about the patient and their hospice stay, but it's only at admission and discharge. And so for so that's why the hospice item set data is extracted from clinical records at admission and discharge. The data from the HIS at present supports one hospice quality reporting program process measure. And that's the NQF endorsed 3235, the comprehensive assessment at hospice admission. However, the HIS is not designed as a patient assessment that can support outcome quality measures. So to progress the hospice quality reporting program to better serve the needs of patients, families, and our aging population, HOPE expands the information collected and the range of quality measures that can be calculated. CMS has contracted with APT Associates and its partners to develop HOPE. Next slide, please. I'd now like to turn it over to the conversation to Jen Riggs, who will discuss for um, the further development of HOPE. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Next slide, please. The HOPE assessment is intended as a patient-centered assessment that encourages increased patient engagement in their care and provides hospices with real-time patient assessment information to better understand patients' care needs throughout their hospice stay. Hospices may also use the HOPE assessment data in their quality improvement activities. CMS can use HOPE assessment data in development of multiple types of quality measures, including outcome measures, to provide a meaningful set of quality measures for the hospice quality reporting program, to assess the results of care experienced by patients, and to show more variability across hospices for public reporting and publicly reported quality measures support patient and family choice of a hospice provider. Next slide, please. HOPE is a patient assessment designed to be completed during patient care. In this way, HOPE is different from the hospice item set, which is designed to be a review of the record after care is completed. The HOPE assessment is not a comprehensive assessment. It's designed to be part of the comprehensive assessment, a subset of assessment items. The HOPE assessment is aligned with the hospice conditions of participation to support patient safety and hospice quality improvement initiatives. HOPE is multidisciplinary. It consists of three distinct disciplinary assessments, a nursing assessment completed by the registered nurse, a psychosocial assessment completed by the social worker, and a spiritual care assessment completed by the chaplain. HOPE may be completed at multiple time points throughout the patient's stay. HOPE is unique in that regular assessments at hospice admission and interim reassessments may trigger a follow-up HOPE symptom reassessment. This design is specifically to support potential outcome quality measures related to pain and symptom management. Next slide, please. The development of the draft HOPE assessment has involved multiple iterative and overlapping phases of information gathering, drafting, and testing. Up to this point, successive drafts of the HOPE assessment have undergone cognitive, pilot, and alpha testing, and results from each phase of testing inform CMS decisions on the next version of the assessment. Results from the current phase of testing, the beta test, will inform CMS decisions about the final draft of the HOPE assessment. CMS will propose the HOPE assessment in rulemaking prior to any national implementation. Next slide, please. The draft HOPE assessment, as I mentioned, includes three disciplinary assessments. HOPE assessment items are derived from multiple sources, including existing Impact Act standardized patient assessment items, other CMS existing items, Office of Minority Health Social Determinants of Health items, external hospice-specific assessment items, and new items developed specifically for HOPE. Including standardized assessment items in the instrument that are also used in other CMS post-acute care instruments supports CMS's goal for interoperability. In addition, the inclusion of Office of Minority Health standardized items for ethnicity, race, and language supports CMS's objectives to advance data collection to identify health disparities, which address health equity. 
Next slide, please. Now I'd like to turn over to my colleague, TJ Christian, who will discuss measure concepts that could be calculated from HOPE. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and I guess we can go to the next slide. Uh, so, right, so as Cindy mentioned uh, earlier, we have discussed HOPE-based quality measure concepts with our technical expert panel, or, or TEP. So the items needed for measure calculations we collected at multiple time points across the patient's stay uh, through the multiple assessments, which Jen just talked about. We've not yet calculated quality measures, um, but you know, as was noted, we uh, will be entering the beta phase of item testing, and with the upcoming beta test, uh, we'll monitor our data collection for the feasibility of also using this item test data, which of course was intended for um, item reliability to QM testing. Potential items we've discussed with the TEP uh, include the symptom impact, pain screening, pain active problem, and patient desired tolerance level for symptoms or uh, patient preferences for symptom management items in HOPE. Next slide, please. As described in CMS's publicly available 2020 TEP summary report, our TEP supported the following measure concepts that would be calculated or could be calculated from HOPE items. So first would be a timely reduction of pain impact, which reports the percentage of patients who experienced a reduction in the impact of moderate or severe pain. Second, reduction in pain severity, which reports the percentage of patients who had a reduction in reported pain severity. And third, timely reduction of non-pain symptoms impact, which measures the percentage of patients who experience reduction in the impact of symptoms other than pain. The next slide, please. CMS continues to develop and refine these three candidate quality measures. Uh, for further down the line um, in recent rulemaking, CMS also expressed interest in uh, additional concepts. So that includes uh, preferences for symptom management, uh, spiritual and psychosocial needs, and medication management uh, and outcomes of care. And the next slide, please. Okay, great. So thanks for allowing us to present on the state of hope and hope based quality measures. At this point, I just want to pass the presentation back to Cindy. Thank you, TJ. Um, before we conclude, I just wanted to extend an invitation to attend our public um, hospice quality reporting program forum quarterly series. And these are um, typically focused on hope updates. And we provided the web pages here um, that you can keep you updated regarding HOPE, the provider and stakeholder engagement web page, which also provides you access to our TEP reports in the download section. And then also we have our HOPE updates web page, which is the HOPE web page shown at the bottom here. Um, and we just, uh, with that, I really want to thank you for the opportunity to present on our this important work. We've been working very hard on this over several years. So I'd um, like to now address any questions you might have and give that opportunity at this meeting. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Cindy, Jennifer, and TJ for walking us through an update here on the HOPE tool. Um, if you have questions, uh, the work group has any questions for our presenters today, uh, please feel free to take yourself off mute or raise your hand uh, or use the chat feature, which we'll monitor. So if you have any questions, please, Feel free to take the floor. Uh, I see David, David Andrews has his hand up. David? Yeah, I, um, this is sort of outside of the frame that you're, you're operating in, but I think it's important as you move forward to consider something that's rarely considered in any of these evaluations, that is, uh, uh, patient, family, or caretaker opinions of things. I, uh, as an old person, there are a lot of people that I experience who don't have a very good handle on their own situation, whereas often caretakers that have been around them quite a bit have a much better focus on how they're responding to the situation. So I would hope uh, as all of this moves forward in the future, there could be some uh, expansion to evaluation of caretaker or family member perceptions. Sure. Thank you. I mean, as we, um, I think as you we you look through as you, our TEP reports and our work with the TEP, um, we are looking at things like patient preference and um, looking at issues like that. Um, I think that you know work that 
and I'll Jen and um, TJ to chime in related to the thinking about that in terms of our quality measures and way that we can think about patient preference um, in our work. And I'll turn it over to TJ and Jen for further uh, to your question. But I very much yeah, appreciate I, I, the question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I could just you know say I probably just echo what what Cindy said. Um, it thanks for the kind of consideration. We'll kind of continue to you know to think about that that aspect and you know quality measure development. I would certainly just want to you know share uh, appreciate Cindy TJ Jen taking the time to explain. Uh, where we're at right now with the hope very exciting to see the continued development i certainly want to echo what david andrews uh, is pointing out i think uh, being able to get into some of the caregiver preferences throughout the course of the care uh, not just the preferences that we currently rely on that takes place several months after the care through the caps uh, level surveys and certainly uh, certainly applaud the, the looking at the quality uh, concepts of interest uh, specifically preferences of care uh, throughout the stay of the individual patient and you know where we're we talked about previously and uh, uh, dr schreiber talked about from a safety standpoint looking at medication reconciliation and best practices um, so much can be done for the benefit of patients through improved processes for medication reconciliation would love to see that further expanded thank you and we are looking at issues like that um and we actually, we do keep a hope mailbox um, available and we are always looking for people's input um, as we're looking at de you know, developing hope. So appreciate uh, the, your feedback on that. Excuse me, this is Ben Marcantoni with NHPCO and <clears throat> Cindy and team. I'm wondering, uh, being newer to the, this group and the process on this side of it, Wondering uh, where we are with the hope tool and how it will interface with EMRs, um, uh, and if you can comment at all at this point. Sure. So hope, as we're saying, is in the national beta testing right now. Um, so we have that process will continue for the um, through about July, and then we have to go through analyses of that data. So um, it's the better part of the year, um, the 2020 year. Um, but from that, we are the idea of hope is that it can be um, incorporated into the electronic medical record. It's meant to be, um, you know, it's meant to be used. And I think Jen was talking about this um, during the presentation. It's meant to be the trifecta, the hospices using it for their patient care, for plan of care, for families using it for decision making, for CMS using it for data to develop the quality measures. So it's meant to be the win-win of um, you know, the pay assessments um, so that it can be as useful as real-time data and to help really progress both in work that the, the important work hospices are doing and the quality measure program. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? From the work group, I just I just like to ask about the um, the timetable for going from the beta test and the and the finalization of the of the instrument to the development of the quality metrics. So I mean, we are looking. We look at the data that we have um, in beta testing to see what we have in beta testing for. Um, being able to develop quality measures and, um, and then we have to based on, we have to look at the analyses of the work to see what our next, you know, being able to fully develop the quality measures. But did you have any sense about how long that process is likely to take before we have quality metrics to and the draft form? Um, this time to, it really, um, it depends on the analyses from beta testing, um. We'll see what will help us to determine our ability to be able to specify the measures. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? 
or comments. Okay. Hearing none, I, I do want to thank Cindy, TJ, and Jennifer once again for providing an update on, on the Hope tool. Thank you so much uh, for all of your work. Um, we'll now keep going. We're about 10 minutes ahead of schedule, but that's uh, perfectly okay as we have to keep to uh, Dr. Shriver's challenge, right? Um, all right. So uh, next we have a presentation on the overview of the pre rulemaking approach and uh, my colleague, uh, Suzanne Young, will walk us through a preliminary analysis, our decision categories, um, and then also the uh, advisory groups and how that input is worked into the PAs. So I'll turn it over to Suzanne uh, to kick us off. Thanks, Matt. Um, we will now review the pre rulemaking approach. I know we do have some returning members. We've also had great attendance during, during our orientation meetings in October. So some of this contact maybe look a little familiar to you. Next slide, please. First, we wanna start with the preliminary analysis. Next slide. So each measure under consideration receives a preliminary analysis. We also refer that, uh, we re refer that as a PA also. The preliminary analysis or PA provides MAP members with a profile of each measure. And this serves as a starting point for the discussion. The NQF staff utilizes an algorithm developed from the measure selection criteria to evaluate each measure under consideration. And we're going to go over that algorithm in the next few slides. Next slide. So this slide and the next few slides indicate the PA algorithm utilized by the NQF staff. On the left column, this, this indicates the assessment criteria of which there are seven. The center column indicates the definition of the corresponding assessment. And then the right column is the outcome that results from the assessment. So starting with the first assessment, this indicates whether the measure addresses a critical quality objective, not adequately addressed by the measures in the program set. So the outcome is either a yes or no answer. And so for this first assessment, if the answer is no, the measure receives a do not support outcome and the assessment ends. The second assessment is whether the measure is evidence-based and is either strongly linked to outcomes or an outcome measure. Again, the answer is no to this assessment, the measure will receive a do not support outcome. The third measure addresses a quality challenge. Again, if the answer is no to this assessment, the measure will receive a do not support outcome. Next slide, please. And continue with the PA. The fourth assessment indicates whether the measure contributes to the efficient use of measurement resources and or supports alignment of measurement across the program. Again, the outcome is a yes or no answer. If the answer to this assessment is no, the highest rating potential is do not support with potential for mitigation. The fifth assessment indicates whether the measure can be feasibly reported. Again, if this assessment answer is no, the highest rating potential is do not support with potential for mitigation. Next slide. And going on to the sixth assessment, which addresses whether the measure is applicable to and appropriately specified for the program's intended care setting, level of analysis, and population. If the answer is no to this assessment, the highest rating potential is conditional support. The seventh and last assessment addresses implementation. If the measure is in current use, no unreasonable implementation issues that outweigh the benefits of the measure have been identified. If implementation issues are identified, the highest rating potential is conditional support. We will cover more specifics of the decision categories in the next slide, but let me pause here to see if there's any questions regarding the algorithm. Okay, let's move on. Next slide. Now we will go over the voting decision categories. Next slide. Let's start with the map decision categories. Uh, the left column is the four decision categories. The center column is the definition of the decision, and then the right column is the evaluation criteria. 
starting with support for rulemaking, MAP supports the implementation of the measure as currently specified. Next, conditional support for rulemaking. MAP supports implementation of the measure as, spe as specified, but has indicated certain conditions or modifications ideally addressed prior to implementation. Next, we have do not support for rulemaking with potential for mitigation. MAP does support implement, um, excuse me, MAP does not support implementation as the measure is currently specified. MAP agrees with its importance, but has suggested modifications. Such a modification could be considered a material change to the measure. And finally, do not support for rulemaking. MAP does not support the measure. Again, let me pause here and see if we have any questions about the MAP decision categories. No questions. We'll keep moving on. Next slide, please. And now let's go over the MAP voting process. Next slide, please. Here are the key voting principles, starting with quorum, defined as 66% of the voting members of the committee present for live voting to take place. Quorum is established prior to voting. The process is one, by taking roll call, as Matt completed earlier in, in our meeting today, and two, determining if quorum is present. At this time, only if a member of the committee questions quorum, is it necessary to reassess the presence. If quorum is not established during the meeting, the vote will be had via electronic ballot after the meeting. For the record, we have quorum today, and MAP has established a consensus threshold of greater than or equal to 60% of voting participants voting positively, and a minimum of 60% of the quorum voting positively. Abstentions do not count in the denominator, and every measure under consideration will receive a decision. Next slide, please. The key voting, um, uh, let's review the voting procedure. So step one, after public commenting, opportunity for all measures within the program, the staff will review the PA for each measure under consideration using the MAP selection criteria as, as discussed earlier. At this time, staff will also review the input from the MAP advisory group and from public comments submitted to NQF during the online commenting period. Step two, the co-chairs will ask for any clarifying questions from the work group. This includes lead discussants who may also have clarifying questions. Work group members and lead discussants should withhold their other comments at this time. In the web environment, the co-chairs will address questions one by one. Measure developers will respond to clarifying questions on specifics or specifications, and NQF staff will respond to questions on the PA. Next slide. Step three, after clarifying questions, the co-chairs will open for a vote on accepting the preliminary analysis assessment. This vote will be framed as a yes or no vote to accept the work group decision. If greater than or equal to 60% of the work group members vote to accept the PA assessment, then the assessment will become the work group recommendation. This will end the discussion of this measure and the work group will move on to the next measure. If less than 60% of the work group votes to accept the preliminary analysis assessment, further discussion will now open on this measure. Next slide. Step four, if the work group did not vote to uphold the staff recommendation on the measure in step three, the co-chairs will then open discussion and voting on this measure. The co-chairs will first ask lead discussants to review and present their findings the co-chairs will then open discussion among the work group. Work group members should participate in the discussion to make their opinions known. However, one should refrain from repeating points already presented. After discussion, co-chairs will open the measure for a vote. Co-chairs will summarize those major themes within the discussion, and co-chairs will determine what decision category will be put to a vote first, based on any potential consensus emerging from the discussion. If there's not a consensus position to use to begin voting, the work group will take a vote on each potential decision category one at a time, starting with support for rulemaking. Next slide. And step five, if a decision category put forth receives greater than or equal to 60% of the vote, 
the motion will pass and the measure will receive that decision. Now, if no decision category achieves greater than 60% to overturn the PA, the preliminary analysis will stand and this will be marked and noted for the coordinating committee's consideration during their January meeting. And now we would like to pause to conduct a test question on the Poll Everywhere platform. As Matt mentioned, you received an email this morning or voting members received an email with that link. And so we'd like you to pull up that link and we're gonna pull up a test question. Can I just ask a question? Before sure, the voting? When the Poll Everywhere opens, it asks for a name. Should we be putting our names in there? Or yes. no? Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Any other questions before we go to the test question? Okay, the test question is open and you should be able to vote on, do you like coffee? Yes or no? And again, let us know if you're having any problems. It looks like we have 15 results and is anyone having difficulties? Yeah. How do we activate? I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to activate with this um, link. The voting. If you put it, do you put it in just a regular browser and it's supposed to activate or do we put it somewhere on this page to activate? It is a, it is a link to um, you use in a browser. Yes. But any browser, because it didn't recognize it in the browser I was using. Hey, this is Paul Mulhausen. I have a question. And that is, it, how do we know you got our vote? It will, it, it makes a color, I believe it shows up as blue. Okay. So the blue reassures me you got a vote from me. Yeah, and it, it's still open and, and also I'll, I'll make that that note is once um, while the vote is still open, you can clear your answer if you happen to answer um, something that you did not want to and change your change your answer. And while it's activated until we lock it, you can change your answer. Thank you. You're welcome. There we go. Anyone else having difficulties? Can you resend the link? I, I seem to can't find the link. Sorry. Is that Pam, Pamela Roberts? Yes, please. Yep, sure. We shall resend it. So our team is going to resend that link to you, Pam. So that would be our 18th. Okay. I'm excited to hear the results of this test question. <laughs> I think everybody else is too. I was I was wondering if we're going to do like a holiday themed question, but do you like coffee? Pretty good. I'm trying to um, sway the vote here with my pictures all the time. Right. So. <laughs> Not sure you should do that on CMS side there, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> would it be appropriate to just ask clarifying questions about the voting process while we're finishing this up or would you sure. rather I wait? No, no, please. Um, so I'm new to this. <laughs> um, so I apologize if this is obvious. So if 
we as a group decide to accept the PA, then that essentially is a vote in favor of the measure moving forward and we don't do any other steps. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So if we have any questions or concerns, the only way to get to debate is to not vote to accept the PA. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, so just to clarify there, um, so if the PA, which in this case, um, um, there aren't any do not supports, but um, you know sometimes a PA could say do not support for rulemaking. So in that case, the measure you know, would not move forward, if you will, but um, but you are correct in, in that if it is uh, support for rulemaking or conditional support for rulemaking and the condition sometimes is NQF endorsement, if the committee does decide to uphold those preliminary analysis decisions, um, then there's no more discussion for that measure. And we move on to the next program or to the next measure. Okay. Um, so if, there, if, if the committee uh, does not um, wish to accept that rating in the preliminary analysis, less than 60% um, of the committee need to vote in favor. Um, so it would not be accepted. And then it opens up for further discussion on a different decision category uh, that would be placed on that measure. Okay, I think I'm following. <laughs> so, okay, uh, we'll definitely go through it um, as many times as needed throughout the day. Uh, and and uh, usually after the first measure or the first uh, couple a couple measures, um, the work groups usually start getting into that groove uh, of of how this process works. But um, uh, we'll definitely uh, go through it again if if needed. Uh, so please feel free to ask questions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And looks like Pamela, your vote's in for eighteen. Thank you. And we have a high uh, majority here that like coffee. <laughs> so after each question, we will then show the responses. And thank you. Go back to the slide. Suzanne, this is Jerry. Is eighteen yeah. is eighteen the number we're working off of? Eighteen is the number we're currently working off of. We we do have one that that may be stepping away at times, and we're noting that. And and Matt will he will note that at the beginning of each each vote. Great. And Nicole, I just want to um, echo Matt. You ask all the questions you want. I have co-chaired this for a long time, and I still write a workflow before the meetings because there are just so many steps in this. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. Next slide, please. So now we do want to talk about the review of the measures under consideration by the MAP advisory groups, and we've mentioned these groups earlier today, and they met last week to review all measures. Next slide, please. The first of the two advisory groups is the Rural Health Advisory Group. The charge of this particular group is to provide input on rural specific measurement issues, share rural perspectives relevant to the selection of quality measures for MAP, and provide input on priority rural health issues, such as low case volume challenges. Next slide, please. And the Rural Health Advisory Group reviewed all the measures under consideration for all three work groups and provided feedback to the setting specific work groups, which you will hear today. The rural health review included relative, uh, relative priority in terms of access, cost or quality encountered by rural residents, data collection challenges for rural providers, methodological problems of calculating, potential unintended consequences and gap areas. And the rural health group, uh, they don't vote, but they take a poll and they polled on whether the measure was suitable for use with rural providers within a specified program of interest. Next slide, please. And this is the first year for our second advisory group, the MAP Health Equity Advisory Group. And for anyone who may have attended or listened in to the meeting last week, it was a day full of robust discussion. The charge of this group is to provide input on the measures under consideration with a lens to measurement issues impacting health disparities. Also to provide input on the measures under consideration with a goal to reduce health differences closely linked to social, economic, 
or environmental disadvantages. Next slide, please. Again, the Health Equity Advisory Group reviewed all the measures under consideration and provided feedback to the setting specific work groups, which you will hear today. Health Equity's review included relative priority in terms of advancing health equity for all, data collection challenges regarding health disparities, methodological problems of calculating, potential unintended consequences, and gap areas. And again, they don't take a vote, but they take a poll, and the, they were polled on the potential impact on health disparities if the measure is included within a specific program of interest. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and feedback from both advisory groups is provided to the setting specific work groups through the following mechanism. Within the PA is a qualitative summary of the discussion during the advisory groups and the average polling results. The polling results are a five point Likert scale and as follows. The rural health advisory groups perception of suitability from a rural perspective and the health of it equity advisory groups per perception of the potential impacts of health disparities. And finally, a summary of each advisory group's discussion will be provided during our meeting today. And Matt will review that as he reviews the PA. Are there any questions on the pause here? Are there any questions regarding our advisory groups? And let me go back and pause. Are there any questions about the preliminary analysis? Any more voting questions? I think I will turn it back to you, Matt. Great, thank you, Suzanne. Um, so as Jerry had mentioned and mentioned as well, as we go through the process, please feel free to ask questions on how the process is to proceed as we go through it or any clarification on the decision categories, et cetera. As you saw, um, step two of the of our voting process is an opportunity for clarifying questions, as Suzanne mentioned. That's clarifying questions to the measure developer if needed on any of the the measure specifics and specifications, but also questions to NQF on the decision categories and preliminary analysis. So I uh, will have opportunities throughout uh, our process for, for the questions. So we encourage you to do so. Um, we are ahead of schedule, but um, recognizing that MAP is really, um, uh, there's a lot of stakeholder input with MAP, um, including public comment. And so, as I mentioned, we have public comment built into the reviews of these measures also at the very end of the proceedings today. So uh, there are those members of the public that are keeping an eye on our agenda and most likely will be joining us at one o'clock for the first set of measures. So with that, since we are ending um, a little uh, or ahead of schedule, uh, we'll still reconvene at one. But right now we have uh, a lunch built in. So we'll reconvene at one. That's just about 45 minutes uh, for lunch. And we'll come back at 12.30, uh, excuse me, not one o'clock, 12.30. Uh, thank you, uh, team, for reminding me. Yesterday was, was one o'clock, MAP Hospital. Today is different. Uh, today, we'll reconvene at 12.30 p.m. That's still a 45-minute lunch. So 12.30 p.m. Eastern, we'll reconvene and uh, start out with our first measure. Uh, so it's a cross-cutting measure, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that when we reconvene. So see everyone at 12.30 p.m. on the dot. We'll ask the team to restart the recording. Thank you. And we will get started. Um, so thank you all for coming back from um, a little bit of an extended lunch or breakfast for some uh, beyond what is included in our agenda. But I just wanted to make sure that we have uh, members of the public kind of keeping an eye on our agenda or calling in to uh, provide inputs on respective measures. So we're reconvening now. Um, and we're going to start with our first set of measures, which are the cross cutting measures and our co chair Kurt will be um, facilitating this discussion. Um, if we can just go to the next slide, I just wanted to touch on uh, why this is indicated as cross cutting um, for the measures. Um, the reason being is because uh, this measure, the specific measure 098 was submitted to multiple programs. 
is actually submitted to three programs. So that's why it's a sort of cross cutting. Um, there will be an opportunity for this work group to carry over the votes uh, to other programs after evaluating it's the first program, which the first program up will be the Skilled Nursing Facility Quality Reporting Program or SNF QRP. Um, the other two programs that this measure was submitted to was the Long-Term um, long -term Care Hospital Quality Reporting Program and the Inpatient Rehabilitation Facility Quality Reporting Progr Program. So after the work group evaluates the measure for the skilled nursing facility, um, if this work group sees that the discussion points and also the decision category and conditions, if the conditions are placed on it, um, is the same for the other two remaining programs, the uh, LTCH and the ERF programs, we can carry over the program or carry over the votes to those programs. So um, we will do that after the evaluation of the first program. And then we'll, uh, we'll see if there's an opposition to carry over those votes. It only takes one of the work group members to oppose a carryover for us to then uh, have uh, a revote on those programs. So if you are opposed to carrying over those votes, we'll then go through the uh, voting processes uh, for those programs. So that opposition, <clears throat> all it takes is just one work group member. You can voice up during the call when it's time to do so. You can raise your hand and be recognized if you'd like to, or you can send a, a, a chat either publicly to everyone, or you can direct chat myself uh, if you oppose. So if you wish to not have your name recognized as opposing uh, the vote, you can directly chat myself, and then it just takes one person to oppose a carryover for us to vote separately on those programs. So again, we'll go through the first program, and then there'll be an opportunity for us to carry over those votes, if you choose to, to the other two programs. <clears throat> and again, it just takes one member to be in opposition of that carryover uh, to, to voice that up for us to vote separately on those programs. Um, I do also want to just pause because I, I believe we have, um, I believe we have Deb uh, Slipa, or Salipa, I apologize, um, on the call from AGS. Is that correct? Deb, are you on the line? Yes. Great. Hi, Deb. Um, I know that we sort of missed you a little bit earlier, but thank you for joining. Um, we did some disclosures of interest earlier uh, for the rest of the work group participants. And since you had joined, we also want to make sure that you have an opportunity to disclose any potential conflicts. So if you could just state your name, your, uh, your affiliation, your role in that uh, organization, as well as any potential disclosures that you'd like to present uh, for the work group today. Thank you, Matt. Um, I am representing the American Geriatric Society. I'm a member of the Public Policy Committee and the Quality Metrics Committee for AGS. Um, I am also a professor of medicine at UCLA, where I direct the Boren Center for Gerontologic Research, um, a, a physician scientist in the Veterans Administration, and a um, senior um, natural scientist at the RAND Corporation. I don't have any direct conflicts with any of the measures that are being discussed today. Great, thank you so much, Deb. Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll kick it over to Kurt um, and then we can get started with our proceedings. So Kurt, I'll have you sort of direct through the slides and whenever you're ready, you can kick it back to me. Yeah, sure, uh, so thank you. Welcome back everyone. Everyone had a good lunch and breakfast. Um, let's get started with our cross-cutting measures, our measure under consideration 2021-2021. 098, the National Healthcare Safety Network Healthcare Associated C. difficile Infection Outcome Measure. And this measure tracks the development of new C. difficile infection in, among patients already admitted to healthcare facilities. At this time, we can do we step over and open it up to public comment on this cross cutting measure? Yeah, let's go to the next slide. And that's the public comment. That's correct, uh, Kurt. We'll open it up for public comment. And as we open it up uh, to comment and start getting uh, individuals uh, feedback, I certainly want to draw your attention to the fact that let's limit our comments to uh, the measure under consideration, specifically the this 2021-098 uh, um, or anything in the long-term care uh, health um, quality reporting program or the uh, IRF, the inpatient rehab facility quality reporting program, and limit your comments possible to two minutes. 
And for those members of the public, um, you see some instructions in the chat. You can raise your, use the raise hand feature to be uh, identified uh, for if you'd like to uh, provide some public comment, or you can put some comments into the chat. So now's an opportunity to do so. We'll pause for a few seconds for public comment on 098, the NHSN Healthcare Associated C. diff outcome measure. See any hands raised on the platform at this time yet? Don't either. And nothing in the chat. So once again, last call for any public comments on this measure. I'm sorry, I just want to double check on the, the parameters. Is this limited to ERF and LTAC right now, or are we discussing SNF as well? It's for SNF as well. So but um since that this is measure also applies to LTC and ERF, um, this opportunity provides the public to comment on this measure with respect to all three programs, including LTC and ERF. So that's why there was just that specific mention of it. So it's for SNF um, QRP, LTC, HQRP, as well as ERF QRP. Okay. And I know we've already submitted our comments on this particular measure. So I don't know that you need me to restate them. Sure, thank you. And we'll definitely cover those comments that were submitted as well. We'll just sort of highlight sort of common themes or concerns with those comments. Thank you. All right, um, seeing no hands raised, nothing in the chat, not hearing anyone um, chime in. Uh, Kurt, I think we can- we'll Go to the proceed. first program. Yeah. All right. Let's see, go to the first program. And if you'd like to go ahead and review the preliminary analysis, uh, public comments advisory group that centers around the skilled nursing facility quality reporting program. Um, Certainly. Background on the SNF QRP. Yes, thank you, Kurt. Um, so, as as we mentioned previously, the first program up is the skilled nursing facility quality reporting program, or SNF QRP. This is a pay for for reporting or public reporting program. So skilled nursing facilities that do not submit the required quality data will have their annual payment uh, update reduced by 2%. And the goal of this program is to increase transparency so that patients are able to make informed decisions. So going to the next slide is the description of the measure. And this measure tracks the development of new C. diff in infection among patients already admitted to healthcare facilities using algorithmic determinations from data sources widely available in electronic health records. This measure improves an, um, on the original measure by requiring both microbiologic evidence of C. diff in stool and evidence of antimicrobial treatment. It's at the facility level of analysis. And for the preliminary uh, analysis, so this is NQF recommendation, it was conditional support for rulemaking. So this measure does add value to the SNF QRP set by adding a measure not currently addressed within the program. And this measure aligns with other packed LTC programs utilizing a similar measure. The updated specifications of this measure uh, are intended to mitigate unintended consequences by only counting those cases uh, where there is evidence of both a positive test for C. diff and a treatment administered which may have led to historical undercounting of, of observed uh, healthcare associated C. diff infections. Healthcare associated infections are important for SNFs um, as seen by recently adopted um, skilled nursing facility health associated infections requiring hospitalizations measure. And measuring healthcare associated infections remains a high priority for the SNF QRP and safety is a, measure, is a CMS meaningful measure 2.0 focus. So currently this measure is not NQF endorsed so that's why it received a conditional support for rulemaking. So the condition here is NQF endorsement. And um, just a reminder for the work group, NQF endorsement includes an evaluation of the evidence. It includes the evaluation of reliability and validity testing. It also includes an evaluation of the feasibility of the measure and the use and usability of the measure. So those components thinking about um, its unintended consequences, if it is used, which currently um, we're evaluating that, um, but also the feasibility and reporting of the measure. So NQF endorsement includes all of those assessments of the measure for an endorsement. So just wanted to note that 
in case there were uh, some of some folks want to add additional conditions of testing. Uh, testing would be kind of underneath the NQF endorsement condition. So that is the uh, condition that's placed on the measure from the NQF recommendations. I'll just touch on the rural health and health equity. So for rural health, on that one to five scale, five being the highest, meaning it's an, um, relevant to rural providers or has some sort of um, impact on rural providers, the rural health um, uh, uh, polled at four, uh, 4.0 out of five. So um, some of the comments shared there were health health associated uh, infection, healthcare associated infections or uh, acquired infections are extremely important to monitor. There was some concern for low case volume. That's a potential challenge uh, in the measure calculation and reporting. The advisor group really encouraged the developer to account for small volume providers. And for critical access hospitals, they do not pr participate um, in, in IQR. This is for the hospital setting, hospital IQR. Uh, but it, it does apply to other hospital settings. For the health equity on that one to five scale, thinking about um, five being that the uh, measure can promote health equity and reduce disparities, they evaluated this at 3.5. I'll touch on some of the public comments. So there really weren't any supportive comments. We did receive two non-supportive comments for this measure, um, mentioning that this measure did not, um, uh, questioning the reliability and validity of this measure, uh, as well, and this measure, um, the me measure justification, specifications, descriptions, all related to the to the hospital and long-term care setting, and none for the SNF setting. This measure does not appear to exclude or take into consideration C diff cases that are required in the hospital prior to discharge of uh, discharge to this to a skilled nursing facility. And the risk adjustment of this measure is not specified. In earlier versions of this measure, only risk adjusted for facility characteristics not patient characteristics. Lastly, this measure also requires a level three SAM certification to submit data to CDC national, um, uh, the NHSN network. Um, there was a recommendation that this measure uh, is to become part of this of the SNF QRP, that this measure is captured the existing data, such as the MDS or claims, instead of the additional administrative burden in reporting through NHSN. So there's some implementation concerns with this measure and reporting on the NHSN, uh, recommending to use other data sources like the minimum data set uh, or claims. So that's just a very, very high level summary of the public comments received for this measure. Again, two non-supportive. And then at this time, I'll turn it back to Kurt who will open it up for any clarifying questions from the work group. Kurt? Absolutely. And what about the, the comment from leading age? Were you going to give a summary of that or? Uh, so the comment from leading age. Yes. I think Nicole Fallon had mentioned that had previously been submitted. Yes, I, I was trying to summarize um, he covered all the comments it. there. Okay, yeah. got it all fully covered. Okay, very good. Thank you, Kurt. I'd appreciate that. So, so anything other? Have... Yes, please go ahead. Can I just ask one other clarifying question? Do we know why this was proposed when we also had the healthcare acquired infections resulting in hospitalization measure? Why we were digging down particularly here? I mean, obviously this doesn't require hospitalization, but I didn't know why we were getting more specific. So is that a question that maybe um, our developer or potentially CMS could address why this measure is being considered versus um, the other measure that's currently in existence? Yeah, hi, uh, this is Alan. Sorry, Alan. Um, if you're not speaking, could you please put yourself on mute? This is causing some feedback. Uh, thank you. Go ahead, Al. Okay. Um, this measure um, it was put on the muck list really as um, an additional measure. Uh, the um, SNF HAI measure is more of a, a global performance measure overall of HAI uh, prevention and management activities within a SNF. And uh, certainly some of the comments that we've gotten 
when we proposed that measure was that um, in addition to that uh, for kind of for a more robust uh, group of measures within um, you know the SNF QRP and particularly within infection uh, prevention domain is to uh, start to look and to add uh, more specific HAI measures that uh, would uh, be going on within the SNF itself. And so uh, that's why I was brought here to the uh, work group for consideration. We do have some hands raised and we can actually uh, go over to Jill Cox. Ah, yes, thank you. So I have a question actually as, um, regarding time parameters for uh, determining that this the C. diff infection occurred in that particular setting. So um, for a patient who's transferred from acute care to any of those settings, and let's say the patient had was it exhibiting symptoms, but they did not test the patient or start treating the patient for C. diff, and they go into a SNF long-term care and day two now they have positive C. diff. Is there, how do we account for that then, that that may have occurred prior to admission um, to the SNF, but it's now going to re reflect on their quality reporting? So I don't know if there's anyone that could clarify that, if there's a present on admission sort of indicator within a certain time frame in which that would be declared that this infection occurred prior to. Yeah, this is Andrea Dunn, and I don't know if you can hear me. Um, uh, from uh, CDC, from the National Healthcare Safety Network. Um, this, the, the way this measure works and the, and the way uh, there's an, an existing uh, C. difficile measure that's used in the LTEX and NERFs and, and in um, the hospitals right now, and this new measure would work in the same way, which is that the, um, the you know, the testing that happens after day four, so it's day four and later in, into, the, into the facility stay, if you will, um, and that's how we handle that. And the risk adjustment accounts for the current risk adjustment and the current measure accounts for testing that happens in the first three days. Um, so we use that as part of the risk adjustment so that the community, in, you know, the community incidents or the pre-existing incidents is accounted for in the risk adjustment. So that if you're in a place, you know, where maybe there's just tons coming in, um, that, is, that is accounted for as part of, as part of the risk adjustment. Um, so, you know, and I think to, sorry, I was having a little trouble with the mute, but to answer the, also the previous question, um, as to why would one pull out C. difficile or why would one pull out any facility acquired condition, um, when there's a global, uh, hospitalization type of metric that also exists, uh, you know, C. difficile causes substantial, uh, morbidity in folks that may not always require um, hospitalization, but can cause, uh, you know, um, substantial impact to quality of life and substantial impact um, to morbidity and, and experience with the extent of the diarrhea that can happen with C. difficile, especially in environments where the antibiotic use may have somewhat less stewardship than, um, you know, than can always, you know, depending on the level of stewardship of antibiotics, but it's, it's all kind of interrelated. So, uh, you know, we do think that it's very important to understand um, the uh, the infections that are happening and being able to have the opportunity to get these, you know, to, to get these um, types of problems under surveillance so that we can truly understand the magnitude of the problem, um, you know, becomes really critical. Eric, do you want, you, you have your hand raised. I do. Um, I have one question for for Matt and NQF about conditional support, and then I have one for the measure developer. Matt, what, the conditional support um, preliminary recommendation is um, pending NQF endorsement as well as additional reliability and validity testing. I just wanted to check, even though the RNV would be part of this, the review at NQF, um, that would be specified as well, because that seems like a critical piece of this is that it needs to be tested in, in the specific environment. That's correct. So the, the testing that it was stated in the preliminary analysis was 
really uh, going in line with NQF endorsement. So the testing of the specific program, the population of interest, um, the, the, the data sources that would be uh, specified for use of the measure, all of that would get evaluated within the testing that would be submitted to NQF for endorsement and submitted to NQF, which would convene a separate standing committee of, of stakeholders to evaluate the measure against those components and those criteria of reliability and validity. Thanks, Matt. And then my other question is related to the risk adjustment. It says in the documentation that we received that social determinants are built into the risk adjustment. And given kind of our spotlight increasingly on on equity and disparities, can you speak a little bit about what about SDOH is in there? Yeah, thanks, Jerry, for those uh, questions. And I can uh, clarify on the first question as well. We're doing, um, we're coming to the end of very extensive um, reliability and validity testing uh, in um, multiple different, um, across multiple different facilities in the, in the hospital setting right now and are in the process of lining up, you know, we've received the feedback loudly and clearly that we need to be able to test in other environments as well. And so we're in the process right now of getting testing, um, you know, lined up for uh, over hopefully early 2022 to get um, testing in, in these other uh, environments in SNF, LTEC and ERF environments. So uh, that will be forthcoming. The, Question about risk adjustment is part and parcel of the ongoing work that we're doing. The current um, metric adjust uh, adjusts for facility level factors um, and some of the evaluation that we're looking at um, right now relates to the approaches that could be used whether we need patient level data or whether there are things that, that could be done um, with social vulnerability index and other things without needing patient level data. Depending on the feasibility studies that we're able to pursue will determine the types of data that we can, um, what we'll be actually able to use for social determinants of health, because as I'm sure you can appreciate, in order to do proper risk adjustment, we need the, the social determinant of health data on the entire group. Um, and particularly in these um, LTAC, ARF, and SNF environments that may have um, some more limited electronic capabilities, um, you know, that can be a pretty burdensome ask to try to obtain all of that. So we're working through some testing and to looking at some proxies and um, ultimately potentially being able to develop the ability to stratify and look at that information over time. Um, but I'm not anticipating that we're going to have that built into the risk adjustment for this metric coming out of the gate for sure. But um, it's extremely high priority for us to be able to evaluate and work with and, you know, you know, potentially even provide stratification to facilities and, uh, and understanding, right, can provide a more global understanding, be, but that's a little bit beyond, I think, the strict nature of the quality metric in and of itself. So. You know, it's in our mandate around the surveillance aspect of this to understand what's playing out. That is, um, you know, knowing that in the context of there ultimately needs to be a, a you know, a single quality metric that goes into a program. Um, but we're attentive to it in the more global context of the program, if that makes sense. Um, but we're not currently um, proposing very specific risk adjustment aspects of that in these environments, but we're taking a look at it. If that makes sense. James, you did have your hand previously raised. Just want to make sure that any clarifying questions you had were previously addressed. I, I was. Actually addressed after I had put my hand up, it was around uh, attribution to the site of the infection. And when I work with the uh, office inspector general on the patient harm study in the post acute sites, including skilled nursing facilities, we did talk to CDC uh, and got exactly the same answer. I'm happy to say of 3 days. If it uh, breaks out 3 days, 
within three days of transfer from the hospital. Attribution is to the acute site. If it's after that, then uh, the uh, albatross hangs on the post acute facility. And um, Matt or, or, or Jerry or folks, if there's anything that you'd like me to address from the comments that you delineated, I can potentially address uh, some of the, the ones that I can remember. I didn't take notes quickly enough, but if it's helpful at all for you, for me to address any of the, the notes that you were sharing, um, I can comment on a couple of those things as well, probably. So, Kurt, we also, I think um, Alan has his hand raised as well as Paul. Uh, Dr. Levin. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. I don't know. Paul, do you want to go first? Sure, uh, sure Alan. So, um, I, I like this measure. Uh, as a practitioner, C. difficile was a vexing, vexing problem for me um, as a nursing home resident physician and i have admired cms's efforts to get a better handle on what was going on with its surveillance efforts um nhsn is very hard to use um, i, I want to reflect on that it, it I, i'm excited by the potential to tap into other sources of information but Fundamentally, my experience with putting data into NHSN is that it is not easy and it's especially challenging in work settings where the uh, staffing is so unstable. But here's my sort of more, to me, interesting question about what do you, what do we want to promote in terms of quality? And when I hear, um, Andrea, you talk about antimicrobial stewardship. I go, well, yeah, the, I want to promote that. My my one worry is the way this measure is constructed, and, and I think it would be useful to think through this with your testing. And, and that is, um, it kind of incentivizes you not to do the standard of care. So by including the, you know, the the testing of the stool, the treatment of the illness in the, in the um, numerator of a quality measure, a, a measure of the quality of care we're delivering in our nursing home or post-acute setting, let's say. Um, there's, I mean, I hate to say this about um, people like me, colleagues, but I've watched it happen over and over again where all we ended up doing was pushing them into practices that I would either say was equally bad or worse. And and I, I worry that this measure has some risk of doing that, um, that the unintended consequence would be, oh, they got some diarrhea, don't study it yet, uh, because if you find their seed, if you're, we'll get dinged. And, and I, that's a very simplified way of saying it, but I think keeping an eye on the unintended consequence of this particular quality measure as opposed to a, as opposed to a surveillance point, I, I think is important. Yeah, Paul, we couldn't agree with you more. Um, and we certainly have um, a situation, you know, the current measure uses just the testing without the, without the therapy. And, you know, we see, for example, that there are places to do a lot of testing on days one through three. And then after day four, they only use treatment. They don't test again, right? So, um, and, and that causes some problems. So this, this creation of this, of this metric where it combines the lab testing plus the, you know, the C. difficile um, antimicrobials, which are limited, which makes it a little bit more straightforward to design the measure, but, um, it's an attempt to address that. And in particular, one of the things that we're doing as part of this program, if you will, is pairing in a measure of um, oral vancomycin without testing, 
Um, so that wouldn't be the quality measure, but it will enable us as part of surveillance to be able to monitor the uh, potential unintended consequence of people just treating. Um, in the preliminary data that we've looked at so far, which again is hospital data, but in that preliminary data, we're not actually seeing as much um, oral vancomycin without testing as we had expected, um, but we are um, really alert to what is the best way to pair in those analyses um, and to be able to monitor that for those unintended consequences because you know we certainly um, uh, we certainly worry about that as well. And I think um, that by doing it this way, it, it is in it is our effort to use um, antimicrobial use to use the, the use of oral vancomycin or you know one of the other um, C. difficile drugs um, to is a is a proxy for kind of clinical decision making in, in that space. That if you have a lab test and you also treated it, you probably really thought it was C. difficile, and so that's where we're where we're headed with that. The um, I will say that you know we we received some feedback about how folks can struggle to log in to NHSN. You know we're certainly um, in a situation right now where um, you know all 15,000 plus of the nursing homes are logging in every week and using NHSN to report their COVID-19 data. Um, so there's, they've gotten more practice at it, uh, you know, and um, we have done our best to make NHSN as usable as possible. And we're always trying to push forward efforts to make it increasingly usable. One of the advantages um, of having folks logging in every week is that they um, um, almost all of them over, I think, 14,000 of them have uh, been able to achieve their SAMS level three access, which I know was noted as, as in one of the barriers. And, and certainly, um, in addition to that, the CDC, um, the CDC OCIO, which is, you know, the IT department essentially at CDC, who kind of controls that, that's outside the purview of NHSN, how all of that works, which is neither here nor there for your purposes, but <laughs> it impacts our day to day. Um, there's a new process for SAMS level three access. So that is um, very, very exciting to us. And um, we're finding that the turnaround to get level three access um, it, it's taking, you know, it only takes a day now, right? It takes a few, a few half hour. It takes in the order of, of a very, much shorter turnaround time than previously, where maybe it had been weeks and applications were hard to figure out. Um, but there's a, a brand new process that uses um, identity proofing through Experian and some other things. So, so the CDC OCIO heard us all loud and clear, um, and so that aspect of it um, is hopefully better. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to promise that everything is. Um, you know, uh, unicorn and roses, but it, it's it's substantially better is the feedback that we're getting. Thank you. Matt, is it okay for me to talk? Sure, go ahead. No, I just I'm just glad that Paul asked his questions first because actually with Paul's really important um, comment concern about you know the unintended consequences uh, uh, that could potentially happen with this measure, or really with all of our measures in our program, we need to really think up front whenever we're proposing measures, what do we think is going to happen? It's, it's, it's almost like a chess game of trying to figure out what it is and to be able to, well, what could potentially be the unintended consequences? How are we going to monitor that? So that sort of monitoring and evaluation is a very important questions to always ask here. And then in Actually, in Andrew's response, that was going to really deal, come to what I was going to just comment on uh, or mention to the work group is that there is an existing um, uh, NQF endorsed um, NHSN quality measure uh, for C. difficile, um, uh, which uh, this is uh, eventually would actually end up replacing. Um, uh, that version of measure, and that would be like when we discuss it later on in the Earth and Nail Tech. Those that that measure uh, 1717 is already adopted in those programs, and so this is a measure. And again, as Andrea explained, um, is you know a measure that's actually um, uh, we we believe is better um, uh, in terms of reflecting um, C. difficile, and so that's why um, it's being brought forward. But within the SNF QRP. 
which does not have that existing measure, this would be a new measure in the program. I apologize um, for my comments. Racist. Nothing else in the chat at this time. If, if that's the point, then we can actually move on to vote on the acceptance of the preliminary analysis, Matt. Okay. And yep, yeah, I don't see any other questions in the chat box and no other hands raised. So at this time, um, you are now, uh, the work group is now going to vote on whether or not you want to uphold the decision category that's in the preliminary analysis which is conditional support for rulemaking. And that condition um, is NQF endorsement. So if you do not wish to uphold that decision category, you would vote no in this case. If you do wish to uphold it, you would vote yes. And I'll, I'll turn it over to the team to run through the polling. Voting is now open for MUC 2021 dash zero nine eight nhsn healthcare associated c difficile infection outcome measure do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work group recommendation Okay. The poll is now, the vote, excuse me, I'm still working on last week. The vote is now closed for MUC 2021-098 for use in the SNF QRP program. 16 members voted yes and three members voted no for 84%. Okay, so 84% voted positive, positively to uphold the staff recommendation. So that will hold for conditional support for rulemaking. And then the condition is NQF endorsement. Great. At this point then, then that uh, measure becomes a recommendation of the group. We can actually move on to the next reporting program. Yeah. Okay, so the next program that's um, up for uh, this measure is the Long-Term Care Hospital Quality Reporting Program, or LTCHQRP. Um, so this is a pay for reporting and public reporting program, um, which long-term care um, hospitals or um, long-term care uh, settings uh, that fail to submit data will have their applicable annual payment update or APU reduced by 2%. Furnishing, uh, the goal for this is furnishing extended medical care to individuals with, with clinically complex problems. Um, so you can see examples listed there. Um, so again, this, this measure is cross-cutting into this program. So if there's similar, um, uh, if you'd like to carry over the vote for this, uh, we're able to do so. Uh, but I'll, I'll go through the PA on this because the, the, the decision category is the same, that's why we're able to carry over the votes if you if you wish to do so. So the description of this measure is, is the same for this program. It is a facility level measure. The NQF recommendation on this is conditional support for rulemaking and that condition is an NQF endorsement. So this measure under consideration would modify that existing measure as Dr. Levitt has mentioned, um, that existing healthcare associated C. diff surveillance measure that's currently within the program um, and only, it, it modifies it by only counting cases where there was evidence of both positive tests and, and treatment. So this may mitigate potential unintended consequences from the current measures design, counting a case based um, on a positive test only, which may have led to a historical undercounting of the observed healthcare associated C. diff, uh, C. diff infections. So this updated measure is consistent with the program's priority to measure healthcare associated infections and the patient safety meaningful measures 2.0 area. Currently it's not NQF endorsed, so that is the condition. 
Um, that's why conditional support for rulemaking. I'll just highlight that the rural health and health equity uh, were similar um, in their assessments of this measure for this program. So rural health out of that one to five scale uh, rated as four, similar concerns with this program about low case volume for this measure, but recognizing that uh, these healthcare associated infections are extremely important to monitor. For health equity on a one to five scale, it was 3.5. Um, we did not receive any comments for this measure for this program from the public leading up to today's proceedings. Um, so in this case, um, everything else is very similar as to the SNF QRP program. So if the uh, at this point, Kurt, if if um, we can pause to see if anyone uh, um, opposes any carryover or if there's any clarifying questions um, that the work group has for the developer or for NQF related to this measure for this program. Any clarifying questions? I see Mary Ellen has her hand up. Mary Ellen, are you there? You're on mute, Mary Ellen. Yeah, are you on mute? All right, all right. I think I'm off of officially up on mute. Um, we talked about the low rates here, and by um, requiring an additional step, um, which is clinically relevant, um, it could decrease the reported rates even further. And I know that this is um, an issue that's going to come up in Earth as well. Um, but does it? Um, one of the NQF standards about the the burden of reporting. If this like shrinks. The number of, of CDIS cases even further of what value is it um, for the cost and burden of reporting? Um, and so thinking about the numbers behind that, um, I don't have the LTAC data, but I know in Earth it's it's relatively um, low incidence. And so hearing that earlier on the LTAC side is something that um, I think I think is important because we tend to think, well, if we measure it, it's a good thing, but there is a significant cost to um, collecting and reporting these, these measures. And if there isn't public value because the rates are so low, which in the NHSM world means that the vast majority of LTAGs or ERFs are not gonna have data because there's just not enough of a value there. Um, and so reporting it is good, but when, when you get into the details of it, if there's not, not anything, not a sub substantial enough data for the LTACs to have a rating on care compare or just to have no data, then um, it doesn't tend to justify the measure itself. And Kurt, I don't see any other hands raised or any other questions in the bot in the chat box. At this time, then, do we feel is the group work group uh, supportive then of carrying over the voting decision? So, in opposition to carrying over, either raise our hands, comment, put in the chat. And if you'd like to remain anonymous, you can directly chat myself. Um, it just takes one work group member to oppose carrying over the votes from SNF QRP to the LTCH QRP. Again, that's a conditional support, uh, and the condition is NQF endorsement. So if you oppose, now's the time to oppose. Thank you, Paul. Last call, if you oppose the votes or the carryover, please do so now. 
Uh, just to clarify, the national average for C. diff and LTAC on Care Compare right now is 0.537. And this, uh, this change of measure would take that even, um, even significantly lower. I have a question around those comments. I know if I don't have the floor, it's okay, but please. So those are bragging rights in my mind. And I, I, for some reason, I'm a little confused about why um, if I'm running an LTAC and I have no C diff, why I don't want to be reporting that and get great star ratings. So help. Um, I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't help me understand that. Yeah, I don't have the LTAC values, but on the Earth side, it's a few million dollars a year across the system to report that data. And it's not as simple as taking the electronic medical record. We're not in a fire or electronic quality measure data world yet. Um, it takes infection control hours. And even if you don't have a C. diff infection, you have to go in and actively report data on your hospital that you didn't have a C. diff infection. You have to set up a monthly report. You have to enter all this data in. Um, if you don't enter the right data, you can be at risk for noncompliance. Um, so it's not just as simple as, oh, I had one C. diff this year, I need to report that. It's an ongoing reporting process that takes time and effort from infection control practitioners, whether there are these infections or not. And it's already something, you know, your infection control hours are already something that hospitals take very preciously. And when you add in a public health emergency, like we've been going through the past few years, it's even more so what, where do we want that time spent? Do we want that time spent going in and reporting data into a system because nothing happened? Or do we want to actively use that time to prevent other infections? Paul, does that? Okay. Paul says thank you for the. Question. I thought I thought that was very helpful contextualization. I, I I confess I've never actually had to put anything into the NHSN database. I, I used to go around and talk about it, but I never actually did it. And so what you're saying um, is very helpful. Thank you. Alan, I believe you wanted to comment. Thank you. And first of all, thank you, Mary Ellen. These are very important questions. I mean, these are things we, you know, need to think about and talk about in terms of what measures are within our programs and you know, measure removal criteria. And this is actually something that we follow. You know, as Mary Ellen was talking, I went back and I, I pulled um, spreadsheets that, you know, I I, tr I actually try to look at this. Um, data because you know I'm, I want to make sure we have measures that are that are meaningful and um, just to go back I mean I was looking at uh, data that I pulled from that was public report December 2020 um, you know some of the data you know lately because of the public health emergency um, in terms of trying to update it more uh, may be more difficult but with LTAX um, you know out of the 353 that actually ended up uh, reporting, the average was over that year, they had um, 7.34 um, C. diff episodes in the, um, in the numerator. Um, but th there was a maximum, I mean, the LTAC that had 59 uh, uh, within that year. And the, the NHSN, um, in terms of calculating, I mean, they have an SIR that ranges you know, from, I guess, zero up to 3.44. And so, um, you know, we do with within the um, existing quality measures certainly you know note the performance gaps um, that are occurring within this measure. Should we put it into the group one last time whether or not um... We have any objections to carrying forward? Yes, um, I will say that uh, Pamela Roberts had 
I sort of a question. I think maybe when we get to the IRF program, do you have the same information for IRF? I believe that was directed towards Dr. Levitt. Um, so maybe we can follow up with that when we move to IRF. Um, but at this time, we'll do that uh, again, calling out to see if there's any opposition to carrying over the votes uh, from the SNF QRP uh, for this measure to this uh, long-term care hospital quality reporting program for the same measure. So if you oppose, please um, speak up, put it in the chat, or you can direct message myself um, if you oppose. And thank you, Paul, that you do not object. Okay. And Kurt, I have, I, I do not have any direct chats about opposition, nor do I see any in the chat and no hands raised. So I think we're good. Um, I, I said um, in the chat, I'll propose, and I'll, I'll propose a new vote. Okay. So uh, we have an opposition to, I see, okay. Uh, we have an opposition to uh, not carry over. So in this case, um, if there's no other clarifying questions uh, related to this measure for this program, we will open it up for a vote. And this is a, to vote on the same uh, decision category with the same condition NQF endorsement. Any remaining questions? Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I couldn't find to get my hand up. This is Jim Ladd. I, I would just appreciate knowing the reason for the opposition. Yeah, so Dr. Levitt just said, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Levitt, um, that LTAC had an average of seven CDIs in the, is that a calendar year? I believe that was yes, Dr. Dr. Levitt. Um, the change in yes, measure, and that was based on the numerator. You know, I just I follow the, the yeah. numerators. Yeah. Um, I think I think having a denominator will be helpful there. You know, seven out of how many patient days? Um, it's it's a lot of patient days given the average is is 0. 0.5. Um, the change to this measure would actually shrink the number of events because it's harder to get a C diff case by having to, to meet the definition of both of these. So let's say an LTAC provider um, um, now reports all this data for an average of two or three reported events a year. Um, and this has a cost. I mean, each any measure reported into the NHSN is gonna cost the system, you know, half a million, a million dollars um, of infection control hours and those hours are limited. And so even a small in size of, you know, less than one a month, those are important events. And um, in a long-term care setting, those can be even more indicative in a short stay setting, like in the inpatient rehab environment. Um, the provider that reports the incident of C. diff may not even be responsible for the C. diff itself. Um, it could have come from the uh, acute provider. Um, but what we're doing is saying like, we're going we're gonna to spend all of that infection control hours on something that we're, we're actually going to shrink the numerator by the basis of adding an additional requirement. And um, it's, uh, we talk a lot about measures that matter and making, making measure, measurement effective. Um, and this is more clinically relevant in terms of the definition of a C. diff. Um, and reporting it, it would make the already very small pool of reportable events even smaller. And does that justify the burden of reporting? That is the basis of that position. Uh, Matt, it's Andrea. Do, do you want me to make any um, comments or clarifications on the any of the numbers? So I'll, I'll turn it back to the work group. Does the work group need any further clarification from the developer? This is Dan Anderson. Can you hear me? Dan Anderson, yes. yes. Yeah, I, I, mean, I have a question. Maybe the developer can answer it. I mean, I, I'm getting a little bit confused. I mean, we're not when we talk about shrinking the rate. I mean, we're not. That's not what this measure does, right? I mean, it sounds like it's getting at a more accurate rate. So we're just maybe reducing the number of false positives when we have this extra requirement. Is it, can you confirm? That's that's correct, Dan. Thank you for that um, clarification. You know, the idea here is 
to make sure that we're really getting at the preventable fraction, if you will, and moving, um, you know, away from some of the concerns that that the laboratory based um, the laboratory based alone for this metric um, was potentially pulling up people who are colonized and who wouldn't need to be treated. So the idea of adding the therapy is uh, in, is that it. Um, you know, it, it, it's pulling out people who needed treatment. And I, I don't think we know yet how much that's going to reduce it by. I think that's work in progress for us to identify um, how much that'll reduce it by. And especially, I think, um, it, you know, it'll depend a lot on the, the extent to which facilities may have already dropped their testing practices and, and put in diagnostic stewardship practices, um, so it'll probably vary facility by facility. When I, I just pulled up the numbers for 2020, and again, 2020, and Alan can correct me if I'm wrong, I think, um, I'm not sure, I can't remember if everybody ended up reporting, and there were 397 facilities that reported, so I know there were potentially, that may not be the whole ball of wax, but for the LTACs, the um, observed um, hospital onset events, that happened or facility onset events that happened uh, were 1,888. So close to 2,000 events happening in 397 reporting facilities during um, during 2020. Um, and 2020 again was a weird year, right? So, um, and I do think that, um, you, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, these are important um, facility um, acquired infections and, and they're important parts of a whole holistic view of how well a facility is doing with their infection prevention activities and, um, you know, having a measure to, to drive for it is, is what we're hoping to do to, to support those programs. Um, Jerry, you have any words? Yeah, um, I appreciate Mary Ellen your your um, comments and your thinking about this. And it, for me, it's suggesting that there isn't as strong a gap issue as with perhaps other settings. I'm wondering, and Andrea, I don't know, if, or Ellen, you can address this. Is the timing issue? You know, um, Michelle talked about that we are seeing dramatic changes in safety measures, and it concerns me to not move something forward this important in the midst of seeing those those indicators um, lose some ground. Do we have any indication that that's happening in LTAC? Um, and in general, I have to pull up the LTAC um, data for that. Just give me a minute. But the um, hang on, just a second. In general, the measures that have been um, that have been worsening are the measures around central line associated bloodstream infections and the measures around, um, I'm just pulling up the, the table for some reason, I don't have it right here. Um, and the measures around MRSA, uh, the C. difficile measure has not been worsening um, across the board in this time period. Although, uh, let me just see if I can pull up the, um, you know, one of the challenges has been with C. difficile because of how the, how facilities have been making decisions around changing test type and other, other things that we're trying to address with this new measure. Uh, you know, there's, a little bit of um, anyway, there's a little bit of uh, our questions around how much does the changing test type impact the 
the fact that the measure has been improving overall. And so we're still in the process of analyzing the details of that and what's been happening over the past year or so in the face of the changing type test type. But suffice it to say that C. difficile is not one of the ones that has been worsening. That has been, by and large, the CLAB-C and the MRSA um, and the ventilator-associated um, infections are the ones that have been really, uh, you know, the ventilator-associated infections prominently, but have been, those are the three that have been worsening. And C. difficile has not been in that category of the worsening ones during the pandemic. Thank you. Mary Ellen, you wanted to respond? Yeah, um, the way that the NHSN measures are publicly reported is called a SIR, um, and we've talked about that a little bit, the standardized infection ratio. And so what 0.5 means, um, it's a ratio of, of observed events over expected events. And so with a CDI SIR of national average of 0.5, um, and there's some decimals in there that I can go back and look at, that means we're actually seeing uh, half the infections in LTACs that we would expect to observe. And so by further refining this um, and making it a more true reflection, um, we, we would expect, um, like the developer said, we don't know how much further down it would go, but we expect it to change, otherwise there wouldn't be a value in proposing this, um, that you know, the number of infections would go down and, and that, sir, would continue to go down. And I just, um, you know, this is also a discussion about measure burden and when to retire measures. We've retired other infection measures in post-acute care that, that, that the um, burden of reporting uh, didn't outweigh the, the very few number of infections that ended up on care compare. Um, and so just uh, the fact that we're, it's an ERF and uh, LTAC and ERF, the ratio is about the same. We're seeing about half of what we would expect to see and it's going to get smaller um, with this type of change. What, what's nice about that standardized infection ratio is it levels out for volume in cases and adds in a risk adjustment. Um, and so that, that um, kind of outweighs the, the need to look at um, the end sizes and how does that compare and what was the denominator and um, what was the actuality of events compared to the expected of events. And for both ERF and LTAC, it's already below 1%, half of 1%. Or I'm sorry, not 1%, half of 1. This is Dr. Dan Anderson. I have another comment. If you can hear me? Please. Yeah, I, I won't speak to the. Um, evaluation of whether this is uh, worth retiring or not. It, it seems like a separate conversation, but I just wanted to go back to the, the original um, back and forth. I mean, it seems to me like if, I, if I'm putting my consumer hat on, I would I would be a proponent of this new measure if it's getting at maybe a lower uh, incidence or standardized incidence ratio, um, if it's reflecting true cases rather than colonization, because that's what I'm going to use to more accurately choose between providers. So. Um, with that perspective on, I would, you know, be a proponent of the switch, but I'm not. When it gets too low, though. To the, the cost, though. <laughs> and when it I gets too you. low, what will show up on Care Compare is there's no data to report. Um, and that's ended, that's uh, something that we see in some of these measures um, that we report is that when it, the end size gets so low that you can't calculate a SIR anymore, you don't get a better, no different, or worse on Care Compare. You get you get, we don't have data on this hospital. We don't have data on this hospital. I, I should know this, but is this measure on, on like, um, is it reported as a category worse than initial average or, or is the actual rate reported? Because, you know, if you get too few cases to um, report it, it's a ringing endorsement, in my opinion, for the facility. So in this measure, it has uh, better, no different or worse. Um, as well as with the ratio um, and the national average. However, if you can't calculate the STIR, um, you don't get a categorical rating. Got it. Do you have any other comments from the work group?
This is a uh, radon test from CDC. I'm happy to um, address some of the, um, you know, some of these questions about the shrinking of the measure. So, as Andrea Bennon pointed out, you know, we do um, the amount that the, the numerator would shrink um, depends on, you know, the testing practices and how tight um, those, those practices are within the individual facility. Um, in a lot of facilities in our, uh, in our initial scientific evaluate, evaluations, um, for many of the facilities, the, the number of events was, was actually very, very similar or even identical to um, the initial measure. But in some other facilities where uh, they are, um, where um, they're not, um, there's not as much you know, control or safeguards uh, against uh, testing, we do see a shrinking of the measure. So it does vary by place to place. I will say, of course, you know, as a as a clinician who's um, who's occasionally um, on a couple times a year uh, received a positive C diff uh, test on a patient who uh, no longer had diarrhea uh, by the time the test came back the next day. Um, it does um, you know this uh, improvement of the measure um, does get rid of that fraction uh, where um, we received um, the uh, some you know, the most pointed feedback of that hey you know. I received a positive test. This patient clinically doesn't have C. diff anymore. Um, why is this still, you know, why are we still counting this? Thank you for uh, running around for a bit. Uh, at this time, I think we should go ahead and move to voting on the preliminary analysis. And we can always open up further discussion based on that, the outcome of that, uh, of that voting. Max, can we? Uh, can we move to the voting on the preliminary analysis of this for long-term care? Sure, I think we can definitely do that. So I think we've had some discussion here in opposition to carry over. So in this case, uh, what we're voting on is to uphold the um, NQF recommendation, which is conditional support for rulemaking. And that condition is uh, NQF endorsement. So if the group does not up uphold that vote, there can be further discussion by the lead discussants on this measure and another decision category identified for voting. So I'll turn it back over to Suzanne to go through the voting um, process. Go ahead, Suzanne. And uh, Matt, it's Andrea. I did add into the chat the information on the numbers that haven't updated to get an annual SIR, so folks can take a look at that too. Great, thank you, Andrea. I see that it's 391, 397 had enough data to get an annual SIR for the LTAX. Thank you. Suzanne? Voting is now open for MUC 2021-098 and HSN Healthcare Associated C. difficile infection outcome measure for the long-term care hospital quality reporting program. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation of the work group recommendation? I know we had a couple folks step away, so that is probably why our numbers dropped to 17, but just last call uh, for your vote. There we go. Okay. I think we can lock it, Suzanne. So a vote is now closed for MUC 2021-098 for the LTCH QRP program. 15 members voted for yes, and three members voted no. And so with 15 members voting yes, that's 83%. So the NQF recommendation holds uh, for this measure for this program. So Kurt, back to you and we'll go to the next program. Yeah, and with that, I'll actually pass it back to you so we can introduce the final program. <laughs> Thanks, Kurt. All right, so the final program for this measure is the Inpatient Rehabilitation Facility Quality Reporting Program or IRF, QRP or IRF. QRP, um, the program type here, it's a pay for reporting and public reporting program. So IRFs that fail to submit data will have their applicable IRF prospective payment system payment uh, updated update reduced by 2%, excuse me. And the goal for this program is to address the rehabilitation needs of the individual, um, individual including improved functional status and achievement of successful return to the community post-discharge. 
And if we go to the next slide, it's just a description of that uh, uh, measure. Again, it's nothing has changed uh, for this program. Again, it's at the facility level. The NQF recommendation in the preliminary analysis is also conditional support for rulemaking. That condition is NQF endorsement. So this measure under consideration would modify the existing healthcare associated C. difficile surveillance measure in the ERF QRP by only counting cases where there was evidence of both a positive test and treatment. So again, similarly to the other, other programs, this may mitigate potential unintended consequences from the current measure's design, counting a case based on a positive test only, which may have led to a historical undercounting of observed healthcare associated C. difficile infections. So this updated measure is consistent with the program's priority to measure healthcare associated infections and the patient safety meaningful measures 2.0 area. Again, it's not NQF endorsed. And so that a condition again is, uh, is endorsement. For rural health and health equity, similar inputs and also ratings once again as the other programs uh, throughout rural health on a one to five scale was 4.0 and health equity on a one to five is 3.5. Rural health specifically noting some concerns with low case volume is a potential challenge for measure calculation and reporting in, in rural, rural, rural settings, excuse me. As far as the public comments received, there were none for this measure for this program, so no public comments. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to Kurt to see if there's any clarifying questions for this measure with this program before we uh, do the carryover vote decision. And I believe um, Pamela Roberts had asked about some of the data that Dr. Levitt was reporting out for the L tax, if they had it for ERF as well. I think that was one question, but I'll turn it back to you, Kurt. Discussion right now, and if any of the members of the work group have any other questions or anything to opposition to carrying over the vote that we just did on long term care over to the inpatient rehab facility. But if uh, we want to comment regarding the data. So I see Mary Ellen, Ellen has her hand raised, okay. and then maybe we can see if uh, Dr. Yeah, Allen I have, Levitt has those data. Go ahead, Mary Ellen. I have more. Uh, data readily available on the earth side. Um, and so talking about what is a value to report what's out there on care compare. Um, there are 1172 earths out on care compare right now. Um, and uh, 273 have no data available, which is a bit more than the LTAC side. Um, 752 are no different than the national standard. So um, that really, um, you know, that is those two groups combined are almost 88% of first out there. Um, 135, which is uh, just about 10% are considered better. Um, so you can find out if uh, you have a very small, a small chance of like possibly being better on this measure, probably about the same of what I think what consumers really wanna know is is there a risk, is there a danger to their loved one um, for reporting this? Uh, based on the reporting of this data. And there's only um, right now um, on Care Compare 11 ERF out of 1,172, which isn't even 1%, that have a, a worse category on this measure. Um, incidence is just generally low. So most ERF are matching up with the national average. A few, um, you know, are doing very well in this. And there's just a tiny, tiny handful um, that are having uh, enough C. diffs to be considered worse than the national average. So that's a, less than 1% um, out there. And again, it's um, from calculations a few years ago, um, between a half million and a million dollars to report these measures by infection control practitioners. And you do have to report ongoing data for the measure, regardless of whether you have them or not. So thank you, Andrea. Andrea just noted that um, about half of Earth were able to have a SIR calculated. Um, and so we don't know, like the CDC mentioned, we don't know how it will change, but there wouldn't be value of, of making the change if we didn't think it would be more accurate. Um, and more accurate does mean less infection. So the, by, I mean, approving this is clinically relevant, but um, it just kind of, erodes away at the value of these measures if the, if the point is to put them out on care compare 
um, only half in 2020 had enough data to get a SIR, and that's going to keep shrinking. So I feel like by, by approving this, we're really just kind of moving the dial forward to kind of showing how some of these measures might be topped out and in need of kind of retirement from the program. Um, because even as it stands right now, um, it's not that compelling of a picture in ERPS for provider quality. This is this is Dan Anderson again. Isn't it possible that you know the the small percentages that are um, worse and small percentages that are better and that might be um, a result of the current measure might have a little bit of noise from you know uh, colonization rather than active infections and that could potentially improve. I'm not saying it will, but that's that's another potential with going to this measure. Yeah, another issue with this measure in the Earth environment is that it's such a short length of stay. And so um, the providers that test that have the CDI in their setting um, are the ones that are reporting it, but many of these may have, um, you know, come to the earth already um, um, halfway there. So they may not have acquired the CDI infection at the earth. It could have been acquired at the acute care, and the earth is the one that ends up reporting it because it's such a short length of stay. Um, so that's another consideration in this environment that likely lead to um, uh, ha how many of these are acquired in the earth. It's, um, it's unclear as opposed to a true kind of hospital acquired infection, or was it acquired at the prior setting and the earths are just the ones kind of downstream reporting. And it's Andrea again, just go ahead and let me know if you want me to make any clarifications. I have a couple clarifications about the metric I can make if that's helpful. Members of the work group have any additional questions? Hey, Kurt, I see uh, Dr. Levitt has his hand raised. I just didn't know whether you wanted. Again, my data is, uh, you know, back from when it was reported in December 2020, and so it isn't as, I guess, uh, uh, current as whatever um, the NHSN will report. But just to be consistent with what I already you know, it said, the average for ERFs um, of the, um, I guess, 1065 that actually um, uh, were able to report in was. Uh, the numerator was 2.1 uh, for the year, um, but there was a maximum earth was 51 um, episodes um, or CDIs that were reported in um, during that year. And um, uh, the SIR um, did range from zero up to 3.55. So there was a performance gap uh, for those earths that um, uh, were reporting the measure. Comments we can actually put up again the question any opposition to carrying over the vote that we did for long term care to the earth. And I, um, again, you can message me directly through the chat, um, and I have received a message directly, Kurt, uh, that they would like to have a separate vote on Earth. So we will <clears throat> see if there's any other clarifying questions, and we can then vote um, to up the current NQF recommendation. So if there are any other clarifying questions for uh, NQF as far as the PA process, Excuse me, as well as to the developer on on any of um, the measure specifications, et cetera. And I I did just put in the in the chat the the way that the standardized infection ratio works 
as it compares the observed infections, the ratio between the observed infections and the predicted infections. It's based on a 2015 baseline to calculate the predicted infection. So it's not it's not a comparison to the current national average. Um, it's it's really a, a way to look at the um, you know comparison to the past, if you will, right? So it's in comparison to how things were in the in the past. So you know the absolute number of infections was uh, in this setting was I think close to 1,500. Whatever I put in the chat there was the number from the annual report. Um, and but that is um, you know the 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 standardized infection ratio is not reflecting any facilities comparison to the the, the current national average, but it's how that facility has performed over time um, in comparing to the the original benchmark, if you will. Just to clarify that, if, if that was unclear. Paul, you have your hand raised. Paul, if you're if you're there, recognizing your hand is up, you might be on mute. I'm off mute now. <laughs> Apologize. So this has nothing to do with the question on the vote, but I feel um, compelled to share my thinking on this at the moment. So I'm old enough to remember when C. difficile was novel. Uh, I, I can, I think I can almost remember the first case of it I ever saw, and um, the massive amount of intrigue that. Um, we felt when we diagnosed the case when I was a very young physician and, um, you know, we were all sort of looking for zebras. And by, 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 by the time I left my full-time practice, it, it was a daily occurrence. Uh, I, I'm, when I use the word vexing, I, I'm not, I, I'm not, it's not hyperbole. So within the course of my career, which I guess by some measure has been long, but not that long, um, the numbers have changed dramatically. And, and I'm just not sure that a low rate now predicts the future. So I like the measure. We've already talked about my concerns about it, but just in general, do I think it's smart for us to be monitoring this? I, I as a clinician and interested uh, stakeholder, I do. I think the question here is um, something just for the programs to continue to work on. And, and that is how do we make reporting easier? How do we make reporting less difficult? How do we improve the um, flow of information from provider to CMS to CDC and back and forth? And 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 I, I think you know having the CDC and the NHSN sort of created a new element of uh, complexity and reporting and additional barriers to sort of being able to provide a super direct feedback loop to, oh, this is hard and expensive. So I'm actually very sympathetic to the arguments that this is hard and expensive. I, I think that's real. I still think the measure ought to be included. I still think it's wise for us as a plan, uh, the Medicare plan to be monitoring this. I, I don't object to the notion that my practice environment should be judged on it um, with the caveats that I've already um, thought about. So so although I understand exactly what's being said, I, I think the, the take home message to CMS for me is keep working on making that reporting structure easier and less expensive for those of us out in the trenches. Um, so that's where I'm at and why I'm voting the way I'm voting. Uh, um, over these last three rounds. Yeah, thank you so much, Paul. Very well said. Do we want to go to voting, Matt, at this point in time on the preliminary analysis? Sure, I, I'll just um, recognize Marilyn had a question for Andrew in the chat. 
Uh, do you have a number of discharges from the same time frame? Andrew, Andrea responded with an annual report link. Um, and Mary, 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 sorry, Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen, do you have any other questions? Yeah, I don't have the number of discharges right at foot there. I have, um, you know, we have patient days. Oh, actually, I have a number of admissions. Um, like, am I looking at the right thing? In that report, it has all of those numbers, so you can pull them up if you scroll down to the bottom there in an Excel spreadsheet there for folks. What was the admissions over that same period of time where there were 1,400 events? So, and just to remember that the way that this measure happens is a comparison of just those numerators, so it compares the observed counts to the predicted counts. Um, but sure. the total patient days uh, for laboratory identified C. difficile is uh, 6 million 500 and change. So about, about 6 million 503960 is the total patient. That's, oh, sorry, no, excuse me. That's the total patient days. I'm looking at the wrong column. It's uh, 496,000. Sorry, I'm looking at the patient days. So it's a lot of, a lot of patient days. But, uh, I, I this conversation of, um, we need to be reporting, and um, there is no doubt that this is very clinically re relevant to all of these disciplines. Uh, in, in my mind, the question is of what value is it to report? And then once we report, you know, on the public reporting side, if we're getting smaller and smaller facilities that have data to be posted, um, you know, the, the value of reporting gets uh, smaller and smaller. But at, at no point is, and anyone suggesting that these aren't extremely relevant clinical events. Um, and by by saying that we're we're not reporting them doesn't mean that they're not very clinically relevant each time they occur, um, every time there's an incident. Um, but also we don't, it's just not feasible to report every clinical event um, until we move into more of an electronic quality measure environment, which hopefully is um, sooner rather than later. Right, and these measures are specified um, electronically um, for electronic data capture for facilities that are able to do that for sure. Yep, that's the goal. Absolutely. Uh, you know, our yeah, understanding. Uh, you still yeah. have to, like, the, the burden piece is you still have to electronically report a lot of data, even if you have no exemptions. You have to report the data on a monthly basis. You have to create a monthly reporting plan. All of that has to be done, even if you had zero infections. So you could have zero infections and lose, fail to report the data about no infections and be penalized under the, under the programs. Oh, Kurt, I think you might be on mute. I was, yeah, Alan, you wanted to make a comment there? Sorry, I, I just wanted to make a, a comment just to say that, um, uh, first of all, these these really are very important topics in terms of, uh, you know, first of all, uh, measure appropriateness and also in, uh, for program and then also in terms of even, you know, if measures appropriate, continuing to look at uh, uh, better ways of, you know, collecting data and whether, you know, uh, how um, you know, better approaches to doing this. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that in terms of the data, like the data I just presented to you, this wasn't magic data that CMS or CDC has. It's actually, you can actually go yourselves to, if you just go to uh, uh, the uh, data.cms.gov, you can actually pull all, all this data, just like I have been doing in terms of uh, spreadsheets of data. To, to look yourselves if you're interested in well, what's the numerator for a particular um, uh, infection, like I just was reporting on. That's right there. You can actually go there and go to the ERF QRP, pull the archive data and look, look at that. If you want to know the patient days or the admissions, all these questions that we're kind of asking are there. It's, it's, it's publicly available. Please use it if you, you know, if you notice something, I have questions, you know, you know, that's, that's the point of having it all there.
Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I appreciate and can you hear me? Okay. Um, I appreciate all the comments that have been made. I know, I know Paul acknowledged that, you know, the reporting burden is something that should be looked at. You know, regardless of whether it's for ERF or LTAC or SNF, um, it, it sounds like there's evidence to suggest that the ERF and LTAC reporting is burdensome. Um, I'm concerned about that being added to the SNF now. And nobody's questioning the relevance from a clinical standpoint, but I don't feel like we've got this quite right if the burden is overwhelmingly more than um, what we're what we're trying to resolve. At the same time, we're looking at, we've now voted on two of the three, um, and one of the goals around quality reporting, I think, is to have alignment around the measures themselves. So, and and my last point is, um, th what we're voting on is conditional support of rulemaking and the conditions being NQF endorsement. There's no condition about reporting burden being re-examined as part of it being one of those conditions. So I know it's too late to vote on everything else. I don't know if there's a revisit that in totality, but um, I think my main concern is we're moving towards something with a high reporting burden, especially in a time frame where um, we're really struggling on the staffing front. Comments. Matt, time to take it back to the vote. Right. So I, I do want to um, just uh, comment on that, Nicole. Um, are you proposing to add a condition um, to this decision category? If I did that, I would suggest that we would have to revisit the other two um, sites of service as well um, to add the same condition. I mean, it, it seems to me, at least from the conversation, that there doesn't seem to be disagreement around um, the, the clinical importance of the measure. The question is, are we, are we seeing enough variation um, to justify the reporting burden, which is one of our tasks, I believe, is to look at that. And I don't know if others would entertain the idea of adding um, that as a condition. James, you have a... Go ahead. Jim, do you have a... Comment question. Uh, comment, yes. Uh, with respect to Nicole and, and Mary Ellen, um, instead of trying to append something to each and every one of the measures that we discuss, it might be uh, even a gap to think about what is the expiration date, if you will, for lack of a better term, on these types of measures and reporting. That is, if the number of cases is so small, and I'm not saying every case isn't important, it is, but if the burden exceeds uh, what we're actually learning regarding quality by reporting, perhaps there should be some point at which we say, you know, we're not gonna, not gonna report this anymore. Just a consideration in general, not for each specific measure. So I'll, I'll and we also have add, had measures, in, infection related measures retired in the earth environment in the past. So um, that, that happens. So I was gonna chime in, um, Nicole, to your question around implementation burden. Um, the, the NQF endorsement criteria evaluate um, burden of implementation. In our use and usability criteria, which is under the NQF endorsement criteria, um, that is assessed, whether there is unintended consequences for the implementation of a measure. That would include uh, potential report, reporting burden. There's also a feasibility component, 
within our criteria as well. So that is the feasibility of actually implementing and reporting the measure. Um, so it's a little bit different than the unintended consequences, but it's just about how feasible it is to actually report it in the data systems that it's being implemented or, or the programs being implemented into. So um, with your the condition comment, that's sort of already underneath the NQF endorsement uh, under that umbrella of endorsement is that these standing committees would evaluate uh, not just for these signs of acceptability, but also these unintended consequences of implementation. And if they're okay with that, we, we would we wouldn't have to go back to the, the other two measures that we already voted on because it's already included within NQF endorsement. And, um, thank you for that. Um, can you just clarify is that when they look at um, reporting burden or how they look at that, is it a, a amount of time? Is there a monetary value assessed to that? And is there a threshold um, from whence they won't approve something because of burden? So there's there are assessments of if there's any um, cost associated with implementing. It's not necessarily a, a, um, um, looking at how much does it cost to actually report out, but any sort of uh, licensing issues related to the measure. Um, you know, if you have to purchase a license to report the measure, those types of costs. There aren't there aren't any thresholds um, it, uh, uh, for this type of assessment. Uh, what uh, NQF standing committees look at is if there's any unintended consequences from stakeholders that are being held accountable to the measure. So for those facilities or providers that are um, reporting on the measure, are there unintended consequences that have been reported to CMS or to the developer related to the implement implementation of, of, of the measure? So those uh, unintended consequences could, could be to the patient, but also to the actual uh, providers themselves, whether it be a high cost to actually report the measure or other implementation challenges. So this is somewhat of a more of a qualitative assessment. There are some data points that may be submitted and actually provided to the standing committee around this, um, but there's no threshold necessarily for this is the level of burden that we accept or not accept. Um, so it is it is um, assessments that are that are uh, conducted by the standing committees. Uh, but there's no actual threshold, uh, if you will, around this is the level of burden we're accepting. It's really uh, looking at if the um, if the benefits really outweigh any of these potential risks, and those risks could be that um, unintended consequences or report, uh, implementation challenges. Okay. Go ahead, Nicole. You had a follow-up. No, I'm I'm just trying to determine whether, you know. At, it seems that NQF hasn't endorsed this, at least for SNFs in the past. And so I know ERFs and LTACs already have this measure. I'm just, I'm conflicted, I guess, at this point, because I feel like there needs to be alignment. Um, there seems to be pushback on the LTAC and ERF side for the amended measure. Um, and there hasn't been support uh, from NQF for endorsement, at least um, on the SNF measure previously. So not sure how to vote at this point. <laughs> Larry, you, you have a comment you want to make? Well, yeah, just with regard to burden and um, and the measure of retirement, yeah, I was just following up. It was my understanding that this measure was replacing essentially a previous measure and that the previous measure would be retired. Is that is that the process or is this just amending the previous measure? So we, we had it in the preliminary analysis that um, it was to replace the current measure, but um, I don't know if anyone from you know, Alan, I don't know if that's uh, something you wanted to comment on, but uh, in our preliminary analysis, we had indicated that it was um, a measure that was to yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, improve the current measure. So yeah, I, I did have my hand raised. I don't know. I could uh, okay, okay. want me to answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So a couple of things. Uh, the answer is yes, that uh, this measure is currently, you know, adopted in the um, Earth QRP. As, as Mary Ellen reports in the chat, um, uh, MRSA, for example, was retired a few years ago, um, uh, which is something we do all the time. Uh, uh, it's part of our uh, meaningful measures. We have measure removal criteria. And so, uh, when the existing measure 
the NQF endorsed by 1717, uh, uh, which was adopted at the time, is looked at the same time as the MRSA um, and CAUTI and other measures, the Earth QRP, as they are with all the other QRPs. This measure was felt, um, you know, we believe that it still uh, was a measure that uh, should remain in, in the program, and therefore we did not uh, propose to remove it like we did MRSA, which we proposed to remove, and then that was finalized after public comment. Um, but in terms of rulemaking for this particular measure that we're talking about on the muck list, uh, if uh, you know we uh, propose this measure uh, within the Earth QRP, it would proposed as a replacement for the existing um, C. difficile measure, which is currently adopted um, in the program. So is there a measurable increase in burden to report this measure as opposed to the one that was already being reported? As, as part of any measure that would either be, um, I guess, proposed in the program or proposed to replace the program, Part of that, in terms of our proposal, includes the you know the burden estimate um, uh, that would be required for it. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if um, um, NHS and colleagues can give any sort of um, you know, idea as to whether or not the, the burden estimate would be greater, lesser, or the same um, for this measure versus the uh, currently um, adopted measure uh, in the program. Andrea, Ray, if you have yeah, any. Oh, yeah, we don't have we don't have formal burden estimates uh, yet, Alan. I think um, the burden would be probably very similar, but I think we can, you know, we we'll have to work through the formal burden estimates. Um, I think that the extent to which when facilities are certainly doing their investigation of these cases, um, you know, and making determinations about about treatment, um, whether, you know, how much additional work is that to make sure that that information is um, put into NHSN, especially because, uh, you know, the the drive is going to be to have these m metrics set up for electronic submission um, in, in facilities where they have electronic capacity. So, um, you know, some of that is setting up that setting it up the first the first time. Um, but the the um, the formal burden estimates haven't been done yet. Yeah. And if I could just comment on burden estimates in general uh, for uh, NHSN proposals, because it's something I've kind of looked at since I've been here uh, for a long time, is that uh, we also include burden estimates for the events, uh, for filling out for the events. And so if it turns out as it's been for many of these NHSN measure, we've we actually overestimated uh, the number of events in our burden estimates. So we've actually, you know, uh, for some of the existing NHS NHSN measures, have actually overestimated, vastly overestimated the burden versus um, uh, what it may end up being, uh, uh, particularly if there are less events that are being uh, uh, reported. There are some additional comments that are in the chat from both Raymond regarding the instance both previously with MRSA and currently with CDF and Mary Ellen also adding an additional comment in the chat. So I believe, you know, the, the comment regarding the condition is it's probably been address them and that it's through the meaningful measures aspect is uh, measures are appropriately removed at the right time. Um, I would go back then to you, Matt, to whether or not we uh, move forward with a vote on the preliminary analysis. Great. Uh, thanks, Kurt, and thank you for the work and for the lively discussion. Um, Again, uh, the condition would be NQF endorsement. 
endorsement does take into consideration unintended consequences of implementation of the measure. That would include that consequences to patients, but also to facilities or providers reporting the measure. So that is an assessment that NUF endorsement will will do. Um, so the condition would would cover um, that, even though there's no threshold of burden that is assessed. It's more of that qualitative type of assessment. It is something that is evaluated under NQF endorsement. Um, so at this stage, uh, we do have to move to a vote um, on those on this decision category. And if the if the group does feel they do not want to uphold that decision, um, you can vote to do so. Um, and then we can have further discussion and then um, determine if there's another decision category that you would uh, the work group would prefer having for this measure. Um, so um, seeing there's no other hands raised and no other questions in the chat, um, I'll ask the team to pull up the vote for 098, which is the NH NHS Send Health Associated C diff infection outcome measure. And the vote is for the ERF QRP. Once again, that's conditional support for rulemaking. The condition here is NQF endorsement, which would also consider um, unintended consequences of the use and implementation of the measure. I'll turn it to you. The vote is now open for MOC 2021-098 NHSN Healthcare Associated C. difficile infection outcome measure for the inpatient rehabilitation facility quality reporting program. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work group recommendation? Give it a few more seconds. Okay, I think we can close. The vote is now closed and locked for MUC 2021-098 for the Inpatient Rehabilitation Facility Quality Reporting Program. 14 members voted yes to uphold the work group recommendation and two members voted no. Okay, so with 14 voting yes, that's 88% um, of, of the total vote. So that means the condition holds uh, or excuse me, the decision category holds for, for this measure for this program. Um, and then I know that next is a gap discussion. At, uh, right now, I'm just time checking, we're 2.20. Um, would the group want to kind of continue on with the gaps discussion and maybe take a five minute break afterwards? Or would you rather um, someone take a break, uh, about a five minute break now and then come back to the gap discussion? We can keep going and then do a five minute break or do a break now. Are we okay to keep going? Hearing, hearing no opposition. Keep, yeah, keep going. <laughs> yeah, I think I think yeah, that was like just it, the consensus. Let's like keep going. Very good. Oh, Matt, James, was that your? Matt, uh, is, um, Jim, that your I'm sorry. This is Deb. It seems like some of the gap discussion, given that we still have several other. Um, infection related metrics to um, talk about, maybe it's not a bad idea to defer it um, until um, just to combine it with um, other discussion that we're going to have. So, uh, so Deb, are you, are you suggesting to defer the gaps discussions for the all the programs at the end of the call today? Or at least after we do the HAI um, Measure because we're going to do an HAI measure ne next. Um, so maybe we could just combine the infectious disease discussion items. So the gap discussion we have next is, is only related to Earth and the long term care hospital. Um, okay. So that, 
Yep. So we can either we could okay. yeah, we could we could do it for, for those two at this point because there's no other measures that are being evaluated for those programs. Oh I um, gotcha. Okay. Or we can yeah. Apology, sorry. Oh no worries, no worries. Yeah. <clears throat> Matt, okay. I'm just gonna build on what Deb was saying and I'm thinking um for me five minutes doesn't do the gaps justice. Um, so what if we kind of defer the gaps and if we have time at the end, we do the programs together. And if nobody opposes that, we can definitely do that. So what we can do, if, if that's okay with everyone, we'll do a break now and then we'll come back um, at 2.30 Eastern and finish up with the rest of the measures and then go to the GAPS discussion on all the programs if time permits. I'm seeing some head nods as an agreement there. I second it. There's a second, thanks, Kurt. Okay, all right, so um, thanks, Mary Ellen. Looks like for the GAPS piece, we'll Kind of talk about that towards towards the uh, end of the day. Okay. So uh, we'll take a about an eight minute break. We'll come back at two thirty p.m. Eastern, and we'll pick back up uh, with the, the next series of of measures under consideration. Thank you all. Team to start the recording again. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, we're going to continue on with the measures under consideration. Uh, up next to the skilled nurse facility value based purchasing program, we have uh, another presenter, um, uh, Alex Le is it Leberge. Le yes, okay, thank you, Alex. Um, from CMS, uh, that will talk a little bit more about the expansion of the program um, before we go into the measures under consideration. So, again, this is the SNF value based purchasing program we're going to be talking about next. Um, and then we'll go to the next slide, just a reminder of. Uh, this program structure. If we can click to the next slide. There we go. Um, this is a value based purchasing program. SNF VBP awards incentive payments to SNFs based on a single all cause admission, uh, excuse me, readmission measure, which you can see is SNQF number 2510, as mandate, mandated by the Protecting Access to Medicare Act of 2015. So SNFs perform period risk, risk standardized readmission rates are compared to. Their own uh, past performance to calculate an improvement score and a national SNF uh, performance during the baseline period to calculate an achievement score. The higher of the achievement and improvement scores becomes the SNF's performance score. So SNFs with less than 25 eligible states during the baseline period will not receive an improvement score. These SNFs will be scored on achievement only and SNFs with less than 25 eligible states during the performance period will be held harmless. So the goal of this program is transforming how care is paid for. So moving increasingly for from value to uh, away from quantity to, to value, right? Falling to value and improving uh, outcomes and innovations instead of merely that volume of payments or service and linking those payments to performance on quality measures in a single readmission measure that's currently within the program. So um, with that introduction of the program, I'll turn it to the next slide. Um, and, and thank you very much to Alex um, for walking us through the expansion of this program for SNF VBP. So Alex, uh, you'll just say next slide and the team will address when you're ready. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Um, I'm Alex Bears. I'm a senior policy advisor for the post-acute care value-based purchasing program. I'm currently working with some great teams that are responsible for the expansion of both the home health value based purchasing program as well as the expansion of the uh, SNF value based purchasing program. Next slide. So, to start, I just want to go over some of the, the current CMS quality initiatives because there is, uh, there is a little bit of interfacing between them um, uh, as we add on, as we consider SNF VBP adding measures to the program. Um, the SNF Nursing Home Quality Initiative, Five Star, and Care Compare. Of course, our programs that involve public reporting of quality measures such that beneficiaries are able to make informed decisions or, um, in uh, identifying uh, I SNFs or look for a better to receive better care. Uh, the SNF quality reporting program 
is a way that uh, CMS is able to collect data through pay through reporting. We're able to get certain data elements in our assessments, um, <clears throat> which is used, of course, to support the nursing home quality initiative and five star care compare because then we have measures for that them to report. But also, it will help the VBP as it goes on and adds measures to um, the, the, for the program. Um, as Matt articulated in the prior slide, um, the SNF VBP program involves tying uh, quality to payment. Uh, one thing is that the SNF VBP is not required to use the measures that are in the five star care compare um, and so has the ability, but uh, or, or measures being collected before by the quality reporting program. But of course, uh, those measures are would be easier to use because they are more readily available. Next slide. Thank you. <laughs> um, so going back in time, going back to the origin of protecting access to Medicare Act of 2014, section 12, 215 of the protecting of the PAMA legislation required the secretary to establish a SNF VBB program. PAMA specified that under the SNF VBB program, SNFs are evaluated by their performance on a single hospital readmission measure, are scored on both improvement and achievement, receive quarterly confidential reports containing information about their performance, earn incentive payments based on their performance, and as required by statute, the CMS withholds 2% of SNF's Medicare fee-for-service Part A payments to fund the program, um, which CMS is redistributes 50 to 70%. Um, uh, the, the, the level that has been set is um, currently redistributes 60% um, in the current program. Um, this is, of course, different from uh, something like home health value-based purchasing or hospital value-based purchasing, which are more designed as budget neutral. Next slide. So the SNF VBP program, the current measure is, is a skilled nursing facility 30 day all cause readmission measure. This was established at the beginning uh, and is NQF endorsed. Um, and this, the, the PAMA legislation also provide opportunity to uh, provide a new measure that would be, which wasn't available at the time, a potentially preventable readmission after hospital discharge measure, um, which has been was finalized in the FY 2017 rule, but is currently still being worked on and hopefully will be incorporated in the program very shortly. Next slide, please. So if we fast forward to uh, 2021, um, section one of the Consolidated Appropriation Act of 2021 is, which was the legislation which allowed us to expand the, model, expand the measures. Section 111 of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 allows CMS to consider expansion of the program measures to a total of 10 measures beginning on or after October 2023. Previously, the program was limited to a single, read, as you know, a single readmission measure. Uh, it may include a functional status, patient safety, care coordination, and patient experience. Um, but it's, I think that the language, at least is, as written in the legislation, it says may, so it's not requ absolutely required that it has to be. Um, of course, Alan can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, that's my interpretation. Um, and then it also importantly develops a process, have us have CMS develop a process to validate the measures and data as appropriate similar to potentially the validation the inpatient hospital measures. Next slide, please. So the goals of the expanding VBP is to provide an opportunity to measure that, uh, that to include measures that cover the depth and breadth of long-term care facilities, which includes both SNFs and nursing facilities and include which by including short stay and long stay measures. Um, this, of course, would be regardless of payer um, and would best represent the quality of care provided to all Medicare beneficiaries in the facility. Um, this is also the goals is also to be able to add meaningful measures from from multiple uh, data sources, such as MDS claims survey and the PBJ. It also add, uh, opens the door for us to add measures that were included in the Impact Act. And then importantly, the validation of data will ultimately improve the accuracy of the measures of the, in the program. 
Next slide, please. So the work of the map, the work of the MAC work group is very important and help guide CMS to make decisions on what measures to include in the quality programs like the SNP DVP. So I'd like to touch base on some of the points that were made in the final report of the MAC 2021 consideration for implementation, uh, implementing, sorry, measures of the federal programs. Um, the first is, was that the map, it, it, and this was done in March 2011, 20, 20, 2021, we received this report. The map strongly encouraged CMS to engage patients and caregivers in the discussion of concepts and or measures they would find most valuable with a, with a 10 measure limit, the map discussed priorities and methodologies. Some work groups encouraged CMS to pursue composite measures similar to the hospice care index that would encompass the quality of care across the continuum of, patient, uh, of the patient stay. Uh, while interesting enough, other work groups expressed concern that a composite measure could dilute the impact of, of, of a such measure. Um, and I think one of the things is that both of these recommendations uh, have a you know a strong sense of accuracy that are true, um, and it illustrates that the work of measurement selection requires us to actually you know carefully walk a tightrope um, and consider uh, sometimes things that are on the opposite ends of the spectrum in order to identify the best measures for the program. The map expressed support for continued work in infection control which they identified as one of the highest stakes areas of patients. I think this is all in the front uh, with, uh, with the COVID uh, and, and, and such. And then the map also felt that it needed to access care that may not be represented in claims data, including direct costs to patients and families, such as co-pays and out of, out of pocket. And so this is also the presentation of potentially other measure, measures that aren't in our mind's eye right now of potential future ideas that would be great measures for the program. Next slide, please. So CMS released, uh, had a recent RFI, uh, released a bunch of measures under consideration um, that can be found. Um, these measures are, some of them are already NQF endorsed, others are also impact measures. Um, and each of them, I think, when you're looking at them, have a different level of, of readiness. And as I mentioned on early on about using measures that have already established by care compare, those measures are because they're already readily available. They're, it, it would be easy to easier to add or more. It's not necessarily the choice of whether we use a measure or not, but what, or how soon we'd be able to incorporate a measure into the program. So measures that are readily available, such that care compare are far more readily available and can be incorporated than, than, than a measure that would either um, require us to add data elements to the SNF QRP or, uh, or potentially have to build an infrastructure to collect the direct data, uh, um, co 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 collect new data, um, such as like survey data. So it's just something that they're saying to keep mind, we keep mindful of as we select measures, we're looking for validity, reliability, the ability for the measure that addresses the clinical needs of the beneficiary within the skilled nursing facility, but also um, other factors as well, for the, especially when it comes to timing. Um, next slide, please. Um, and finally, oh, so yeah, so these are other measures that are on, including the promise, the core Q short stay, a survey measure, discharge measure, and, uh, and the, the, the PBJ nursing staff hours per day. Um, next slide, please. Uh, finally, there's, uh, we have other considerations and priorities within CMS that we need to consider. Um, uh, looking along, one good example is the Impact Act. The Act required the submission of standardized data by uh, long-term care hospitals, SNF stays, home health agencies, and uh, inpatient rehab. The, the work to meet the intent of the Impact Act supports the CMS Meaningful Measures Initiative and these standardized data is to be used to generate quality measures that can ultimately be used in SNP DVP. Uh, so, uh, next slide. So, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, any questions?
Well, Alex is Dan Anderson. Nice to hear your voice again. <laughs> uh, I'll go first. I mean, I just wanted to say I, 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 I see that the, you know, the, the idea of using staffing, you know, we've mentioned that on a, on a previous call about you gaps. It was in another program, but I mean, I'd, I'd echo just the importance of that as, as you will, as, as you well know, it's just such a important indicator and right at the heart of quality, but we often treat it separately from quality. Mm -hmm. I also, I would like to also add that that RFI wasn't the be all end all measures that we were ever considering and that this is the first step that, the, that we, we included. So um, certainly staffing, as I, I agree, is, is an important measure to that certainly was on that front list, but um, there are potential for future measures as we, of course, as we go on in time. Alex, thanks for the introduction. It's very exciting that there's this opportunity now to add new measures beyond the uh, admission, the readmission measure. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions at this point. I think people may be um, just, you know, anxious to start reviewing the measures and have the conversation about it. So, um, Matt, should we just move forward? Yes, we can. Can you hear me okay? Can. Yep. Great. Um, I just switched to my, my phone uh, just to make sure that I'm coming through okay. So uh, apologies for that. So if we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so at this point, um, we are opening up for public comment uh, and I'll turn it back to you, Jerry. And just a reminder, this is an opportunity for the public to provide comments on any of the measures that are up for the skilled nursing facility value-based purchasing program. So that includes uh, a MUC measure 124, 137, 130, and 095. So any of those measures under consideration for the program, now is the opportunity for public comment. So Jerry, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Matt. And we're very interested in having public comment. As Matt was saying, um, there's an opportunity now to talk about the SNF VBP measure set that we're going to be launching into and reviewing. Um, and as with the previous public comments, please limit your co your comments to two minutes. And if you would limit your comments also to the VBP program. So you can do it in chat or you can um, unmute yourself and make your comment. Um, how, or or I, actually, I'm not sure if we can put up hands. Okay, Gus, you said we can. So um, any any way would be just fine. Okay, another call for public comments. I'm not seeing any hands raised um, and I'm not seeing anything in chat. Just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. You know, Jerry, I'll, I'll second that. I'm confirming I don't see any hands raised and nothing coming through the chat, but maybe we'll give it a few more seconds. Okay. Last call for public comment before we proceed for the measures under this program. So thanks, Nicole, uh, for some clarification. So this is an opportunity for members of the public to comment. Um, members of the work group, uh, you can make your clarifying questions um, during, the, um, during the evaluation of the measures for the program. So if you have any clarifying questions uh, or anybody, anyone from the work group, that'll be after we present the preliminary analysis for any clarifying questions um, related to the specific measure for the program. No worries, Nicole, thank you. Okay, Jerry, I don't see any other questions um, and no hands raised. So if you're good, okay. I think we can move forward. That's 
let's move forward and just a quick reminder of process here um, we're going to be doing exactly what we did previously we're going to be focusing on the four measures under the skilled nursing facility value-based purchasing we're going to go one by one through them and we're going to start with the preliminary analysis which matt will provide then we'll open it up to work group comments then we'll take a vote on supporting or not supporting the preliminary analysis recommendation and then we'll go from there so with that then matt you want to start us off with muc 2021 124 skilled nursing facility healthcare associated infections requiring hospitalization certainly uh thank you jerry um so the description of the measures on the screen um and this is a measure that estimates the risk is adjusted rate of healthcare associated infections uh, that are acquired during skilled nursing facility care and result in hospitalization. So this measure is risk adjusted to the level, to level the playing field and to allow comparison of performance based, um, performance based on residents with similar characteristics between SNFs. The one year measure is calculated using the, form, the following formula, as you see listed, uh, the risk adjusted numerator over the risk adjusted denominator and the national, uh, times the national observed rate it's important to recognize that um, healthcare associated infections and SNFs are, are not considered never events. The goal of this risk adjusted measure is to identify SNFs that have, a, have notably higher rates of healthcare associated infections when compared to their peers. So this is a facility level measure. The NQF recommendation in the preliminary analysis was conditional support for rulemaking. That condition was NQF endorsement. As this measure does add value to the SNF DBP program, by adding an overall measurement of all um, HAIs acquired within SNFs uh, requiring hospitalizations and was recently adopted within another PAC LTC program. So the Meaningful Measures 2.0 indicates safety as a continued focus of CMS in order to build value-based care. So this measure aligns with that uh, Meaningful Measures 2.0 focus. And the infection control and prevention can aid in reducing healthcare associated infections within SNFs. There is variation in performance of this measure within SNFs and these facilities will have the ability to implement interventions to improve performance. Currently, this measure is not NQF endorsed, thus uh, the condition here is NQF endorsement, which again, we've talked about previously, would include the implementation challenges or burden assessments, feasibility, evidence assessments, as well as the reliability and validity testing assessments all under NQF endorsement. Uh, regarding the advisory groups for rural health and health equity. So uh, rural health on a one to five scale scored 3.9, the higher being more relevant to rural health. And for that advisory group, they generally agree the importance of this measure and the relevance to rural providers and care settings. And some members really did voice concern around small numbers for healthcare associated infections, given the, um, the numerator modeling approach. So the developer did note during the advisory group meeting that uh, healthcare associated infection rate is generally stable given the testing that has been conducted. Regarding health equity, uh, on a one to five scale, uh, again, five being the highest in which it would promote health equity and reduce disparities, the health equity advisory group uh, rated it as a 2.9. And so that advisory group noted that uh, this measure is important, but cautioned that the risk adjustment should be examined to ensure disparities are not made, uh, made to be worse. Um, there was discussion on risk adjustment in which there should be adjustment of factors that are outside of the provider's control and caution to not over adjust to lower the lower the standard of what quality care should be across populations of social risk. One way to address these concerns is to track improvement over time and evaluate how the measure is used. Um, what is uh, what uh, what is scoring well mean? Is it improvement in its own scores over time or just compared against other SNFs? So those were some comments from the Health Equity uh, Advisory Group. Uh, moving to the public comments received prior to our meeting today, uh, we received uh, several comments, four of which were non-supportive as is not NQF endorsed being uh, an issue or concern. And that this measure relies on hospital claims to determine the source of infection, which is notoriously flawed for determining UTIs or urinary tract infections 
um, the two mo and uh, urosepsis, the two most common reasons along with pneumonia for triggering the numerator in this measure. Um, there was also concerns with the accuracy of using ICD-10 codes, validity of coding uh, on acute care hospital discharge, the use of a composite score. So using a composite score makes it, a diff makes it difficult to target interventions toward prevention. Um, concerns related to incomplete culture data upon admission to SNFs uh, that are inappropriately attributed to infection or colonizations to a SNF. Uh, there was concerns related to the actual uh, location of attribution, stating that it was very difficult to determine which provider should be uh, should be ascribed res uh, responsibility for the for the infection that occurs post discharge. And lastly, a concern uh, for incubation period for infection. So, so recommending uh, for including a four a four day after SNF admissions for determination of an HI HII is not reflective of the clinical events involved with an HII. So there was some request for some further clarity on the measure regarding the rationale, how it, how it was determined that the measure is initiated four days after SNF admission versus a different time frame, And then some clarity on what uh, resident characteristics would be used to risk adjust this measure. And then lastly, recommended, uh, there was a recommendation in these non-supportive comments that CMS continue to evaluate this measure as part of the QRP before adopting it into the SNF value-based purchasing program. And with that summary of the comments and the preliminary analysis, Jerry, I will turn it back to you for any clarifying questions from the work group. Thanks, Matt. So um, let's open it up to the work group for questions, concerns. Um, Jim, I see you have a comment in chat. Do you is this specific to the um, to one twenty four or are, is this going back to the previous one? Back to the previous, since I have to leave at the end and just wanted to uh, document it. Thank you. Okay, thank you for doing that, Jim. So let's stick with MUC 2021-124, comments, concerns from the work group. Okay, Nicole. Thanks. Um, first, I just wanna ask a few clarifying questions, um, probably of the folks that, that developed the measure. Um, one of the discussion points is that it uh, measure it's using fee for service claims data that becomes problematic with any of our measures, um, but gives me particular pause when it comes to value based payment. There are certain parts of the country and increasing number of counties around the country where Medicare Advantage is the dominant payer and as such um, any claims or any activity related to benef MA beneficiaries would be excluded. So those nursing homes sometimes get disadvantaged in these scenarios because of that low number um, issue. So I wanted to confirm that this is a fee for service only measure and it sounds like it's using hospital claims data as well. CMS folks, might you clarify that? Hi, uh, this is Sri Nagavarabu from Acumen from the measure developer. Uh, it, it's correct that this measure is focused on those in fee for service. Uh, and, and the reason for that is um, uh, concerns about the, the comprehensiveness of data for the managed care population. And, and I think that that's something to um, keep an eye out on for, for the future for the reasons that you say. But that, that's the rationale for focusing on the fee for service population for now. Uh, and then to identify a, an infection, uh, we are using uh, hospital uh, claims data uh, because in the numerator, the, the counts of infections are infections that are serious enough to require a hospitalization. Thanks. Can I ask another clarifying question? Go for it. I don't want to dominate, but <laughs> um, can you remind me again, because all the measures are starting to blur in my head, I don't know about others, but <laughs> does this start on the fourth day after admission as well, or um, what's the time frame there? Yes, this would be the fourth day uh, after admission to the SNF, to, uh, and, and that's a mechanism to help avoid um, 
attributing infections to the sniff that, that may be from previous uh, uh, sources. Uh, and is there a reason why four versus seven days versus, I, I mean, was there evidence, I assume there's some sort of evidence behind that as a start point? Yep, um, the, the, the four days was uh, a, a uh, an element of the initial testing uh, of the measure, as well as uh, discussions with the technical expert panel that that review the measure uh, in order to try and sort of balance the, the attribution concerns with picking up in, enough infections. Thank you. Yeah, and yeah, this is Alan. It was just, again, as part of the initial development of the measure, which we had actually um, CDC were members of the technical expert panel. It was kind of a, a claims based, you know, modification of the you know, CDC criteria of attribution in terms of uh, previous setting. Besides the four day, we actually also have a repeat infection time window in there too. So certain infections on endocarditis, for example, uh, has a different time window, again, based on CDC, NHSN criteria as to where to do attribution of one infection uh, setting versus another. Okay. Sorry. And then you, Alan. Um, so Jill? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so just to clarify, I may have missed that. And again, this is all sort of running together for me as well. When we're talking about healthcare associated infections, what are we actually talking about? Any infection that is associated with admission or a stay within the facility, um, device related infection. So just for a clarity for myself, thank you. Um, no? Maybe give a quick summary and Alan, if you, if you wanted to provide more more information. Um, so, so essentially the, the HAI uh, conditions are related to infections likely to be acquired during sniff care and severe enough to require hospitalization. And so um, examples might be like methicillin resistant um, uh, uh, staphylococcus infections, um, but it could also include infections related to invasive uh, and non-implanted uh, medical devices. So let's say infections associated with catheters and so on. Uh, it does exclude uh, certain infections that are less likely to be able to confidently attribute to, to the SNF, such as certain chronic infections and infections that typically require a long period of time to present like typhoid uh, arthritis. Uh, Alan, I'm not sure if you wanted to, to add more detail there. And this was all done with, you know, technical expert panelists to trying to take, you know, what infections uh, would or could likely have attribution associated with um, care within this new setting. Um, so that's what we tried to work with. I just take a 30, well, know, one minute step back, just give you an idea as to, again, the reason we developed this measure and chose the data sources we, we chose. And, you may remember this because we did uh, review and actually um, uh, support, I guess, conditionally support and propose and finalize this measure into the SNF QRP in the last year. But you probably remember discussion from last year was that we chose, you know, this this claims based approach in using the hospital claims um, uh, because when we're looking at the data sources that are available to really look at. Um, uh, HAIs within the SNF setting, um, it really was the, the, the best and most reliable approach and way of, of, of looking at things. Um, that doesn't mean that as time goes on, you know, if we can get um, EMR, better EMR, and there may be other ways to continue um, to look at this, but this is why we chose this report because, uh, approach because looking at it different ways, whether it was looking at um, SNF claims, for example, or looking at self-reported MDS, um, looking at it through um, NHSN um, uh, uh, reporting, that um, uh, the most reliable approach really to look at these things um, uh, at this point was to be looking at um, uh, the hospital claims because it gave us an idea really of not just um, whether or not an infection um, occurred uh, within the patient, but almost the severity of the infection as well. What we were worried about a lot would be uh, perhaps uh, colonization. 
that would end up showing up on a claim within the SNF. And again, how would that end up um, getting reported? The self-reported issues that may come up with it within using it within an assessment instrument. And so that's why we really took the approach that we um, we took in the development of this measure. Both. So there is no discrete list of healthcare and associated infections that are used in this measure. No, there is absolutely a discrete list. I mean, okay. we could yeah, say that's what I'm yeah, yeah, and ICD-10 codes, you know, surrounding no, no, okay. the- But there's yeah. thousands of those in terms of infections and thousands of body systems, devices, and is there a root cause analysis that facilities can do to determine whether this was related to the healthcare or just a severely immunocompromised patient um, who developed an infection? So I guess that's what I was trying to just understand is there's such a broad category are there priority of infections that were that are being really targeted in this particular measure? And I guess not. Um, no, no, there is. There is absolutely. Okay. I mean, <laughs> uh, first of all, you know, obviously the measure is risk adjusted. The concept of the measure was really to look at um, a global performance of. Um, a, a provider in this case actually in the SNFs in terms of their ability to both prevent and manage um, infections and that was that was really the goal and that was um, uh, uh, how we developed this measure. Uh, we certainly um, uh, we developed it really as uh, looking at both almost a uh, uh, overall global percent as a, a performance but then also it, we try to develop our measures in many ways, almost like money bull, where we're trying to both looking at the, um, uh, being able to present uh, results of uh, a certain outcome, but then also, what does that really mean? In other words, uh, uh, does that mean uh, it will help uh, in the future? And uh, um, what ended up uh, coming up, obviously, unfortunately, was COVID. And so uh, what we, um, uh, recognized with this measure, um, uh, which you've probably seen in your data, is that when we've actually looked at providers uh, and how their performance was um, on this measure, when COVID, um, you know, unfortunately has come to our country, is that, um, you know, those providers that uh, have performed better overall within this measure um, also in general have um, uh, been able to um, uh, perform better in terms of you know COVID rates or uh, prevention of COVID within their facilities, which again was reassuring to us from the standpoint of that it really is a a, a measure of of performance. Thanks, Alan. Um, other comments, other concerns about about this measure from committee members. Deb. And then Nicole will go back to you. Yeah, I, I do want to say that in the um, summary of the measure that we received, there is a link um, to the report um, and it includes um, some of the diagnoses um, um, that are, are being, it's a really long list um, of diagnoses uh, that are, are um, included. Um, and I think, um, you know, some of the issues that were raised around this measure um, that um, in, the, in the public comments um, and, and also that were addressed, I think Nicole raised some of these um, in, in her comments a, a minute ago, um, was um, the, um, and I shared them also with my members. So um, I, I did want uh, to um, raise um, the concerns that they, um, brought up and one was uh, the risk adjustment. There were some concerns about the risk adjustment. Um, and from my view, read of the risk adjustment uh, that was in the report, they were not uh, risk adjusting for um, social drivers of health. Um, and um, I, I actually think that's appropriate in that, you know, we don't want to be uh, risk adjusting um, and, and sort of baking in um, those um, types of uh, equity um, challenges. M my members were very interested in eventually seeing these uh, data broken down uh, by 
um, by different populations and different um, uh, social um, groups. Um, the other, I think, issue that um, came up a little bit is this whole issue of reliance on hospital claims data. You know, no data source is perfect and every data source has its limitations. Um, the, um, the question, of course, was that if you're um, admitting to a particular, how much hospital quality confounds the measure. So, um, in that the, um, the referring hospital may mislabel um, particular conditions. Yes, UTI is one that's very common, sepsis is another. Um, and um, it would be helpful um, to have some kind of sense. Um, and I, I can't recall from reading the report whether this is going to be benchmarked regionally um, how it's going to be benchmarked. I, I understood from um, reading the report that it's going to be benchmarked facility to, uh, across facilities um, and not by some predetermined number, which is fine, um, but how much there's going to be, um, whether that's occurring on a national level or occurring um, just within counties. Um, and finally, um, the other comment um, that, that came back a lot um, from, from folks um, in um, thinking about um, the implications of this measure was what the value added, pardon the pun of value, uh, was over the um, already existing readmission uh, measure that was there, how much it would actually change your sense of facility level performance um, certainly, from quality improvement perspective at the facility level, you want to understand why you're readmitting patients and what's driving it. Uh, but, rev but the extent to which um, using that for would really change payment uh, from what you would already be getting with the uh, readmission measure. So that was a lot of topics, but I just wanted to sort of bring them up. Deb, did you want a response um, related to your question about benchmarking and whether the expectation yes. is going to go to facility or not? And did you want a response to, you know, a general response to the value added from the measure developers? Yeah, I, I think that would be helpful for people thinking about the measure uh, to okay. understand that. It, it came up both in the public comments and in comments from my own membership. Okay, so if the measure developer might address comments to benchmarking what the expectation is, as well as perhaps some sh short few comments about thoughts about value added over the current measures. Sure, uh, that'd be great. Uh, maybe I could turn to Cheng on our team uh, real quick to address the, the question about hospital claims and sort of the, the testing that's gone on in, in how they've identified healthcare infections. And then, and then I'll, I'll circle back to the other questions. Thanks, Shri. Um, regarding the accuracy of hospital claims on while constructing this measure, we deferred to, uh, we referred to some report did by CMS and RTI in 2019 and find that the um, coding of uh, the present on emission conditions are pretty accurate. The accurate rate, accuracy is over 80% compared, uh, over 90% compared to claims records. I also want to mention that this measure being a composite score can alleviate some concerns about um, coding accuracy in terms of identifying UTI and potentially missing it with cauli or urosepsis. Uh, we are treating the HVI event as a composite score. So as long as uh, the event by nature is an infection and it's included in the HVI list, it will be counted towards the numerator. We think it is unlikely that the confusion will happen uh, between an infection and a non-infection event. So I think in this case of um, confusion about UTI, that shouldn't be a big concern for this measure. Um, and, and thanks, Cheng. Um, and then in regards to the other questions uh, for, for benchmarking, I'll, I'll defer to CMS on details for this, but uh, as Alex mentioned in the presentation, in general, uh, the 
the, the notion is that in SNF DDP, there would be both achievement points relative to a national benchmark and improvement points relative to your own uh, prior history. Uh, so while there's not specifically a regional benchmark, there is a, a, a role for improvement relative to your own history, which can take into account those, those sorts of factors. Um, and then on the the question about value added of this measure, um, I, I yeah I think I think that's a that's a great topic. Uh, the, really, like the the focus of this measure is specifically on infection control, and I, I think that's what makes it really distinctive from the the all cause readmission measure or even the potentially preventable readmission measure. Uh, as Alex mentioned in the presentation, infection control is is a specific area of focus for for CMS here with nursing facilities and. Um, the, the correlation of the measure with what's happened with COVID infection rates and in, in nursing homes, uh, uh, as you you saw in the in the measure results, the testing results that you received, I think that is really like a, a, a sign of how important having an infection control measure in the program could could be uh, going forward. Um, I, Alan, I'm not sure if you you wanted to add additional points there. Um. Well, first of all, uh, Deb, you're right. We are prisoners to the data source, I guess, that we that we have. Um, uh, and to reinforce, um, you know, what Chang just said was um, uh, that uh, regarding, you know, issues of um, potentially, let's say, upcoding of, um, of diagnoses by um, by the hospital, um, uh, which which have been noted. I mean, there's a lot. Of studies looking looking at that that it uh again whether it would be um urinary tract infection versus sepsis um it really is just a matter of what the principal diagnosis is um that comes in and so um uh, it would be just counted as an event um uh irrespective of what the um the coding uh, may be on that um and uh, I'm not, I, I can't give more, I mean, uh, in terms of, you know, I don't know if there's anyone on the SNF BBP team who can give more in terms of what would be done, but it would be, it would be done similar to how, you know, VBP program is, is outlined in terms of, you know, a national, it would be you know, comparing to a national uh, benchmark that would be, um, that would be done within our proposal. Thank you. Nicole? Thank you. Just a couple other um, issues I wanted to raise. We're, I guess we're concerned in a couple of ways. One is that this is only going to begin the data being collected um, for QRP for fiscal year 2023, and then we're proposing to add this to the value-based payment program. Um, I feel like we need to make sure that the reporting aspects of it are right, and I realize we're using hospital claims data, but I think if we could get a look at the data first before we start using it for performance. I think that might be helpful. It might be an informative as well. Um, I know when our members looked at this, one of their concerns was um, some of our rural members might have some limitations, like they couldn't do an IV or something like that, and they would have to send somebody to a hospital so they might be disadvantaged um, in certain circumstances because they just didn't have the capabilities to do everything an urban skilled facility might do. Um, so that was that was a concern. It feels like we're moving a little too fast on this. I'm still concerned about the fee for service only data. And I'm not clear, are we looking at both short stay and long stay for this one? I don't remember. Um I'm I'm happy to to respond to those questions now or or wait either. How about yeah, how about if Nicole you lay out your questions so that we get one answer? Sure. No, it, that was that was the main question. I think we just have a lot of concerns with this one, and it feels like it's moving a little too fast for value-based payment. Okay. Thank you. So, Sri, if you would answer that question. Sure. Sure thing. Um, yeah. For, fortunately, we've been able to do a lot of measure testing on this and um, have have that be uh, very public. Uh, in the sense that this measure went to the map last year for inclusion into the SNF 
QRP uh, and, and uh, the public had a chance to look at measure results, measure scores, performance gaps, reliability and validity. Um, and then there are questions about the, the infection list. Fortunately, the, the list of infections um, and all the diagnosis codes used for them are all available in the technical report that I think uh, Deborah Saliba uh, mentioned that that's available online on the CMS website. Um, and so, uh, fortunately, we have had a chance to do significant uh, measure testing uh, uh, so, so that um, there, there's a lot of knowledge about what this measure does and, and how. Uh, for for the specific question about rural and urban, I, I think that that's an important question that came up during the rural work group uh, as well. Um, we we do have stratifications uh, of measure scores by by rural and urban that that could be helpful there. Uh, just looking at the stratification, uh, uh, it, it looks like the average risk-adjusted HAI rate for rural facilities is about five point eight two percent. Uh, whereas for urban facilities, it's 5.86%. So actually, um, on average, rural facilities are are doing uh, slightly better, but essentially the same than, than urban facilities. And so through testing like this and the more detailed results, uh, we, we feel confident that the measure is not uh, biased against rural facilities, but it's something that you know CMS routinely keeps an eye on as, as uh, measure monitoring goes. Thank you. I, um, I'm not seeing any other hands up. I'm, and I think the comment in chat goes back to Jim Lett's question. So, Matt, shall we call the question and take a quick vote to see whether people support the NQF recommendation? Yes, if there's no other clarifying questions, we will move to vote. Okay. So again, you're voting on uh, MUC 124. Um, this is the skilled nursing facility healthcare associated infection requiring hospitalization in the SNF VBP. And the, uh, you're voting to uphold or not uphold the decision category in the preliminary analysis, which is conditional support for rulemaking. And that condition is NQF endorsement. I'll turn it to Suzanne. The vote is now open for MUC 2021. Dash one two four skilled nursing facility healthcare associated infections requiring hospitalization for the skilled nursing facility value based purchasing program. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work group recommendation? We'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, I think we can close the the vote is now closed for MUC 2021-124 for the Skilled Nursing Facility Value-Based Purchasing. 14 members voted yes to uphold the work group recommend, uh, the staff recommendation as a work group recommendation, and four members voted no for 78%. Okay. So the NQF recommendation holds for measure uh, MUC. 2021-124. All right, Matt, if you would intro MUC 2021-137 and do the preliminary analysis. Certainly. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Um, so now the next is MUC 2021-137, total nursing hours per resident day. Um, so the description here, total nursing hours, which is registered nurse LPN plus nurse eight hours. Um, that's what total nursing hours would be calculated per resident day. Uh, the source of the total nursing hours is CMS's payroll-based journal, 
system. Um, the denominator for the measure is account of daily resident census derived from the uh, minimum data set or MDS resident assessments. The measure is case mix adjusted based on the distribution of MDS assessments by resource utilization groups, version four. Um, the level of analysis is at the facility level. The NQF recommendation in the preliminary analysis was conditional support for rulemaking, and that condition is pending NQF endorsement. So this measure adds value to the SNF CBP program by adding a measure not currently addressed and aligns across other PAC LTC programs by uh, working towards CMS's Meaningful Measures 2.0 overarching goal of value-based care. Per the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, expansion of the measure set will assess the quality of care that SNFs provide to patients. The CMS reported average nursing uh, staffing hours uh, per resident day increased from 3.85 in 2017 during uh, in Q4 of 2017 to 4.08 uh, for Q4 2020. This variation in the performance, um, there is variation in the performance of this measure within SNFs and these facilities will have the ability to address process to improve staffing. So this measure is not NQF endorsed, thus the condition is NQF endorsement. As far as the rural health advisory group input on a scale of one to five, they rated it as three. And the advisory group generally agreed the importance of this measure and relevance to rural providers and care settings. And the advisory group uh, did note that in rural settings with uh, that non-nursing personnel are important in these rural care settings and noted that this measure should be considered in the context of additional measures to get a holistic view of provider quality. For health equity, uh, health equity on a one to five scale was 3.5. This advisory group noted that this measure is an important quality measure for the care setting um, they noted that LPNs are typically uh, the staffing for this particular care setting and advisory and the advisory group was encouraged um, to see that multiple staff, so RN plus LPN and nurse, nurse aid hours uh, were included in the measure. Uh, they also would like to see stratification of nursing hours spent by patient demographics and certain minority communities are more co concentrated in for profit skilled nursing facilities, which have staffing concerns. As far as the public comments received, um, there was one supportive comment um, appropriate. It is appropriate to uh, access data regarding total nursing hours from the CMS payroll, uh, payroll based journal system. In the future, um, AO, AOTA, uh, so the, the commenter, uh, similarly recommends that NQF support the development of new measures to monitor total therapy hours per resident as part of the SNF BBP. And there was also one non supportive comment stating that the skilled nursing facility value-based purchasing program is, de is designed to measure performance on outcomes, not structural measures of quality. The measure is not NQF endorsed. And while there is association between staffing levels and quality, at a certain level of staffing uh, further increase, as certain level of staffing le levels increase, uh, it's not associated with improved quality. This measure suggests, or this measure aggregates RN, LPN, and CNA hours into one measure, which creates an incentive to use more LPN and CNA uh, than RN, which is contrary to the literature. And it's challenging to implement. There are better staffing measures to be considered that directly reflect quality of care. So that was the non-supportive comment and the, and the supportive comment. And with that summary of the comments, advisory group input um, in the PA, I'll turn it back to you, Jerry, for any clarifying questions. Thanks, Matt. So let's open it up to committee um, comments, concerns. Uh, this is Dan Anderson again. I, I wouldn't say a concern, a, a comment though. I mean, um, I think again, getting staffing information into this program is important. Using the total staffing, I think is a, a good idea. Um, um, I mean, I'm in partial agreement with one of the commenters that RN staffing is very important, you know, and on the nursing home, like I'm on the uh, nursing home care compare, there's a um, RN staffing by itself, as well as total, both of those feed into the five star. So the SNF BBP might consider that in the future. But I think this is a strongly needed measure regardless. Thanks, Dan. Jim? Thank you. Um, this one, I think there's a huge unintended consequence here. Uh, if you're going to make this part of a value-based payment, then 
what's going to happen is in rural areas, you are where it's already very difficult to staff with uh, licensed type people in general and people in <laughs> specifically. Uh, I think by penalizing, and let's talk about infection prevent prevention ists, which are becoming non existent around various parts of the country. They're so hugely in demand that they're being snapped up uh, by institutions that have a lot of money. So what's happening then is if we're going to penalize smaller facilities, rural facilities, who are already having a difficult time trying to get the people they need into the building to provide the care we all want for them, uh, then by lowering their reimbursement with penalties, you make it even harder to try and build up your staff. So that, that's a major concern there. Uh, and I was surprised the rural group only rated that a three. I would have rated it a 12 on a scale of five as something to be concerned about. And the second thing is the equity piece. Uh, the, the vast majority of CNAs in the long-term care and the post-acute care world are number one, women, and number two, women of color and women of color who are working multiple jobs, some of them two and three at a time, believe it or not, going from shift to shift. So I see this as a huge equity issue that's got to be addressed. And I don't think you're going to make these things better by ratcheting down reimbursement. You'll only make them better if you put enough financial resources into the system to allow them to expand. So thank you. Thanks, Jim. Pam? Just a question is, how does this impact states that have mandated uh, uh, nursing ratios currently? Um, this is Evan Shulman from CMS, happy to answer uh, any questions. This does not impact any state mandate mandated ratios at all. This is completely independent of where a state may. It, is it in line with current ratios or is it totally different? Well, it's just a measure. Um, it, it's just measuring staffing. It's not. It's 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 in, it has no impact on what a state may mandate. Um, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. No, thank you. Okay. Cheryl. Yes, thank you. Um, a question of clarification. So does this include or does this measure patient nursing hours or merely the presence of each of these disciplines in the facility per resident day? So in a more simple way of saying it, would this also capture people that are doing administrative functions, people that are doing um, MDS uh, data entry? So it's not necessarily linked to the actual direct patient care, correct? It's just uh, that, hours. Yeah. Hey, Cheryl. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, we do uh, have hours reported by category, which which um, includes nurses with administrative duties or uh, you know, directors of nursing. Um, it's important that we always note when when bringing this up is that. That's just those labels of nurses with administrative duties are merely labels to sort of you know, break nurses out to different categories. But just because they have administrative in their title doesn't mean that they are not performing direct resident care. Um, and sometimes quite often, and, and, and a couple of examples that, that I typically use when talking about these types of individuals is number one, in emergencies, these are the individuals that typically step up to help. And provide direct care, patient care, and number two, they're often um, the leaders uh, and trainers of of the other nurses. And I'm sure we we all have seen the impact that leadership can have on an organization. And all of these combined in all of the literature does still does show relationships between these measures, inclusive of all these different disciplines with without more or less administrative duties, um, and other outcomes. Cheryl, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. 
I, I have a few more, but I'm going to let others go. Okay, thank you. Raj? Thanks, uh, Jerry. Uh, so I, I just uh, wanted to first uh, support this because um, in, in a very raw um, comment that, you know, perfection should not uh, be in the way of progress. Um, so we all know it's not perfect, but it is a step in the right direction. Um, the other thing I want to, again, um, not, not, not anything specific, but general um, in, in working in all different settings and uh, with some upcoming legislation around price transparency um, in nursing homes, uh, because we do see um, there are certain organizations uh, that um, work around the staffing requirement and um, and have a huge, huge profit uh, siphoned off before anything else um, gets done. Um, and uh, and then we have these smaller rural facilities that are completely un understand and, 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 and agree with the associations when they talk about these smaller facilities that maybe bear the brunt of this and and um, and always have uh, problems on on how they look. Um, so I, I, I just think that there is probably more um, with the 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 cost uh, and the uh, overall um, organizational budgeting um, that has to do with the staffing levels and and um, if if there could be more research done to see what are those things that can link the appropriate uh, staffing level based on whether it's security or other things, but definitely uh, there are organizations that um, take a lot more profit uh, per, you know, per resident served kind of thing. So uh, being a non-operational clinician, seeing this happening, uh, I would I would love to see what else could be the common link between appropriate staffing and the operational budgets, et cetera. Thanks, Raj. Other comments, and while I'm waiting for hands to go up, I, I have a question um, for the measure developer, Evan. Um, it's striking in the evidence report that the strongest relationship um, is between the RN staffing and outcomes. What's the thinking behind continuing to use a combined measure rather than going directly at the RN staffing? Well, you know, I, I, I think there's nothing that prohibits us from looking at that in the future. And I may ask some of uh, my VP colleagues to chime in here, but, you know, looking holistically, I think we feel that we really want to create the the awareness and incentive of the entire nursing picture in the facility and that nursing homes and also stakeholders such as states and others that impact staffing will use this to do what they can to raise nursing in all domains, CNA, nurse aid, uh, LPN, and instead of just focusing on the RN. Okay, thank you. Nicole? All right, <laughs> I feel like I'm always the negative Nelly here, but um, while we appreciate the fact that they're using PBA, PBJ data for this, that is fantastic. Um, something else, we're already reporting it, that's a simplification. I just feel like the timing of this measure is, is completely inappropriate. Um, measures should be those things, especially when it comes to value or things that we can Im impact. And if anybody has been in a nursing home lately, our ability to have enough staff and find staff to fill those empty positions is beyond challenging. I mean, you've probably heard about the temp staff, age, you know, the staff, temp agency folks that we're having to bring in, the fact that we can't impact those costs, um, the, pack, the fact that we're taking on those costs, um, even though we don't have the money to do it. So, our folks, when they look at this, they get frustrated because they're like, we would hire all the people in the world tomorrow, but number one, they need to exist. And number two, we have to have the money to pay for them. And neither of those things gets acknowledged in this. 
On top of that, I think you have to look at the fact that it's it, RNs and nurse staff are important, but every staff member that contributes to the care of that individual to the wellness and the, the, the feeding of that individual are equally important. I would argue that you could have a bunch of new RNs in a building, but if they've not actually interacted with the residents before, they don't understand their particular issues, that the quality of care is not going to be the same as those that have been there for a while. So it, it it's just, it's not, I guess it's not the right measure. And honestly, we think that the outcomes that are affected by these individuals are their true measures at the end of the day. Whether or not the quality is there, whether or not we're bringing down infections like we've been talking about, um, whether or not we're ensuring that there aren't pressure ulcers that we can't control um, or that we can control <laughs> not happening. Um, you know, those are better measures than actually saying we have X number of staff today. Um, so we just, we have a lot of concerns about this one, especially in the given environment. Uh, folks are tapped to a whole new level. So this one just feels a little off base. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, this is, um, do, do you want me to, this is Evan Schulman again. Do you want me to um, speak to that at all? Or did, I don't know what the problem um, is. I think it's gonna come up again, Evan. So why don't you take it now? Okay. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot in there. I think the first thing to remember that that it, on it at its core, this is just a measure. You know how the benchmarks are set is an entire different issue, but this is just a measure that, regardless of what may be happening in the field, um, it's really important to know what is actually happening and, and bring um, and, and bring these things to light. Um, so. You know, so the first thing is when you consider this, it's consider we're considering it as a measure of, of what's happening. The thresholds or the benchmarks, those happen later in a different, uh, through a different view. So, you know, when it comes to, yes, nursing homes um, are struggling with staffing, I'll come back to that in a minute, it's all relative to each other. So, you know, it's quite feasible that there could be a measure or a threshold that's selected that considers what has happened or what is happening in the industry. So that is um, that that that's one thing to consider. I do need to say that um, I'll say a couple of things on on the this, this struggle or challenge of staffing. There is absolutely no question. Um, that there is that there are staffing challenges and this is to the point about what they can impact there's absolutely no question that there are staffing challenges that are outside some facilities control it is and and you know i encourage everyone that to focus on what we absolutely know for certain based on literature and scientific and peer review it is unclear in every situation what exactly is the challenge a nursing home may have. There are nursing homes that literally probably do not have the resources to provide the staff. There are also nursing homes that do. That doesn't mean that they can provide as much as we'd like them to, but there are, for example, and this is public, you can do this yourself. There are nursing homes that are in very, very close proximity to each other that have the same makeup as a nursing home that's very, again, close proximity to them, that have a much higher level of staff than the other one. So, you know, but then there, but there are some other things that are different about those two nursing homes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that just because a nursing home is low staff, it is outside of their control. So we feel pretty strongly that this measure, again, from a measure perspective, needs to be, um, um, part of the VVP program, how we integrated in there, that's a different story. Um, but it, it, it's not always a given that it is outside of the nursing home's control. Although I admit, you know, there, there are certainly situations where it can be. On the topic of, of you know, if you had Evan, a, a nursing Evan, home with can a, we, can we kind of truncate this? And because sure, we've yeah. got other comments up coming up here. So sure, sure. let's go to the other comments first. Multiple comments, sure. And then and then we'll wrap back around if there's if there's additional comments. So Deb. Yeah, I think it's important when we look at this measure and, and, and Evan was touching on this um, 
that we recognize that facilities are likely going to be compared to each other and they're going to be facing the same payment and market um, challenges uh, for recruitment of, of personnel. So I, I guess um, I, I'm less concerned um, if we weren't, if we, if we had set an absolute number, as, as you pointed out, some states have done, that's a slightly different issue than this one where the comparator is likely to be uh, to other facilities. Um, I think, you know, we, ta we talked earlier about the strength of data, different data sources and their weaknesses and every potential data source. Um, and that, in my mind, argues for um, having, um, um, measures that capture different data sources. So, yes, we could make this all about um, outcome measures from administrative data, but we know there are some potential flaws there. We could make it all about MDS data, but we know there are potential flaws there. We could make it all about staffing. We know there are potential flaws there. So, by bringing them all together, we're actually sort of counterbalancing some of the challenges across the different data sources. Obviously, we still want to strive to get all of the flaws out um, and not take something that's fundamentally flawed. But I, I think we do have to think about that potential that, you know, um, staffing really adds a, a, a deeper sense of what's going on in the facilities. And data clearly studies science evidence point to there being a relationship and an association between RN levels and outcomes, um, both ones that we measure and what, some that we don't, and CNA levels um, and, um, and outcomes, less so with LVN, and it may all be the substitution effect between LVN and RN, but I mean, there's a significant um, support for the validity, um, not just the face validity, but the actual validity of measuring um, um, staffing, um, RN staffing. So that's, I'll, I'll close with that. Thanks, Deb. Other comments? Well, I don't think oh, what Deb said, this is Dan Anderson. I mean, I, I agree that staffing is kind of central to uh, everything and try as we might, we can't measure every important outcome, you know, if staffing is the underpinning of it, I think we should be doing everything we can to address it. Thanks, Dan. Alan? Thanks. I just wanted to make a general comment, uh, uh, really, uh, first to Nicole. Nicole, um, you're not being a negative now. This is exactly what we're supposed to be doing here. Uh, same thing for the CDI measures. Uh, I mean, uh, if we wanted a rubber stamp, we would have gotten a rubber stamp. That's not what we want here. We, these are very challenging issues. You know, these are challenging measures, all these sorts of things. So, you know, uh, don't apologize for, you know, uh, bringing up criticisms. We are our own worst enemies. You, you know, these aren't things we haven't discussed internally ourselves before in terms of deciding which ways to go. Um, so please keep the discussion as robust as you want. Alan, and I second that. And Nicole, um, in my notes, I had the same thing in terms of timing. So uh, I'm really glad that you raised that. Um, let's take it to the, the first level vote of whether, um, whether we will support the preliminary um, assessment. The vote is now open for MUC 2021-137, total nursing hours per resident day for the SNF VBP program. Do you vote to support staff recommendations as the work group recommendation? And I think we can close the vote. 
The vote is now closed for MUC 2021-137 for the SNP VBP program. 13 members voted yes to uphold the staff recommendation as a work group recommendation and five members voted no for 72%. Okay, so um, the recommendation stands and thank you all for a really important discussion. And uh, I'm really glad that, you know, that Evan and Alan and others are here to hear those concerns and I'm sure we'll take them into account. So let's move then into MUC 2021, 130 and Matt back over to you. Great. Can you can you hear me, uh, Jerry and team? Great. Yes. Okay. Um, so we're now going to MUC 2021-130. This is the discharge to community post acute care measure for skilled nursing facilities. Um, the description of the measure is listed there is that it estimates the risk adjusted rate of success of successful discharge to the community from the SNF from a SNF. With successful discharge to the community, including no unplanned rehospitalizations and no death in the 31 days following SNF discharge. The measure is calculated using the following formula risk adjusted numerator divided by risk adjusted denominator times the national uh, observed rate. The fields below describe the adjusted, or the fields uh, describe the adjusted uh, numerator and denominator in more detail, the fields within the uh, submission uh, within the PA. And the measure is calculated using two years of Medicare fee for service claims data. It's at the facility level. The NQF uh, recommendation was support for rulemaking. Uh, this measure adds value to the SNF VDP program uh, set by adding a measure not currently addressed within the program. And this measure aligns with the other PAC LTC programs utilizing the same measure. The measure aligns with CMS's quality measure measurement action plan uh, to build value based care by addressing several goals, including measures focused on key quality domains, aligning measures across programs, prioritizing outcome measures, and implementing measures that reflect social and economic uh, determinants. So it is NQF endorsed, that's why it received a preliminary analysis recommendation of support for rulemaking. With respect to the advisory group inputs, for rural health uh, on a one to five scale, it received 2.9. The, the advisory group for rural health generally agreed with the importance of this measure and relevance to rural health healthcare providers, but did raise some concerns about the distance rural patients may have to travel from SNFs to community-based settings, noting that this distance may create negative unintended consequences. And the developer did clarify on the call that in testing rural providers um, generally perform better on this measure compared to rural the rural pop compared to general population, uh, but would monitor this as a con area of concern. With respect to the health equity advisor group on a one to five scale, it received a 3.5. This group noted that there may be differences in the availability of community resources upon discharge from SNFs as a measure may be sensitive to food insecurity and housing instability. The advisor group did acknowledge that dual eligibility is included in the risk adjustment model, but encouraged stratification of this measure. And they also agreed that nursing home residents should be excluded since they are less likely to be discharged from the community, but cautioned that each of the exclusions should be examined from an equity lens. With respect to public comment, there were two supportive comments for this measure. Um, it complements other measures, uh, such as the 30-day rehospitalization uh, that are already in use. And overall, it's a support for the inclusion of this measure and its application to short-stay residents in, the skilled, nursing, uh, in, in skilled nursing facilities. However, this, um, there was some concern even with the supportive comments about the exclusion of Medicare Advantage and special needs plan enrollees from the denominator. Um, some concern that, um, with smaller denominators is just a few cases where, uh, where individuals aren't discharged to the community can skew the skilled nursing, nursing facilities performance and create unfair comparisons with other skilled nursing facilities. Um, and lastly, even with the supportive comments, there was some clarification requests on uh, the resident characteristics that would be used in the risk adjustment for this measure. And there were no non-supportive comments. So with uh, that summary, uh, Jerry, I'll turn it back to you for any work group clarification or clarifying questions. 
Thanks, Matt. So let's open it up for committee discussion. Comments? Jim? Oh, thank you. Um, I, I was listed as one of the discussions, so I kind of dug into it and, and made a list of things, and I wasn't sure whether I should do that or let the group ask questions first and then chime in. Actually, Jim, I think that your review comes after the vote so that we would wait for that. If you have questions or concerns, those you can raise now, but otherwise not your summary. Matt, did I get that right? That's correct. So, yeah, Jim, this is just a, if you have any clarifying questions, this is an opportunity to raise those now, but any sort of in-depth summary uh, of, of the measure would be held uh, after the vote if the if the vote did not stand well i, I misspoke it was an in-depth summary it was i read through everything and made some notes about things i had questions and or concerns about so sorry to, to put that forth in the wrong light so should god yeah, if, if you have questions go go for it <laughs> okay jerry yeah you know you can never say that to me you, you always regret it <laughs> <laughs> all right be brief, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do, do my best. Uh, I, I too was very concerned and had questions about uh, only uh, the, the absence of Medicare Advantage, which is going to be 50% estimated of the Medicare beneficiary population by 2025. So I think we're, I, I have concerns if they were going to be included. I heard in the, uh, the comments that they're not. Uh, that is, uh, that is of concern. Uh, the uh, we haven't in, in the terms of what a successful discharge is. It's defined as you read it, Matt. Uh, I was curious that we left out things like readmission to the SNP or to an ERP, uh, to the emergency department, or observation status at a hospital, and that may be a little too complex. For this, but obviously they're not in there that I could see anywhere. Um, and I, I thought, didn't hear that these were only the post acute patients from the hospital. And it, if someone's been living in the facility for 10 years, then there's a pretty low chance you're going to discharge them to the community. So I really think we should focus on the post acute people. And I will define that as those who under the current guidelines have their SNF benefit triggered by the three-day stay. Now, I know that was waived with COVID, but I understand it's going to come back. And we need a triggering reason to be uh, looking at those folks. And I really thought it was the post acute population uh, that we should focus on. Uh, and also, as in long-term care, you're responsible, and we should be, for a safe discharge from the facility. And if you have someone with no family, someone who has dementia, someone who uh, has a problem that is outside the parameters of anyone on our social determinants, they're gonna have to stay in the facility until that can be adjudicated. And that's gonna skew the population, the numbers a little bit. And uh, in the interest Jerry, of listening to you, I'll, I'll end. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. So let me kind of unpack that and see if the measure developer can help us with some of that. One is, as I was hearing it, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, is selection criteria and the issue of not including um, Medicare Advantage, as well as focusing in on post-acute. So that's kind of in the ballpark of who is involved in this. And then the question I think is more of a conceptual one is what is a successful discharge and kind of focusing in on the two aspects of this, which is um, no unplanned hospitalizations and not dying. And then I also heard a social determinants of health question related to, um, and I think the equity committee also raised that and um, and so 
where does that fit in in terms of risk adjusting? Because SDOH is not in risk adjustment right now. So um, if I need to repeat that for the measure developer, I would be delighted to do so. Um, no, I, no, that's great, but definitely let me know if I miss something. <laughs> um, uh, so for the for the first issue on Medicare Advantage, uh, definitely this is an important population to think about giving growing growing enrollment. Uh, it's true this measure does not account for the Medicare Advantage population. It's focused on the fee for service population, and the the reason for that is uh, concerns about uh, data comprehensiveness and and reliability on the Medicare Advantage side. But but I think uh, that comment is certainly something that CMS can consider going forward, and I think a lot of what what happens going forward will depend on the quality of the Medicare Advantage encounter data and whether it's similar definitions can be applied in a in a reliable way. Uh, on the second point, um, I, I think fortunately there there's happy news to to report for for you, James, on on that question. Um, the uh, it, for the measure exclusions, uh, uh, patients are excluded from from the measure, so are not included in the denominator if they do not have a short term acute care hospital discharge within 30 days preceding the SNF admission, uh, with the intent of of focusing on post acute care. And I think the other really big question you brought up in in, in this one was about. Uh, residents who are like baseline nursing home residents, and so so for for those who are in the nursing home long term, we we would not we should not consider it a failure, right? To for them to go back to to the nursing home, um, and this is actually uh, uh, something like that that CMS and the measure development team got feedback on uh, in the original version of the measure, and and it was refined. Uh, based on that feedback and, and testing. And so now the, the current version of the measure actually uh, excludes from the measure denominator uh, uh, long-term nursing uh, residents who, who live in the nursing home in, in the 180 days prior to, to the measure for exactly the reason that, that you allude to. Um, and then the third question was about uh, the social determinants of health. Uh, that that's correct. Uh, I, I, as was mentioned, uh, social determinants of health are not currently included in the the risk adjustment model. Uh, the risk adjustment model includes uh, age, sex categories, uh, end stage renal disease and disability is original reason for entitlement. Uh, a series of clinical. Uh, indicators based on principal diagnosis from the prior acute stay and surgical procedures that happened then, as well as indicators of severity of uh, prior hospital stays and comorbidities based, based on HCCs. Uh, for, for the reason you know, we, we've done extensive testing on the social risk factor uh, side of things here to understand what measures look like when stratifying facilities by presence of, of social determinants of health. The results are, are pretty fascinating. Um, the, the first important point is that uh, most of the differences in performance that you see in facilities that have uh, many duels are really driven by prior nursing home residents. And that changed to the measure that I mentioned to exclude those who are baseline nursing facility residents um, removes most of the, the um, the influence of, of dual eligibility on the measure. And if you look at the measure and take the, the measure as given here and compare it to a version of the measure where you would uh, risk adjust for dual eligibility and for race and ethnicity, um, the, uh, the correlation between those two measure scores is about 0.99. And, and the C statistic for that risk adjustment model um, barely budget, so it increases from 0.72 to, to 0.73 in terms of predictive power. I think, again, a lot of that has to do with the fact that the risk adjustment model is really exhaustive. Um, the, you know, in, in the time of NQF endorsement, we presented results on this. Uh, and, and the nursing home 
uh, exclusion that, that I mentioned, which I think may, makes makes a big difference. Um, this is certainly, though, something that is, is important to track and uh, we'll be keeping an eye out for for this in future testing. Thank you. Um, we have another question for you. Deb um, Saliba has in the chat. How does the measure account for availability of community LTSS? Um, Deb, what's LTSS? All right, we'll hold on that one until we have Deb back, unless you know what it is, because I don't. It's listed in the chat. Yeah, I can, I can tell you. So LTSS is long-term services and supports. It would be the full spectrum of services available to support a person in the community, waiver programs, home health programs. Uh, much of that is run through the Medicaid programs, um, but that availability, availability for dually eligible um, Medicare beneficiaries would be really critical to um, having them discharge out into the community. Thanks, Paul. Sue, Sri, do you want to respond to that question then? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, the the measure does not account directly for the availability of, of community long-term service and support. So there are not adjusters for specific geographic regions or, or anything like this. Um, what, we, what we do know are differences in performance by area to, to uh, some extent. Um, as, as I uh, was mentioned before, uh, the urban-rural comparison for Discharge to community uh, suggests that uh, performance is slightly better in rural areas than in urban areas, which is reassuring if, if there's a, a worry about availability of LTSS that may be lower in rural areas. Um, and, and then the other aspect is the social risk factor uh, testing, where if you, if you suppose that particular demographic groups, for instance, are um, associated with living in areas that, that may have lower availability of long-term services and supports, uh, fortunately, that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. So, so, in fact, if you look at the risk adjustment model that, that I mentioned, if you add dual eligibility and race and ethnicity and look at the race ethnicity categories, um, the, the probability of discharge to community successfully is actually a bit higher for, for minority groups than, than the, the reference white population, which, which, which is an, an interesting feature. Uh, of the measure. Um, so I'd be happy to talk more about that, but um, th this is something where it doesn't account directly for it, but but we think based on the results I've cited so far that there does not seem to be a resulting bias from that. Thank you. Alice? Thank you. Um, just two questions. Um, one is, it, I just wanna make sure I understand the, this is patients in, a SNF stay under a Medicare Part A benefit. Is that correct? That's correct. So why the exclusion, why um, exclude patients who didn't have an acute stay? Um, and I say that because if their Part A benefit is still going to cover them because there is some type of waiver, what would it matter if they had an acute stay or not? Yep. Yeah. I, I and I think the the idea behind the this exclusion is that that patient population is potentially a very different uh, patient population than than the one we're looking at. Um, at the time that the the um, uh, uh, with the with a waiver, uh, as you mentioned, I think there's a larger set of people that are subject to that, and I think that that sort of distortion as to who who that might be and how they differ in terms of their discharge uh, destination, um, it could be a bigger concern. But I think that that's a important area to to monitor actually to see who these who who, who these folks are and how. They, they look different on various characteristics. Yeah, I'd be inclined to just think that through a little bit more because if we're looking at opportunities for diversion, for instance, from the ED 
or an observation stay, um, they could very much be very similar patients um, that are going in for a short term or even direct admit for, to the, from the community based on, you know, certain waivers or um, payment models. So that's just one point. And then the other thing, um, I know it's been brought up already, but I would also consider including patients, um, not just with a hospitalization, but with an ED visit and observation stay. Um, because they could be in observation for several days. And I think that still would be a highly problematic discharge. Thanks, Alan. Cheryl? Thank you. Uh, boy, important conversations. And I certainly, and the SNP Alliance certainly supports the idea of a return to community measure. I am worried though, respectfully, that we're confounding a whole lot of variables and trying to make them fit. So for instance, the rural versus urban, frankly, the rural may in fact be associated with greater access to family caregivers than low income, isolated urban dwelling people. So we may not be even measuring the same populations. Looking at the dual eligibility and um, uh, Deborah touched on it with the um, long-term services and supports. But the frank reality, and this is not the nursing home's fault, but for many states, the default position for um, low income, i.e. duly eligible individuals who have support needs is something goes wrong. You go to the hospital for three days and you come to the nursing home for placement. If that state has not invested in rebalancing, so it's more than even just a community issue. It is a state level issue. If they don't have Medicaid benefits adequate for the support and they have not invested in home and community based services, the nursing home is obligated to maintain a safe environment for that individual, particularly if they have no place to send them to in the community. So my concern about this is this really needs to be in the context of a holistic policy question. What is the state's priorities for rebalancing? What is there's not even consistent Medicaid benefits or eligibility from state to state. Um, the fact that there are limited accesses to low income housing for duly eligible individuals. Again, the nursing home becomes the default and then we penalize the nursing home because they are in fact the only safe place for the individual to be. So the, the commitment to getting people who can go back to the community is correct, but I do worry in our um, risk adjustment that we may not be taking into account all of the variables. Thanks, Cheryl. There's a lot in what you just said. Um, I'm gonna move on to Larry. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to circle back on that question about uh, prior three day prior stay in the hospital. Um, because it, if we, if this gets expanded at some point, which it absolutely should be to incorporate Medicare Advantage, um, Medicare Advantage does not need a, a prior authorization, uh, a prior hospital stay to get into uh, skilled nursing. They can go straight to it, um, and so that's that's that uh, criteria wouldn't really work. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, I just two things. One, I just wanted to reiterate, reiterate the importance of Medicare Advantage as well. It's come up on other measures, but I think particularly related to this one, um, you know, as the Medicare Advantage plans evolve and things like palliative care not being defined within them at all with standards, um, that's a really important piece of this and helping to keep people in the community with the quality of life and sustaining outside of the acute care setting. And then secondly, I think I just wanted to confirm that the um, recommendation that had been made about um, excluding hospice from the, uh, making it an exclusion uh, has been done. And so thank you for, you know, moving that forward and confirm that that is in fact the case. So thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Jim, is that a question you want to bring forward? Um, 
not that's not why I raised my hand. I was going to say I've been very negative about it, and I apologize for that. Um, it it is something that I and the National Transitions to Care Coalition would support, and that is a, a good discharge back to community uh, for the transiting people in post acute care. I think it's it's a good concept. It's simply a matter of is have we painted this uh, measure with too broad a brush that doesn't truly acknowledge and understand the market? Okay, thank you. This is a great discussion. Um, I think probably since I'm not seeing any other hands, Matt, how about if we do do our vote and see where we're at? That sounds good, uh, Jerry. So we'll move to a vote. Again, you're voting uh, to uphold uh, the uh, preliminary analysis rating or decision category of support for rulemaking. So no conditions here. This is fully support for rulemaking into the SNF value-based purchasing program. So um, if you disagree, please vote that you disagree, or if you agree, please vote that you, uh, you agree. So Suzanne, I'll turn it over to you. The vote is now open for MUC 2021. Dash 130 discharge to community post acute care measure for skilled nursing facilities. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work group recommendation? We'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, I think we can. The vote is now closed for MUC 2021-130 for the SNF VBP program. 11 members voted yes and five members voted no, um, six or 69%. So the uh, work group did support the staff recommendation. Um, before we move on, I just wanna check, what are we, what's our quorum number? Quorum today would be 14. 14. I know because a couple people have said they need to leave early. So um, if we could just keep an eye on that. So thank you all. That was a wonderful discussion. Um, let's move on then to MUC 2021 095 Core Q. Matt. All right. So this is the short stay discharge measure. So as, as Jerry said, it's MUC 2021-095. Um, this measure estimates the risk adjusted rate of successful discharge to the community from a, a skilled nursing facility with successful discharge to the community, including no unplanned re rehospitalizations and no deaths in the 31 days following a SNF discharge. The measure is calculated using the following formula. We have risk adjusted numerator divided by the risk adjusted denominator times the national observed rate. The fields uh, within the measure submission uh, information uh, describe the adjusted numerator and denominator in more detail. And the measure is calculated using two years of Medicare fee for service claims data. It's at facility level. This measure also receives a support for rulemaking as this measure does add value to the SNF value based purchasing program um, by adding a measure that's not currently addressed within the program. And the measure aligns with other PAC LTC uh, uh, programs by working towards CMS's Meaningful Measures 2.0, overarching goal of value-based care. And then per the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, expansion of the measure set will add measures, including those measuring patient experience. There is a range of variation in the performance of this measure with, within skilled nursing facilities, uh, which allow these facilities to, uh, uh, the opportunity to implement interventions and processes to improve the performance. This measure is NQF endorsed, thus receiving a 
preliminary analysis recommendation of support for rulemaking. Regarding the inputs from the rural health and health equity advisory groups for rural health on a one to five scale uh, rated at 2.9, um, they generally agree with the importance of the measure, uh, but question some of the relevance to rural providers and care settings. For health equity on a one to five scale received a 3.0, 3.0, the advisory group for health equity noted the importance of this person-centered measure by cautioned language differences that may result in response bias by race, ethnicity, um, language, and by payer. The developer um, should also consider, this is again advisory group input, the developer also should consider the increased response time and the role of caregivers required for certain subpopulations. The advisory group also cautioned that certain subpopulations may be dis, um, discharged to another facility due to payer and due to the payer and may be excluded from the measure. Regarding public comment, there were six supportive comments, zero non-supportive. For the six supportive comments, it was based on four simple, this measure is very simple, it's based on four simple questions. It has been validated and it's also linked with endorsed. Um, there's some interest in seeing if the responses are dramatic, uh, dramatically different between those patients in Medicare fee-for-service and those who are part of Medicare Advantage or special needs as care, uh, special needs plans as care delivery expectations and patterns can vary greatly between the two payers with managed care plans, limiting skilled days and discharging at different functional levels. Lastly, a standardized customer satisfaction measurement for nursing homes is long overdue and the shorter core Q survey is pleasant for respondents, easier for care providers to implement and, and to understand, and still collects the most important data for stakeholders. So that is the summary of the public comments and the preliminary analysis as well as the advisory group input. Jerry, I'll turn it back to you for clarifying questions. Great, thanks, Matt. So let's open it up for comments. So just when we're getting the rhythm down, there's no yeah. comments. There, there we go. go. All right, Pam, go for it. Just ask one, I, and I might have just missed this. It can be done by the resident or by a proxy. You just want to clarify that. Can we get a response from the measure developer on that? Uh, yes. If there's anyone in your team. Uh, yeah, the, uh, it can be completed by either the resident or a proxy helping the resident, but if the proxy is answering on behalf of the resident, uh, they are excluded from the measure because the data showing proxy measure, uh, proxy answers are not the same as the uh, respondents answers. Thank and you. Is that based on then just self report from the resident? Uh, whoever fills it out, there is a question on the questionnaire that asks who is completing the questionnaire, whether it's a resident, and if they're getting assistance or whether someone is answering on behalf of them. Okay, can I ask a second question? Sure, go for it, Pam. Um, and if um, somebody doesn't speak English, would there be a translator to help them? Or would it be in multiple languages? Uh, currently, it's in English, and it is uh, sent to them uh, after discharge, and so it would be whoever they have a home to help them with that. Okay. David? <clears throat> well, as, as probably the only person who's here just solely because I'm a patient, I'm thrilled that we're going to have a measure that actually asks patients what they think. Um, this is, a, this is a, a great progress. At the same time, I'm absolutely thrilled that this is a relatively simple and straightforward measure where the the question uh, of of satisfaction uh, typically is uh, accounts for nearly all of the variability that you find in much longer surveys like the the cap survey um, my one concern about this kind of of measure is that 
uh, and I say this based on years of sitting in meetings in a hospital looking at survey results, so CAPS and others, is that the survey doesn't tell anybody anything about why their score is high or low. It gives them an overall rating of the of how they feel about it, but but then the question becomes, okay, if our score is low, what do we do to bring it up? Intuitively, we have a lot of ideas, but the survey itself doesn't provide information that's that's helpful in that regard. And I think for future developments, people ought to begin to look at that uh, to make it more helpful to those people who are trying to improve. Thank you. Other comments? Um, I, I have a comment uh, or a question. Um, this is an, an NQF endorsed measure that would be looked at for the value based purchasing. Um, it was endorsed, if I read it correctly, in 2020 or most recently endorsed. Going back to the equity committee who asked or, or suggested that this should be analyzed by different groups going down the road to look at disparities. Um, I don't know when the next review would go through NQF, but I was wondering if that, you know, if that's going to be something that is going to be looked at down the road. Jerry, uh, was that a question for developer? David Gifford, yeah, either David Gifford or or for um, um, Alan. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, definitely. We have um, we have added a question about race and ethnicity and been tracking some of that data, um, and have gotten that feedback from uh, the NQF team on the process. Uh, and you. Nick Nick Castle, who's one of our developers on it, has been collecting some of the data. Uh, Nick, do you have any of the preliminary data for any of that? Uh, yes, we, we've gotten more than uh, fifty thousand surveys back this this year, where we've included uh, race on the uh, survey, and um, I, I can certainly go into detail on what we found. But uh, uh, we, we have. Uh, in aggregate, you get lower scores for for black residents compared to white, but when you stratify by um, a type of nursing home, so so you have um, nursing homes that have uh, groups or, or, or a larger proportion of black folks in in the facilities, they tend actually to be not the best of facilities. When you look within facility between black and white residents, the scores are, are uh, I wouldn't say not even not statistically significant, different, they're almost identical. So, um, you, uh, so that's the kind of analysis we've been doing. But at the moment, uh, we're not finding that anything that would show that the core queue um, gives different results based on race. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? All right. So, Matt, let's get that vote up. Okay. So, we're moving to a vote. Um, this is for MUC 2021-095, uh, the core Q measure uh, for um, whether the work group wants to uphold the support for rulemaking into the value-based purchasing program for skilled nursing facilities. Suzanne, I'll turn it to you. Okay, the um, vote is now open for MUC 2021-095 core q short stay discharge measure for the SNF VBP program. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work group recommendation?
And sorry, we're just uh, confirming something on our end just quickly. About this decision category. Apologies for that. Okay, um, can you pull that vote screen back up one more time? Okay. And, what, and the, go to the results page once more. Apologies about that. We were just confirming what we said was correct. Okay, so um, the, out of 15, uh, 15 yes, so that's 88% um, in favor of supporting for rulemaking. So we are good to go. Sorry about that. We just wanted to confirm internally in our team that we were saying correctly what, we, uh, what we're voting on. So yes, uh, support for rulemaking, 88% uh, for this measure to support for rulemaking. Thank you. And then Jerry, I think we can have um, maybe ask uh, have Dr. Schreiber ask a question first, and then if we have time before the break, we we can see where we are with going into the gaps discussion. If not, we can maybe move it to after the break. That's fine. Is that okay. So okay. I will turn it over to you then. All right, Dr. Schreiber, um, did you want to take the floor and and ask the work group a question related to this core key measure? Actually, Matt and, and Jerry, thank you very much for the opportunity. So, um, thank you for the support of CORE-Q, but CMS has actually been having multiple conversations about CORE-Q, which is a very nice measure and is obviously short, as you know, versus nursing home caps, which has many measures, as you all know, but also uh, asks things that are a little bit different and I don't want to say broader because CORE-Q is actually broader. But there are differences, obviously, between nursing home caps and core Q. And I would very much like feedback from this committee about would they have a preference? Is there more that they would want to see in a patient experience measure? Is core Q with four measures just about enough? So I would really welcome any feedback that the committee may have. David? Well, I'm probably going to repeat myself, but I, I think the core queue is, is excellent and I, I applaud you for, uh, for bringing it forward. Uh, my, my concern, however, is that, that as a, uh, administrators who look at these data and want to try and improve their scores, the core queue by itself doesn't provide much in the way of guidance. That said, I, I know the hospital caps well. I don't know the nursing home, skilled nursing home caps, but I assume it's a similar pattern. <clears throat> and, and I think that they don't do a very good job of providing those data. But the other problem with those is that the return rate for the longer surveys is much, is, is really quite poor generally. Uh, whereas I think the return rate from this, this shorter survey would be much better and and provide some some useful information my concern is that there needs to be something other than this that helps people know what the concerns are and how they can address them thanks david we have a comment from pam i think there's pros and cons i think when you have the shorter survey as was just mentioned you're going to probably get more likely to get people to return them. The longer ones, of course, will give you more detail. So it depends on where you want to start. Start. I have found in my experience when you get shorter surveys and you change the questions over time, you get a lot more pointed information. Any other thoughts on that, Nicole? 
So we're supportive of CoreQ because of the brevity and having been a family caregiver, caregiver that got all of those surveys, I got to tell you, 40 questions, 30 questions, and things that often you can't even answer because you weren't the recipient of care, you end up just tossing them in the waste bin, unfortunately. So one of the things we like about the CoreQ is the fact that it's, it's short and to the point. It also really gets at, I think, what consumers want to know, right? When you ask your friends, you say, do you recommend this nursing home? Would you want your mom there? You know, is that where you would go and how are the staff? Um, whether or not food is great, <laughs> we would all like food to be great, but um, that's probably not the core issue. Having said that, I think I know our members had the same concerns that have been voiced by David and by Pamela um, and others that, you know, you don't always know what the issue is then, that it was this particular CNA on that particular day. Um, but there's nothing that prohibits folks from asking additional questions um, in their own patient satisfaction surveys as well to get at that and to make some of those corrections. Any other advice for Michelle? Michelle, do you have any other follow up questions? No, I got the feedback I was looking for. Thank you all very much. Cool. All right. So we have Matt, we have about 10 minutes before break. Is that right? We do. Um, and I don't think that's enough time to really do the gas discussion. So maybe if we did, uh, we did a 10 minute break, come back at 445. Would that be okay with the, the committee or the work group? And then we can pick up. Um, from there, I think we can just cover the last measure and then go into the gaps discussion uh, for the programs if we could. So um, let's uh, reconvene. Everybody give a, a bio break if needed. Uh, reconvene at 4.45 p.m. on the Eastern side, and we'll pick up with the last measure before we go into gaps discussions for the, for the day. Thank you all. Talk to you soon. Um, we're going to pick up from where we left off, so the meeting is now being recorded again, so thank you, team. Um, we're going to um, reserve the GAFS discussion until after we get this, this last measure for our uh, consideration today. Um, and so this measure will be facilitated by Kurt, um, and it's the last measure for the Skilled Nursing Facility Quality Reporting Program, and it's MUC. 2021-123, Influence of Vaccination Coverage Among Healthcare Personnel. Um, so again, as you see listed on the slide there, this is the reminder of the program and its structure, which we've reviewed pre previously, um, but you can see that listed there. That's for the, uh, the Skilled Nursing um, Facility Quality Reporting Program. And if we go to the next slide, uh, here is the opportunity for public comment. So, Kurt, I'll turn it over to you to see if there's any members of the public that want to comment on this measure. So much, Matt. And again, we are opening up to public comment now for MUF 2021-123, Influenza Vaccination Coverage. Once again, if um, <clears throat> opportunity for the public to make any comments for this measure, you can use the raise hand feature or the chat box or take yourself off mute if you choose to. Opportunity for public comment. Let's give it a few more seconds. Okay, seeing none, Kurt, I think um, maybe we can go to the description of the measure in PA. For now, Matt. Okay. Um, 
So here we have um, MUC 2021, the last measure we're reviewing today, one, two, three. Influenza vaccination coverage among healthcare personnel. The description, as you can see on the slide, is the percentage of healthcare personnel who receive the influenza vaccination. So this is at the facility level uh, of analysis and the NQF recommendation uh, in the preliminary analysis is support for rulemaking. So this measure does add value to the SNF quality reporting program <clears throat> by adding a measure not currently addressed within the program. And this measure aligns with other PAC LTC programs util utilizing the measure. Um, vaccination coverage among healthcare personnel within SNFs SNFs is of impor importance as seen by the recently adopted COVID-19 healthcare personnel vaccine measure and vaccination coverage among healthcare personnel within these facilities can decrease its viral transmission along with decrease in morbidity and mortality among patients. There is variation in the performance of this measure within skilled nursing facilities and these facilities will have the ability to implement interventions to improve the performance of this measure. This measure is also NQF endorsed and thus receiving a support for rulemaking for this program. <clears throat> Regarding rural health advisory group input, out of one to five scale, it received a 4.5, being relevant uh, in its importance uh, of the topic for rural providers and healthcare personnel. The advisory group generally agreed for its importance of the measure and uh, noted that there may be some concern around vaccination measures in general Given the quality challenges or given the challenges with the COVID-19 vaccination in healthcare facilities, this measure might also be challenging to implement in the rural setting in particular. The advisor group also noted that there might be challenges with, with the workforce and staffing in rural care settings and encouraged CMS to monitor for unintended consequences to rural providers. Regarding health equity, on a one to five scale, health, the health equity advisor group rated this at 3.8. It's important public health priority not sure if there are any equity concerns with this with this measure, and there was some discussion on what is available for the public and what is reported to CMS. The measure steward clarified that what is sent to CMS and what is publicly reported is, is the overall compliance on the measure. Regarding uh, public comment, there was one supportive comment recognizing that it's an important measure and should be added to the QRP program since it's already in use in other programs for, for, for um, post-acute care. There was also one non-supportive comment that said the administrative burden to report into NHSN outweighs the benefits at this time. Reporting through the NHSN is highly burdensome and would require additional staffing to track the information at a time when, it, when we are already struggling to hire and retain staff during a pandemic. So those are the public comments as well as the advisory group input and the summary of the PA. I'll turn it back to you, Kurt, to see if there are any clarifying questions from the work group. Thank you, Matt. Definitely an important measure to discuss. Let's go to the work group and see if there's any questions or any requests for any clarifying information. Yes. Hello, Nicole. I know. <laughs> see, you didn't even know who I see? was like a week ago. <laughs> now you're regretting it. Not at, uh, all. Not at all. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, just a couple of clarifying questions. Um, the licensed professionals, can somebody clarify if that's just folks that were contracted with, um, or is that just any licensed professional that ha that walks into the building and provides care? So it could be somebody's personal physician or nurse practitioner um, that does rounds, you know, and coordinates that with the individual resident. Um, just because that would pose particular challenges in just trying to track people down and track that information down. Um, and the other thing I noticed is that this measure was discontinued for some of the other programs, and I didn't know if there was more information about why that was discontinued um, for some of the other programs. Nicole? I can answer some of those. Please. In the past, you're right, we had these in other programs before. They were discontinued because they were topped out. Um, there's some consideration, again, of bringing them back due to COVID because of the importance of vaccination. I don't know if the measure developer is on the line yeah. or if others know, but I will tell you on the other um, vaccination coverage among healthcare personnel, 
it is anybody who walks in the building in that given year. Because Megan Lindley from CDC. I'm so sorry, Michelle. Yeah, we do have the yeah, Megan. Wonderful. And, Thank yeah. you, Andrea. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry about that. And I tried to speak before and I was double muted and I only unmuted. Yeah, once. I didn't, uh, I I didn't hear you. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. I was like, why won't they let me talk? Yes. Um, technology challenges. I do apologize. Um, and so this is uh, Megan Lenny from CDC and yes, for the uh, licensed independent practitioner category, which I think is the one Nicole was asking about. It is physicians, nurses in advanced practice. Um, and physician assistants, uh, and it's anybody in that category who, as Michelle said, uh, is in the facility for one working day or more during the reporting period. Uh, so that would include um, people who are contracted, but it would also include somebody coming in to, to round on or visit uh, a resident for some other reason. Um, and yes, uh, sorry, I think that was all I have to address. Thank you. Okay, that's that's helpful. That clarification. I would just point out that it's, and I'm sure others encountered this as well. Really challenging to track down every single licensed professional that walks into your building, um, or control their vaccination status when you don't even have a contracted relationship with them. That's going to be more difficult, I think. Your point is is absolutely correct. In Hospitals actually, it also extends to medical students and nursing students and, mm -hmm. and other like therapy students. So it, it is quite extensive. On the other hand, if we think about who comes in contact with the patients, it is all of those folks. Absolutely. And we have gathered some lessons from hospitals uh, because they were the first, they've been implementing this since um, 2012 or early 2013. Uh, so we, we have tried to gather some learnings because, yes, the point has been made for uh, people that don't have an ongoing relationship necessarily with the facility. It can be challenging, um, but yes, exactly as Michelle said, when, when thinking about the, the risk to the, the residents and to the providers, um, that's who it is. And, and this is Alan, just to add again, this measure is additionally also adopted in the you know, ERF and LTAC QRP, so we used to pack settings as well in um, some of the um, issues in terms of staffing um, that may or may, you know, come in regularly or irregularly into those settings. Gary, you wanted to comment? Yeah, um, I'm piggybacking on Nicole's question. One thing I just wanted clarified is, is how the uh, indicator is analyzed. Um, there's employees, there's licensed independent contractors, and then there's the students and learners. And according to the, the information we received in advance, the reliability of some of those groups is lower than the others. Is this an aggregated measure or is it always broken out by group? This is Megan Lindley again, uh, although it's reported by group and that is uh, made available to the facilities for internal tracking purposes. What is reported to CMS um, and what is publicly reported is the aggregate healthcare personnel measure. So all of those required categories together. Any other comments? Again, go through the chat line, email address. Yes, there we go. Cheryl, go ahead. Um, a clarification question. I realize I'm a discussant on this, but it did this um, preceding dialogue raise some questions. Um, using the old uh, tenant that you, if you don't take a temperature, you don't have a fever. So in reporting this measure, if you are not capturing people who are coming in um, as providers or vendors in your denominator, then you um, can I mean how does how does this um, the score or reporting have meaning if people don't even know who to track in the denominator? Because if you avoid reporting um, a physician that comes in once a month and just don't put them on your list, then you don't even have to report their vaccine status. Uh, that's my concern about it. Although I'm wholly supportive of the importance of um, documenting vaccine status for staff, so. I'm just curious about the measurement. Do 
to clarify the question is about enforcement of proper implementation of the measure in the well, facility. No, actually, the, oh, and sorry, I was vague. The um, clarification of the question is how can you report if a facility doesn't report a particular clinician coming into the building, then they don't have to report their vaccine status. So their final report may not be complete, but who externally would know that? So it's going to be dependent on the facilities to capture the nursing homes. I know facilities is a bad word. Uh, the nursing homes to capture those individuals that are coming in and then reporting on their vaccine status. So to Nicole's point, if it becomes very burdensome to track down that one doc who only comes in every 60 days or once a month and he slips in and slips out during lunch and nobody talks to him, if they never report him, then they don't report his vaccine status. How do we get um, clarity on what the true denominator is? Point is well taken. There is a degree of trust. The facility does have to track who is coming into their facility. Now, there's sometimes records, um, especially of anybody who's who's employed or who's being paid at all from the facility. Um, but then the question gets to what is enforcement of these, and that gets to you know what are validation programs. Um, does CMS walk in and look at every person who has walked in the uh, who has who has worked in the facility? I mean, obviously there aren't resources to do that. Um, but and, and so you know your point is right. We only hope that uh, facilities understand the requirements and and are keeping track. I don't know, Alan. Do you want to comment? I know that you have have uh, thought about this before. I disagree. I mean, that, that is, it is a challenge. I mean, obviously when um, surveyors come in, they try to you know, survey and uh, verify and validate um, different information, including uh, such things as um, you know, necessary staff and stuff. But um, again, that, that is a challenge. Um, I don't know, Megan, if we have any uh, data on the reliability that we can report on. Yeah, we, beyond the initial study, we haven't done formal reliability studies. I realized when I was uh, submitting documentation, we actually did begin an internal analysis that unfortunately uh, we did not complete prior to COVID, um, but it, examining the sort of correlation of the reported measures with uh, responses to the survey about um, program practices that are known to increase uh, vaccination, influenza vaccination in healthcare personnel. So I, I was calling it a pseudo validation study. Uh, and those results were very positive, which we found encouraging, you know, facilities reporting more practices. Obviously, these were not SNFs, these were uh, acute care hospitals. And I think for outpatient, we were looking at the ambulatory surgery, but facilities reporting more implemented practices known to increase vaccination also were reporting higher vaccination rates. Um, so it's correct that we have not conducted a formal reliability study since the initial uh, endorsement process. Uh, and I do think Cheryl's point is well taken, and certainly as Michelle said, there's a, a degree of trust. I think there's also a degree of hope that um, in facilities pro providing uh, health care, that there, there's some knowledge of, of the comings and goings of uh, most of the personnel, although understand certainly uh, in a setting like SNFs where there can be a lot of turnover, that that may be a challenge. See any other hands or questions, Matt? I'm here. So, um, if there's no other clarifying questions, I think we can move to a vote. Okay, so I'll have the, the team pull up the vote. Again, you are voting on whether or not to uphold the preliminary analysis recommendation of support for rulemaking of measure MUC 2021-123. Uh, for the SNF QRP program. I'll turn it over to Suzanne. The vote is open for MUC 2021-123, influenza vaccine coverage among healthcare personnel. Do you, within the SNF QRP program, 
do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work group recommendation? Well, five more seconds. Okay, the vote is now closed for MUC 2021-123. And 15 members voted yes to support the staff recommendation as a work group recommendation, and one member voted no for 94%. decision making for support for rulemaking. Uh, now it's time to move over into our gap analysis and we had left some of that on the table before to come back to it. Um, we're going to start off with the SNF quality reporting program and discussion of the gaps analysis here. You know, it might be helpful, Matt, to bring up the existing quality reporting program measure. measure. There we go. Okay. Hopefully so you can see there's, session. yep, go ahead, Kurt. No, I was saying we can certainly start uh, opening discussions now to the work groups regarding some of the gaps around the SNF quality reporting program. And uh, if we click to the next slide, there's other measures as well listed there. And Cheryl, looks like you have your hand raised. Did you want to comment on gaps? Um, yes, please. And one gap, and I realize that this is a challenge, but other settings of care are struggling to implement, including health plans, and that is a measure of goal-directed care. We assume that all of the quality that we offer people in nursing homes is post-acute and long-term care settings is what they want. Um, sometimes what they want are other uh, attainable goals. It could start as a process measure of, are we even asking or including person-centered or um, uh, person-reported outcome measures, or even starting with asking them what their goals are and then moving to prom measures. But I think one thing that is clearly missing in post-acute and long-term care is the expression of goal, because we have such heterogeneity in the population served. Some are short stay, their goal is to get better and go home. Um, others want comfort care. Others want to be supported um, functionally for as long as they can. And unless we integrate that into measurement, um, we continue to define quality for people, perhaps not in the way that they would do themselves. Why don't we go ahead, with, um, David? <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll I'll second uh, the prior comment. I, I think um, patient goals are a, a critical part of the the success rate, and because they're so variable, they're often uh, not recognized as a as a, a value in the uh, in the whole system. Uh, beyond that, I'll just repeat myself with hopefully some variation a little bit. Um, I think particularly in the in the populations we're dealing with here, it's very often the case that patient uh, the patient family members or caregivers have a much greater sense of the quality that's been received than the patients themselves. That's particularly true of some of the exclusion groups in some categories. So I think development of, of measures that assess the perspective from uh, from uh, or the success from the caregiver perspective is important. And, and lastly, but also equally generally, um, I think we need to have more 
patient reported outcome measures. And in particular, I would like to see more of those measures be converted into um, performance measures. So measures that, that address patient perspective, but also are used in, in quality and performance measurement are need to be added to the, the portfolio. Jerry? I'll third what Cheryl and David just said in terms of patient reported measures. Uh, I just wanted to make an observation because I think in our in our work group, we've talked about alignment across programs and when, you know, just in reflecting on that and our discussions today, you know, it seems to me that we've, we've really you know, or CMS and the, and all of the work groups have done a great job on safety and some basic quality stuff. And and I'd like in the SNF as well as the other programs to start moving up the Maslow's hierarchy of that and start looking at patient experience, the proms, um, and also looking at CMS's priorities, mental health in the SNF in relationship to, and this came out, I think, in our orientation meeting when people were commenting on what they'd like to see with SNF, is dealing with isolation, dealing with depression. And, and then I would just add, I, you know, I'd like to, and David, I think you said this before, is, you know, transfer to the community, whether you're hospitalized or whether you die is one thing. But what is the experience of that transfer? Is it a good transfer? You know, do you feel successful in being able to manage in whatever setting you're going to? So I'd, I'd like to see some depth and I'd really like to start moving up the, the hierarchy to really looking at the patient experience. I would second everything you just said, especially around the uh, isolation. I think we talked about it during orientation, but. I would, I would throw out there isolation and loneliness, which aren't exactly the same constructs and maybe, you know, one step further up in Maslow's would be, you know, meaningful engagement. Absolutely, thank you all for, for those comments. You know, these are, have only been heightened during the COVID pandemic, but these were all issues that were problematic well before we were dealing with COVID. Uh, Alice. So I um, am in agreement with everything that's been said here. And I, I think a couple of things really important to that end is, um, and Jerry was going towards this, is the concept of community reintegration, not just return to a, a home setting, um, because we're often going from one isolation chamber to another isolation chamber. Um, and so whether we, this individual actually has the ability to engage in their community upon discharge to the community. Um, and I would also really like us to look at um, efficiency of movement. Um, we set the bar very, very low on all of our functional performance measures as it relates to mobility. Um, and the fact, you know, the issue of whether someone can walk 50 feet is meaningless in terms of meaningful community re reintegration. And what's most important is not just how far they can go, but how efficiently they can do that. Um, because people who can't do it efficiently won't continue to do it once they return home. Um, and so really looking at efficiency of mobility in terms of looking at not just distance, but time, velocity, um, which also is a really great predictor of risk for rehospitalization and risk for falls. <clears throat> you know, I, I agree with all that. I also think we tend to look a lot at uh, self-reliance measures uh, in in home health and in, in, in long-term care. Um, and I would just really stress the importance of looking beyond self-reliance measures. Um, especially as we focus on the aging population, which is going to continue to increase at an amazing rate over the next, you know, two to three decades. And the continued focus on, you know, individuals improving needs to really change for this population of individuals and more of a shift towards how they get their needs met as opposed to their own ability to achieve these uh, outcomes. Raj, you had your hand raised. Yeah, 
Uh, thank you. And I um, probably will go back a little bit um, on, um, I know the HAI uh, measure when it was being developed initially pre-pandemic had more to do with uh, safety um, and, uh, and then it morphed um, based on what happened around the pandemic. Um, I, you know, I think it's, it's, it's now has, uh, the pandemic has uh, uncovered this uh, uh, huge underpreparedness and lack of resources when it comes to infection control. Um, and I know um, we we're talking a lot of big things on, on patient satisfaction and, and, and other things, but uh, I would love to see uh, um, some kind of uh, a composite score on infection control um, uh, preparedness or, or overall performance. Um, that could be used. Um, we, we definitely have realized uh, all the different components that um, that that um, that total up the infection control uh, performance of a facility. This is mainly for nursing homes, um, and and if we could just go back and see if we can uh, use that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, work being done. Uh, resources being added, whether it's through ARPA or CDC's other uh, uh, billions of dollars being poured into getting this done, but um, but all of those fund, funds are limited to a year or a year and a half of use, and I, I, I fear um, we will do a lot of things that are not going to be sustained. There's not going to be a lot of sustain, sustainability picked into those those funds being used. So. If we can somehow align an a, a, a ongoing measurement that is uh, reflective of overall infection control performance uh, in, in, in the long-term care setting, uh, would, would to me is, is, is a gap. And, and there are some um, there are some parallel things that that indirectly measure that. Um, but but if we could have something um, that that entails an overall infection control uh, performance of a facility. Thank you, Ross. And we'll have that, uh, you know, we'll log that in under the long term care um, quality reporting gap as well. Why don't we close out the uh, SNF quality reporting gaps and uh, I'll go over to Nicole. Thanks, Kurt. Um, well, I'm going to build on what a couple of other that was for SNF as well. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, go ahead, Nicole. Just wanted to build on a couple of other comments and then um, make just a general observation. When we, and I'll start with that. Uh, when we think about SNF quality reporting, um, at least my sense has been is that we're more focused on the short stay because it's tied to Medicare and Medicare payment. So I think it's important when we think about measures to make sure we know the population we're talking about. And Kurt, you kind of alluded to this a little bit. Um, there are measures that are appropriate for folks that are in a custodial care kind of long stay situation versus short stay. And I think one of the flaws with um, the way CMS looks at things right now is it's about this 100 days. And 100, being there for being in a nursing home for 100 days doesn't delineate whether you're there for rehabilitation or whether you're there for just kind of ongoing support. Um, and the the outcomes that we seek are a little bit different for those two populations. And so I think we want to be really careful as we think about measures that we're comparing the same population. So that was one comment. The other thing I wanted to add from a measure perspective um, and one that our members brought up when we had this conversation, they feel like um, they had pretty strong consensus that pain management would be a good measure to look at. However, with the caveat that the current MDS questions are still a little subjective and that there's some better tools out there to kind of gauge that and, and get kind of consistent responses from folks. Um, again, that goes back to, you know, looking at um, the individual when you're assessing pain. So somebody who's been on strong pain medications for a lot of years, um, you need to look at pain management a little bit differently than for somebody that normally isn't on a pain medication. But nonetheless, they felt like pain management was a really important one um, that maybe we should look at. So I thought I'd throw that out. Thank you so much, Nicole. I agree. I just already have my mind going. I'm thinking of so many factors going with the pain management aspect, and certainly with this population, and you know, looking at 
how adjuvants are used and all their alternative therapies could potentially be used in long term care as well. Certainly don't want to drive more pain medications in this population. Uh, but no, I think your point is well is well stated. Uh, Matt, why don't we go put up the long term care quality reporting measure information? Yeah, Kurt, I think we'll um, maybe switch to the value based purchasing oh, yeah. first. I think right. there's some more discussion around that. But I, I did want to also want to mention that um, <clears throat> we do have uh, the public comment at the end of all of this today. It was scheduled for 535. We're going to push that back to 5. 45 p.m. Eastern for the public comment, so we have more discussion time. If we're not able to get to all the programs today for gaps, um, if you have any input you'd like to share, please drop that into the chat um, so that we can keep the conversation moving. We will capture the chat as well and include that in the meeting summary and recommendations. So please just uh, feel free to drop your recommendations on gaps to, to all the programs, especially the ones we don't get to today in the chat. Um, so, Kurt, back to you. There's the Smith VBP. This is, um, uh, you can see there's a series of questions listed here. Uh, one about just general gaps, but also uh, what measures would you prioritize to include, um, as well as the aspects, aspects of those measures you would seem to be most important, uh, because this is the expansion of this program. So, there's currently that one measure in the program. We voted on some con a couple other measures with conditional support and support. Um, but are there others to think about? Go ahead, Kurt. Sorry. No, oh, and uh, to the work group, what are those? What are those other considerations under the value-based payment program? This is Dan. I think we heard um, clearly today that exploring the RN staffing might be a good idea. I guess I would challenge us, Kurt. That you know now that the door is open for potentially nine new measures, what's important? If we could choose what is important to consumers, to the providers, to the beleaguered healthcare folks, what needs to be in that ten measure set? And if we can only choose those things, what should be there? Any thoughts from the work group? I'll put out a straw person, which is a balance. You know, NQF has, has really moved away from structural measures and moved much heavily into process and outcome. And today, we supported a structure measure, which is, you know, in my last couple of years at, at NQF, those have virtually disappeared. Um, and so kind of a balance in looking at structure, process, outcome, safety, as well as, you know, and particularly as Raj was saying, with infection rates, that's gonna be absolutely critical with what we're going through. And there needs to be a balance with the patient experience. You know, I, I would like to see a balanced menu that people know that that there is in the value based purchasing. They're going to be rewarded for looking at this more comprehensive thinking ab about the, these programs. So challenge it. Go for it. So can I just thank you for that one? I like structural measures, actually. I think they have a role. Um, I think they have a role in organizations, providers committing to certain things. I think they have a role from CMS's point of view in signaling things that are important. And so I just wanna say thank you. Um, and I think your comment about a balance, sort of this holistic view or you know, balance of, of measures as well as what we measure is really important. So thank you. And I see Cheryl, you have your hand raised. 
Um, yes, I was just going to echo support for the balance. We know that when we just focus on safety and safety is critically important, we then create, and we've all heard the expression, the surplus of safety. We can make people's lives very safe and very miserable. And that's not the goal of quality measurement in any post acute and long term care setting. So the balance um, incorporating the person's goals and experience is critical. Great, thank you. And thank you for those uh, working members adding comments in the chat. It looks like uh, some saying uh, everything about the QRP program would apply to VBP. Uh, some some. Transition measures would be important for continuity. Um, prioritize those that uh, are NQF endorsed and those that SNFs can actually make an impact on. Um, some agreement with some previous comments as well. And then, yeah, Jerry, a comment about crosswalk uh, with uh, measures across PAC LTC programs. Uh, we're doing a good job on those safety measures across programs, which ones are missing in which programs. So that's something that would require further discussion and, and maybe some um, work to, to create that crosswalk on the NQF side. If there's no other comments on the SNF VBP. Actually, Matt, can I ask another question? Since somebody sure, raised cross, since someone raised crosswalk, crosswalk certainly across post acute care, but do you think there are opportunities for Cross from post acute care to hospital to home, for example, because we don't always, you know, take those measures across the entire continuum. So, Jerry, you had made that comment. I see you nodding your head. It looks like uh, in agreement with that that approach. Definitely, and in fact, you know, I was sitting here when we were talking about one of the measures we were reviewing. Um, I was wondering what happened in the hospital committee and what their discussions were of some of the things related to risk adjusters and burden and so forth. There are so many commonalities and, you know, it's easy to get siloed. Um, and so I'd like to see more interplay between between the maps. That's right. And I just wanted to. Um... Michelle, I think you, you might have seen the work that um, the the um, the interoperability folks are doing um, on uh, specific use cases uh, around. Uh, they worked on um, functional status and cognitive status, and and now working on advanced directives, etc. Uh, speech um, where they have used both ways. The information transfer not only from hospital to SNF, but uh, SNF to home health or or SNF back to hospital, uh, and they are that is the the fire you know uh, hot seer project, um, and so uh, just just kind of working hand in hand with that, um, you know, a lot of it does boil down to is information available uh, to be to in real time at both places, and is it interoperable? Um, and I think they've made uh, some uh, some very significant strides in in to make that happen. Um, so uh, definitely, a to me, it's always been the Achilles heel, and 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 there is some movement of the needle in that. So just if we can, you know, again have different uh, programs um, not be in silo. And we're talking about silos within the. Um, uh, care settings, but also there are some silos within the federal, you know, programs as, as well. So if we can talk to our folks over there, uh, it'll be helpful. I think there might be some uh, some resources to uh, to to tap into. Oh, thank you for those comments. You're speaking to the right person. It's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> Well, there's certainly a lot of good discussion here and what's taking place in the chat as well. I think having those linkages are, are so important. We have the care silo and, you know, Pamela talking about having some standardized approach uh, for patients and looking at the linkages and including around standardized functional measurements among individuals. And something I've commented several times uh, to this work group is around medication reconciliation. We know it's a best practice, but we don't have 
there's no standard to how a medication reconciliation is actually completed and what actually entails a good delivery of a, of a medication reconciliation uh, uh, plan. And such incredible opportunities to uh, impact and safety and outcomes and falls and utilization of care and uh, adverse events and decreasing return to hospitals and uh, just so much can be uh, come from a unified approach to something that I consider so simple within medication reconciliation. So we'd love to see something like that take place across all the organizations. Alan, I, I see your your hand is is raised. Well, since Kurt brought up medication reconciliation, uh, I just did have a medication question um, overall. Since um, what are the thoughts on um, medication measures, um, either uh, if it sniffs a setting, um, antipsychotic use, antidepressant use, anti-anxiety use, a global medication measure. Anybody have thoughts on those being incorporated in such a program? Alan, I have mixed feelings about that. You know, my experience is we tend to medicalize that. And, and so I'm wondering how can we look at medication management through the lens of the patient and consumer, not the provider in terms of, are you following guidelines and are you doing this is, is how's it working for you? Are you getting relief? Are you getting symptom management? You know? What do you want to see? Kind of the discussion we were having earlier. So if I had my druthers, I'd put more energy into the patient side of things. And then one more measure, you know, I'll just say, you know, we talk about functional status. I co-chair the PEF, which you know, the patient experience and function. And we have a gazillion measures on every joint of the body. We don't have a lot in terms of the patient experience of functionality. Um, and, and so I'd really like to switch that gear for a little bit. So I don't know how others feel about that. Alan, when uh, you mean you switch, oh, well, sorry, Alan, go ahead. No, I just, um, uh, no, that's fine. Keep going. Uh, I was just gonna recognize Alice. Do you have your hand raised? Thank you. I was just going to agree with Jerry again. I think, um, and it, it kind of goes back to a little bit of that concept of efficiency of movement. Um, and sometimes people need to do things not exactly the way we may think they should do them, but in a way that works for them. Um, and so I agree, function needs to be considered in the context of the individual, the environment in which they're going to need to function and how they do it most efficiently, effectively, in a way that is ultimately sustainable for them. Um, and then just going back to medication, I think the other thing is that's a huge, hugely important transitional measure because what happens to people when they get home um, in terms of even the best laid plans for how they're going to manage is often nightmarish. Um, they have three different lists from three different settings that they might have been in. Um, their reconciliation remains a challenge and a problem. Um, and it can have a huge impact on, on function ultimately. Uh, and David, you have your hand raised? <clears throat> yeah, I, I just, I, I agree completely, as you no surprise, that, that we should put more focus on the patient and the patient's uh, experience and reaction to things. In regard to medication, I have some concern because as a country, we take so many more medications than most any place else, and the, the payoff of those medications is often questionable. We also have a population that's relentlessly assaulted with suggestions that their life would be so much better if they had another medication. So I think we have to be careful that we, we don't uh, rely on the patient's desire for and use of more medications, but, but can sort of uh, 
uh, modulate that some with the actual the efficacy of the medications. The, the pain medication issue, which everybody knows about, is, a, is an example of where we went way overboard along the way. I see it as almost multiple tier, though. It's not just medication reconciliation. The medication management, to me, is a huge component of the medication reconciliation process that I really think can get into the concepts of does the patient uh, understand the reasons why they take the medication, and do they know how to respond to variances and what they're supposed to be monitoring as far as their medications. So I think there's a real opportunity to extend into the patient realm. Uh, when we look at these type of measures and uh, trying to get patient understandings, patient experience uh, as part of it. And uh, Julie also pointed out the NQF action team on person-centered medication safety recently put out some recommendations um, that also spoke to what I just said as well. And then um, Nicole had a comment about medication that it's um, challenging um, patients come with prescription for certain med meds and it's hard to reduce them when the person is in a short stay versus long stay because it requires time to assess the person over time. Um, and it, I recognize it's getting to close to 535. So for those members of the public that may be dialing on, we're going to push the public comment back to 545. So we have about 10 more minutes for some gap discussion. Um, Alan, you asked the question about medications and um, or medication measures, medication use quality measures. Um, do you have any other follow up questions for the work group related to that? No, I, I mean, I think it, a general comment, and I guess my follow up question on that is a lot of times when we talk about these things, is how do you operationalize it? You know, what data source I was going to kind of pick your brains in terms of, well, what data source could we use to do something like that? Um, you know, I, probably too much for the discussion here, but it's something to think about in the chats and everything else is not just, well, you know, what topics are great? How could we really operationalize and do it through what data sources, you know, to make, to actually make it a meaningful measure that we could bring back here one day? I won't, but somebody will. <laughs> Yeah, Alan, you're already at the beach. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You're yeah, yeah. yeah, I've heard. Um, so to, the, to Alan's question, uh, data sources to do some medication use measures. Any any initial thoughts on that? Um, this is Dan Anderson. I'll kick it off. I, I would suggest uh, for medication measures, we would use a hybrid approach, including both the MDS and Part D claims. Um, and I would throw out there that one important area for medication measures would be looking at kind of like the, for lack of a better term, psychoactive medications, antipsychotics, anxiolytics, or what have you, basically medications that might be used to control behavior when you're trying to um, work with a resident. You know, might have to, you know, dementia or some other thing that's causing quote unquote behavior issues. I would say that's an important thing to look at. And I mentioned the use other... of, I mentioned a hybrid approach because I think it's abundantly clear that you know the MDS I think is a um, a good tool, but it, it can also be a blunt instrument. And you know, uh, there's a lot of suggestions that those measures, especially on drugs, uh, are easy to game. So we have to we have to have some kind of a, uh, a, a separate data source to do a little bit of cross checking, especially for the you know some of the uh, exclusions. And and I would. I mean, the antipsychotics um, have been in some shape or form around for almost 10 years, um, and um, and definitely we can elevate them to these these programs. Um, but in 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 my, it, I think with the stewardship and, and uh, antibiotic use, uh, with with everything around safety, um, I there are some um, some very strong measures that are out there now, um, I would definitely support uh, something around uh, antibiotic use and, um, and, and stewardship uh, that is related. Uh, and some of those, um, those things have, uh, CDC has been working for a while in the post-acute setting uh, with some of the even EHR vendors. Um, and so um, I think it's, it's very important we consider that. 
So, um, I hope you guys don't mind if I ask a question just a little bit different. Where do you think measures should be in terms of being digital? What do you think the capabilities of the electronic medical records really are and are going to be in post acute care? Because CMS has made the commitment, obviously, to digital measures and a lot of the data and data places, um, standardized data elements are all going to revolve around electronic medical records being part of health information exchanges and that. Is it reasonable to start asking questions about the use of the electronic medical record transitioning to digital measures or um, ensuring that we're sharing data in even a more robust way? I think of medication management, for example, as a prime example. Raj and I would say that um, the work that at least on the antibiotic use um, measure, um, it had its, its own challenges. And, and I know once pandemic hit, everybody had other fires to uh, uh, to deal with. But uh, I, I, I think the, the response from the group that CDC had um, had gotten together with the major EHR vendors in the in the post acute, uh, which really has boiled down to maybe four or five, um, and and most um, with just three. Uh, I, I think everybody was cooperating, and there was some progress made uh, pre pandemic. And uh, um, and 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 I personally have worked on this. Where um, could you actually? Go after Medrac and and have um, hospitals and 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 post acute have some standards and and um, and work on Medrac. Um, it's it, so. Answer is yes. I think yes. We are you know away from 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 the ideal situation. But if we don't start and 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 have that incentive baked in or characteristics baked in. Uh, we would not see the the, the vendors um, uh, cooperate, and 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 they won't cooperate because the their their customers are not asking for it. So so I think capabilities are there, but there hasn't been the ROI or the business case on it. I see um, David Andrews has his hand up. David. Yeah, I think that the digital is inevitable, and digital has wonderful advantages. But, but by comparison with my experience as a teacher where I had digital evaluations of my teaching, after a while they became mostly meaningless, repetitive, and not very useful. And by far the most useful information I got for improvement was narrative comments. So that I think that having digital system is fine. It's ideal if you can have a hybrid system where there's some sort of opportunity for narrative comments that can be utilized um, more in, in improvement than the digital comments often can. Any other responses to the digital measures question? Okay, and Dr. Schreiber or, or Alan, any follow up? Maybe one last question if you have it. I'll leave that for Alan. No, I think we're fine. We can keep going so that way we can meet Michelle's goal of ending a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remember the right. challenge, Matt. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We could have ended a lot earlier. Um, well, thank and you I all. apologize uh, to those programs and to those settings. We didn't have a chance to to get to um, this year. Please send your comments either through the chat, as as yes. Matt said, so that we can incorporate it in the report. Yes, uh, thank you as well. I'll emphasize that as, as Alan mentioned. Um, any gaps? Uh, any thoughts on gaps for the pro for the programs we weren't able to get to? So that's the long term care, the ERP program, the home health, hospice. Um, please indicate which program and your thoughts in the chat. As I mentioned, 
uh, that chat will will reflect that within the summary of the meeting today, as well as within the, the recommendations of the final report. So we, we appreciate any additional thoughts you have for gaps across those programs that will be helpful for CMS moving forward. Um, at this point, um, uh, we have a um, time for uh, the opportunity for public comment. And so I appreciate folks being patient uh, as we get through a little bit of that discussion um, around the gaps. So if you are a member of the public and you'd like to comment on all of the day's proceedings today um, and would like to share that with the work group, now is the opportunity to do so. So please uh, use the raise hand feature if you have uh, that available to you. We'll recognize you in order as we see them, or you can use the chat function and we will uh, draw attention to that as well. Um, or if you're, you're sort of dialing in and unable to use the raise hand feature or the chat feature, please go ahead and take yourself off mute and make your comments uh, known. So we'll pause for a, a little bit of time um, for public comment. Once again, this is an um, opportunity for the public to make any comments for the work group on uh, the entirety of the day's proceedings. You can use the raise hand feature, the chat box, or take yourself off mute. So opportunity for public comment. One last call. Okay, um, seeing no hands raised, nothing in the chat, we will go ahead and move to the last item on our agenda, which is the summary of the day and next steps. I'll turn it to my colleague, Becky Payne. Becky? Thanks, Matt, and thanks everyone for sticking with us towards the end here. We know it's been a long day. Uh, if we can jump to the next slide. So we are just about at the end of our mount process for this year, which I know feels like it just started. Um, this is our final work group meeting, but we will have the map coordinating committee uh, coordinating committee meeting in January of next year. We can move to the next slide. So we do have the date for that meeting here. It will be January 19th. And as always, all of our MAP members are welcome to attend the other meetings as members of the public to comment at that time. And we will also have a second public comment period opening up on December 30th through January 13th. And all of this will be reflected in our final report that will be published on February 1st. If we can jump one more slide. So again, thank you all so much for your participation today. Your input is absolutely critical to this process. Um, we welcome you to contact us at any time with additional questions, concerns, thoughts on how we can improve this process for next year. We always appreciate it. Um, so I will go ahead and turn it to Jerry and Kurt if you want to offer some closing remarks for today. I'll, I'll pass it off to Jerry in just a second. I'll just say the only thing better than a successful meeting is ending a successful meeting early. So with that, it was a very, uh, very beneficial day. Lots of great discussion. And I'll let Jerry say this in closing remarks. Oops. Jerry, you can't there? hear you, Jerry. On mute. Darn, I'm, I wasted a whole minute there. Um, so I am not going to summarize. Um, just thank you to everyone um, for a really wonderful discussion to our work group members, to CMS, to the measure developers who were fabulous today, and certainly to our NQF team um, for a totally new team. Yay, you, you did absolutely phenomenal. And I would like to end with a very fond goodbye to Alan. Um, Alan, we're gonna miss you. 
Um, you have been just such a wonderful part of this work. And I know I'm speaking for all of us when we wish you just the best and have a wonderful retirement. Thanks. Thank you very much from, from the bottom of my post-acute care heart. My heart's always <laughs> been and always will be in post-acute care and all of this work. Thank you all. Thank the committee. Thank the chairs. Thank my entire CMS team. Um, you know, you gave me the ideal send off today. The discussion, everything we did, the 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 comments. You know, we're not here to all agree. You know, we come from all different. You know, uh, we all have the same goal. I think I said that before. We all have the same goal here. We're looking at it differently. We all need to continue to work together. Please, the best honor you can give me is to continue this type of discussion, you know, onward and onward as we continue to move everything forward. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, as well. And uh, Michelle, I'm just going to say thank you may not be included in the final countdown here. So we technically are about 14 minutes early. I'm just saying thank yous are kind of like after a meeting ends. Uh, uh, I'll give you that, Matt. <laughs> yeah. No, you were right. Clinician <laughs> record still stands. <laughs> <laughs> Tricia. Well, uh, I will say thank you as well um, to this work group for all of your time today. It was a long day. We got through all the measures. So thank you very much, even in, getting into some DAP discussion for your time. Thank you so much to our co-chairs, Jerry and, and Kurt, for all of your time in advance of this meeting and prepping with this new team at NQF and for your leadership and guidance throughout the day, as well as leading up to this meeting. And thank you to our CMS colleagues uh, and your partnership uh, as well for this. Uh, we very much uh, find value in your participation on these meetings as well as the measure developers. It's a lot to submit these measures for, for, the, uh, for much measures under consideration. We recognize your participation and thank you for that. Uh, finally, um, to the members of the public, thank you uh, for your input. And also thank you so much to the NQF staff uh, for a series of MAP meetings this week and last week. Um, I hope you all can pat yourselves on the back as this is all, all said and done for these meetings and looking forward to MAP coordinating committee in January. With that, I um, thank you and wish you a happy holidays and we will see you next time and uh, take care. Thank you, happy holidays all. Bye-bye.